Then Indrith arranged employment for me in the house of Ganesh Lal. Seeing that Jurgal was determined to cast his life in the most disapproving terms possible, Nadisu took over the narrative himself. Ganesh's caravans had proved too effective in repelling the cult's bandits, and I was to kill Ganesh in manner that would warn others against his example. Here Nadisu paused to look up, and his expression was most earnest. But then something changed my life. During the course of my duties, I met Pandara Lal, and we fell in love. She fell in love, Jurgal corrected. You merely thought it fun to get a bastard on your victim's daughter. Perhaps I fell in love later. Though Nadisu kept his eyes on Kelimbor, the rodent in the mirror snorted black steam at Jurgal's reflection. In any case, I convinced— Indrith decided, Jurgal interrupted. It was determined I would be more useful to the cult inside the Lal Cartage Company. Ganesha's life was spared. Nadisu glanced toward Jurgal, then continued. For a time, and Pandara and I married. After a decent interval, Indrith ordered me to cut Ganesha's throat— but Ganesh had treated me so well that I smothered him in his sleep instead. The false one tried a weak smile, thinking Kelimvor would approve of his compassion. Lord Death looked back to Jurgal. So far I see no reason to hurry the judgment of Nadisu Bahaskar. From what I have heard so far, I suspect he will find more mercy standing in line. Let him finish. Jurgal's bulbous eyes swung in Nadisu's direction. Say what occurred after the time of troubles. Nadisu continued, his voice too confident for one in his position. After Bahal died and Sirik ascended to godhood, I took him as my deity, and I continued to murder for Indrith Shala. Then, when Yonsuldara overthrew Ronshiver's cartel and made an honest city of the place, Indrith decided to plant an agent in her circle of friends. She ordered me to stop murdering and start contributing to charity, and soon my wagons were feeding half the city's beggars. Yonsuldara took Pandara and me as her friends, and I started to enjoy helping others. You enjoyed feeling important, Jurgal corrected. Even Indrith did not know you were cutting your flower with sawdust. Nadisu shrugged, then continued. When I realized that Indrith never meant to use me as an assassin again, my offerings to Sirik grew smaller and less frequent, until one day I realized he was no longer as important to me as the people I was helping. I even opened an orphanage, and I never stole a copper from it. Jurgal nodded that this was true. But I should have known better than to think I could quit the one's church. One day Sirik came to me. In Elversalt? Now Kalimvor was as interested in Nadisu's story as in his own trial. How long ago? Shortly before I died, the rodent in the mirror smirked, for Nadisu could see Kelimbor's interest, and he planned to use that to good advantage. He possessed my body. Then he said, Telling the truth is good for the soul. He made me beat poor Pandora and tell her how I had murdered her father and say that I had never loved her. And that last was a lie, was it not? Jurgal sneered. Nadisu nodded. Pandora was a silly woman, but she was also the mother of my children. Over the years, it seemed the softer I grew, the more I loved her. I would have killed myself before telling her I didn't love her. You would have done better to kill yourself before you killed her father, said Kelimvor. What did Sirik do then? He left me, Nadisu answered. I fell deathly ill, and Lady Yonsuldara herself suggested a party to celebrate the rites. And a dawn came to endorse them. Yes. The instant he touched me, Sirik possessed me again. 
What magic did he use against Adon? In the mirror, Nadisu's rattish eyes gleamed with cunning. It would be helpful if I remembered, would it not? I have warned you about trying to bargain with me. Then why should I answer? Though Nadisu's voice caught with fear, he looked Kelimvor in the eye and did not waver. I will not ask much, and more on my wife's behalf than my own. Kelimvor could not bear this insolence. Jurgal, tell me what happened. As you wish, Lord Death. But would you care to look in the mirror first? Kelimvor scowled and turned to look, and then he voiced such a gasp that all the vultures in Faerun cried out at once. His reflection was covered head to foot in pitch, so that only his eyes and the great emerald on his belt clasp showed through. Lord Death recognized this image as the mark of a grafter, for he had lived many years in the kingdom of Cormir, where it was custom to punish those who abused their office by painting them in tar. What is this? Kelimvor demanded of Jurgle. You said whatever a god does is perfect. And you said if I was right, you would not be the latest of many death gods. Jurgle replied. This is your own doing. You have made the rules by which you perform your office, and now you must decide whether to abide by them or break them. But I must know how this spirit died. Kelimvor pointed at Nadisu's reflection. It is necessary for a proper judgment. Yes, but there is no need to tell Mistra what you learn, replied Jurgal. That would be violating the privacy of Nadisu's death, and you are the one who declared the dead deserve the secrecy of their graves. If you change your mind now, it is only because of your fondness for Mistra and her patriarch. What if I said he could tell Mistra? Nadisu's voice was smooth and sly. Kelimvor glared at the spirit. In exchange for leniency? Nadisu smiled, thinking he had won Kelimvor's accord. In exchange for a little forbearance and for keeping secret the true nature of my life, if my reputation is ruined, the high houses of Elversalt will shun Pandara. She does not deserve that, not after the things Siric made me say to her. Kelimvor stared at Nadisu for a long time, then said, I suppose a murderer and spy must have such nerve, but it will do you no good here. Nadisu's eyes grew round. You do not care about Adon? I care, but if I am going to ignore my duty as god of death, it will not be to spare you. Kelimvor looked to Jurgle. How did this man die? Jurgle's yellow eyes swung back to Nadisu. Sirik possessed his body again, then grabbed Adon and locked gazes with him. The patriarch tried to defend himself by smashing Nadisu's head. And what magic did Sirik use against Adon? You are sure you want to know? Kelimvor glanced at the mirror and saw his eyes held open by sickles of ice. He knew this to be the mark of a traitor to duty. For in the cold lands of Vasa, such men were tied out in raging blizzards with their eyelids cut away. I want to know, Kelimvor said. Nothing, said Jurgle. Sirik used no magic at all. He only opened his soul and allowed the patriarch to look inside. And Adon saw Mistra through Sirik's eyes. Kelimvor continued to stare at himself in the mirror. Yes, that is what drove him mad, said Jurgal. Adon's faith is remarkable, but it is no match for the mind of a god. Kelimvor turned away and started out the anteroom door. Jurgal drifted after him. Lord Death, where are you going? Into the city, Kelimvor said. A walk will help me think. 
Jurgle floated along at Lord Death's side, his disembodied glove dragging Nadisu along the floor. And what of Nadisu? Kelimvor paused to look down at the false spirit, who had learned better than to beg for mercy. Nadisu Bahaskar, know that your reputation in Elversalt will remain unblemished, for I have said that the secrets of the dead are their own. But you have lived a wicked life and a false one, and for that you shall suffer. Kelimvor pointed at the lice-covered rodent in the mirror. What you see shall be your punishment. As long as any coin you ever gave in deceit is counted as money anywhere in Faerun, you shall wander the streets of my city in that form. Chapter 22 If the Stormhorns are not the highest and coldest mountains in the world, then I do not know what mountains are. They are nothing but jagged granite teeth a thousand feet high, with no tree taller than a fire giant and a cold wind that blows down from the barren heights at every hour of the day and night. Yet barbarians will live anywhere, and some of them lived in a little village that straddled a treacherous goat path they stupidly called the High Road. In the heart of this village stood a small citadel, and by the starburst and skull discreetly carved in the top of the gatehouse arch, I knew this to be a temple of the One. Despite my hunger and fatigue, I was reluctant to pound the gate. From inside the castle came a terrible wailing, and the air near the walls reeked of death. This could have been on account of the fresh kill Hala had snatched as we passed through the village, yet the underscent of decay and mustiness suggested otherwise. But even this was not as disturbing as the green fly roaring over the citadel. The thing was as large as an elephant, with black legs longer than spears and eyes as big as wagon wheels. This was not the sort of pet true believers usually kept in their temples, at least not in civilized lands, and I found it difficult to believe what I saw. I considered riding on. Certainly Hala was capable. She had already galloped a distance greater than the breadth of Kalimshan, and still she was as fresh as the minute she burst from the stock shed. It was I who needed rest. The witch had been hounding my trail since her windstorm knocked me from my mount, and this was the first time I had stopped without spying her somewhere on the distant horizon. Whether she and her companion had finally ridden their hippogriff to death, or merely stopped to rest, I did not know, but it hardly mattered. Even with the one's heart slushing in my chest, two solid days of riding had left me so weary that I had twice fallen off my horse. Only tears' protection had saved me from smashing my skull. Hala tore a leg off her kill's carcass and began to gnaw at the thigh bone, trying to get at the bone marrow. I turned away from the gruesome sight and studied my back trail, as I had grown accustomed to doing. The river Tun snaked along the base of the mountains, as brown and murky as the plain beyond, and in the distance the sky was as blue as steel. When I still saw none of the brush fires or tornadoes or raging floods that always seemed to accompany the witch, I leaned over to knock on the gate. The portal swung open before my hand touched it. An old priest in the silver skull bracers of a true believer peered out at me. His eyes were as vacant as a ruin, his flesh as gray and fixed as clay. If he noticed the flies swarming his ears and eyes and nostrils, he did not disturb them by twitching or blinking, nor even, so far as I could tell, by breathing upon them. Yes, I am on a mission for the one and all. I had to shout to make myself heard above the roaring of the great fly above. I need food and shelter and perhaps protection from my enemies. He glanced at the bloody mess my horse had laid before the gate, then back at me. Can you pay? No, but you will if you refuse me. I kicked Hala, 
and she grabbed her meal and pushed through the opening. The gatekeeper stumbled back with the stiff-legged gait of a sleepwalker, and it was then I saw I had been talking to a corpse. This did not amaze me much. It seemed but one more novelty of my draining journey through barbarian lands. I dismounted. What happened to you, old man? He shrugged the shrug of the weary, then glanced up at the great fly. The troubles, he said, as though that explained why he was not in the grave. He closed the gate and lowered the drawbar, then turned back to me. Ours has been pestilence. I glanced around the courtyard and noted how empty and unkempt it seemed, with flies swarming in the corners and crickets as large as cats chirping on the warm cobblestones. Though I was much amazed by what I saw, I had no wish to appear naive, and in any case I was too weary to ask questions. I trust you can feed me. The priest pointed toward a pair of rats fighting in an open doorway. They are serving lunch, if you care to risk it. It is no risk for me, I answered, wondering what the old man was talking about. I passed Hala's reins to him. See to it that she's combed and rubbed down. Feed her two goats and whatever else she wants, and let no children you like near her. The walking corpse took the reins and started toward the stable, and he made no further mention of payment. His dead face did not betray whether this was because of my bearing or another reason. I only knew that my sacred pilgrimage and the god's heart slushing blood through my veins made me the most important person in the entire faith. Now I understood how the caliph's son felt when he rode his prancing stallion through the city of brilliance, and why he did this so often. I crossed the courtyard and kicked the rats from the rectory doorway and went inside. The room was customarily dim, lit only by a four-candled candelabra suspended beneath a vaulted ceiling. The air smelled of ale and meat, and in the center of the chamber sat a dozen murky figures, spread along a table that could have held three times their number. They made no sound except to smack their lips and clatter their mugs, and if any of them raised their eyes to see who stood in the doorway, I failed to notice. I took a seat near the middle of the table. Seeing that none of my companions knew the use of silverware, I used my fingers to put a slice of musty-smelling meat upon a slab of stony bread and began to eat. The food was as foul as the company, but to one who had tasted only the dust of the road for two days— Anything was delicious. I devoured the barbarous fare as though it were a honeyed partridge and helped myself to more. As I began to sate my appetite, my thirst demanded its own attention. Seeing no empty mugs upon the table, I said to the figure across the table, I have nothing to drink from. A woman with hair as coarse as straw pushed her head close enough to scowl at me. What do you want me to do about it? I looked back at her. Get me something. When she did not rise, I added, I am on a mission for the one and all. Her scowl deepened. Then she seemed to sense the one's presence in me, and her brow rose. She stood and went into a dark corner and returned with a wooden mug, which she filled from the pitcher on the table. The ale was sour and gritty with the dust she neglected to rinse from the cup. But after two days of drinking only my water-skin's foul contents, it was as refreshing as the elixir of life, and all the sweeter for having been poured by someone else. I helped myself to a third serving of food, less to assuage my hunger than to enjoy my newfound prestige, and that is when something thumped onto the table. Pass some dog. The airy voice startled the woman and all the other murky diners from their seats, and I looked down the table to see a circlet of yellow orbs glimmering in the candlelight. The globes were each the size of a man's eye, and they all sparkled like diamonds and swiveled in their sockets. Dog, 
I asked. Behind the glittering eyes, I saw dimly eight hairy legs and a bulbous shape as large as Hala's rump. I glanced at the greasy meat on my bread. This? Do you expect me to eat rat? Of course not. I carried the platter down the table and set the entire thing before the spider. I also slid a mug of ale over in front of it, then stooped down to peer into its eyes. Is that you, mighty one? Congratulations, Malik. Now the spider spoke in the thousand voices of the one. You shall soon be a father. What? A father, Malik? The spider curled one of its legs into a hoop, then used another to make a lewd gesture inside the circle. You do know how a man becomes a father, do you not? A father? I dropped onto the bench. But how? I have not seen my wife in— No, say it is not so. There has been a miracle. The spider hissed and chuckled. Your wife claims you have been visiting her in her dreams. My fist slammed into the table with such force that only tears' protection kept my hand from breaking. Really, Malik, said the one, I would think you would be overjoyed. I suppose you want a son? I can arrange that. He might even look like you. With that, the spider plunged its fangs into the platter of meat and began to slurp out the juice, and I laid my head in my hands and started to groan. What would my friends think? They were a cynical and suspicious lot, and they would never accept the miracle of my wife's pregnancy. No doubt they were already calling me a cuckold and making little horns by their head when they mentioned my name. Stop sniveling, Malik, hissed the one. What reason do you have to complain? Has Mistra been despoiling your temples? At any other time, this would have caused me to raise my head and curse the harlot. But now I could think only of my wife's good name and of the many indignities she would suffer on account of this miracle. Not even the prince's favor would spare her reputation or my business, since prudent men never associate with scandal. I slammed my forehead against the table. The harlot's insolence is beyond belief, growled the one, though of course he was speaking about Mistra and not my wife. She ordered Kelimvor to keep my dead here on Faerun, and then she snarled the weave around all my temples. I glanced at Siric and saw him wave a pair of spider's legs toward the roaring fly outside. Now my faithful are plagued by giant insects and cascades of boiling tar and singing rodents. The one scuttled closer, then clacked his mandibles before my eyes. Never involve yourself with a woman, Malik. You will be sorry every time. Indeed. I returned my gaze to the dark surface beneath my face. Miracles are terrible things. Chapter 23 Ruha and Zael rode hard to catch up, and by dusk they were crouching in the shelter of a murky alley, peering out at Sirik's temple in the Stormhorns. Their mount remained tethered outside the village because of the green fly circling the citadel. Silver Cloud had refused to go anywhere near the ugly creature, for hippogriffs looked upon anything with wings either as something they could eat or something that could eat them. That is where the little man went? Ruha whispered, asking the question of a haggard man with red rimmed eyes. When she and Zale had entered the village and asked after a pudgy rider on a horse from hell, the oaf had volunteered at once to lead them to the temple. You are sure he is still inside? The man shook his head. Can't be sure. There's too many sally ports and secret tunnels. His whisper was raspy and slow. But no one's seen him or his horse come out, 
and that's the way he went in. You can still see my nephew's blood. The peasant pointed to a patch of dark ground in front of the portal. Ruha studied the spot long enough to tell that it was covered with swarming flies, then glanced up at the gatehouse. An old priest was standing watch as motionless as a statue. Four more sentries stood watch in the corner towers. Do they always post so many watchmen? Ruha asked. The peasant shook his head. Only the gate guard, and he usually sneaks off to sleep. They're protecting something, hissed Zale, and I'll wager it's our little friend. You are friends of this murderer? Only in the sense that we know him well, Ruha said. But you may be certain we are as eager to catch him as you are. I'm not eager at all, said the peasant. I have a wife and three children. But I would be happy if you killed him. That will be easier said than done. Zale looked to Ruha. What do you think, Lady Witch? Sneak Silver Cloud around the village and set an ambush on the road ahead? It would be better to catch him sleeping. If we can keep him away from his horse, he will have less chance to escape. Zale frowned. We'd have to use magic to bypass the guards. He did not need to say more, for every time Ruha cast a spell, she also spawned a whirlwind or earthquake or lightning storm, and the more she used her magic, the worse these disasters grew. Her last enchantment had sparked a downpour of hailstones that had leveled half the farmhouses outside Iriabor. As Ruha contemplated what even a simple spell might do for the village, Zale's visage suddenly blurred before her eyes, then grew round and pudgy, with thick, fleshy lips and eyes that bulged from their sockets like a bug's. She knew at once whom she was seeing, for she had seen this handsome face in her visions a dozen times since the deaths of Rinda and Gwydion. As she watched, the bulging eyes grew as black as coal and began to burn with a fire as cold as the void. A long tongue of night-blue flame rippled from between the fleshy lips and began to wag, flinging little drops of sizzling poison in every direction. Ruha closed her eyes and began to tremble, for she had never suffered so many visions in such a short time. Their frequency had to be a sign of her mission's great urgency, but in her exhaustion the mirages were taking a toll on her nerves. Ruha, what's wrong? demanded Zale. Though he had seen her gaze grow distant many times, she had never explained to him what she was seeing, and so he could not guess at the cause of her trembling. You go rest, I'll keep watch. Ruha shook her head. We must attack now, Zale. You heard the goddess. Nothing is more important than catching our quarry. Zale shook his head. Not if there's— Whatever you do, you'd better hurry. The peasant pointed at the gatehouse. Look. The guard was gone. Ruha turned to the peasant. Tell everyone to leave the village at once. The man frowned. Leave, but it's almost dark. Before Ruha could say more, Zale grabbed her arm. Maybe the guard just went to relieve himself. And maybe he saw us and went to warn Malik. We cannot take the chance. If Malik escapes now, will Silver Cloud have the stamina to catch him again? Zale shook his head. It's a wonder he carried us this far. Ruha turned to the peasant. Go! Tell the others to leave if they want to see the morning. She pushed the man down the alley, and Zale drew his sword. They watched in silence until they heard the man banging doors. The citadel guards came to the front of their towers and peered out over the village. When none of them left to report what was happening, 
the witch knew the gate sentry had gone to alert her quarry. Ruha gathered a handful of pebbles. Do not waste your effort trying to slay Malik. She began to shake the pebbles. Kill the hell horse if you can, and leave the rest to me. The witch uttered a sun spell and hurled her pebbles. The stones streaked away in a golden flash and blasted the gate into splinters, and even Ruha did not expect what followed. A deafening blast shook the dust from the citadel walls, and then a geyser of yellow steam sprouted in the center of the courtyard. The vapor was as foul as burning brimstone, and so hot it scalded the flesh of any creature it touched. In less than an instant, the courtyard was filled with blistered rats and giant toasted crickets and screaming believers, who quickly fled into the far corners of the temple and disappeared. Ruha and Zael rushed across the street. By the time they reached the gate, the yellow vapor was billowing out in a great cloud. One whiff of the stuff caused the witch's throat to close and her eyes to water. A stream of rats, all bleeding from their eyes and nostrils, began to drag themselves out into the road. The giant green fly roared down out of the sky and hovered over the gate, glaring down at the witch and her companion with one of its bulging black eyes. Zael ignored it and kicked at the fleeing rats. Why aren't the Syric worshippers coming out with the rest of the vermin? He peered into the yellow fog, then said, They must be leaving by the sally ports, and Malik with them. Zael pulled his tunic over his face and, before Ruha could stop him, vanished into the burning fog. The witch slipped her hands up beneath her veil and filled them with her breath, then uttered her spell. This time her magic shook the entire village. The gatehouse swayed, and the cobblestones in the courtyard clattered. From the streets behind her came the muffled crash of falling crockery and the strident cries of fleeing peasants. Ruha turned her palms toward the courtyard and blew. A ferocious wind howled through the gate to carry away the poisonous steam. On the far side of the spewing geyser kneeled Zale, perhaps five paces from the stable. The yellow vapor had turned his cloak into a tattered rag, and wherever his skin was exposed, it was covered with yellow sores. He took a long breath of fresh air, then struggled to his feet and staggered toward the stable's open door. Ruha started after him. The geyser belched up a clap of thunder, and the yellow steam changed to fire, splitting the courtyard down the center. Zale glanced back, then a curtain of ash and molten rock gushed out of the fissure to separate him from the witch. Ruha took her water skin from around her neck and pulled the stopper, and at that moment the green fly came over the wall and descended in front of her. The witch retreated, backing up a set of narrow stone stairs attached to the gatehouse. And in the time it took this to occur, the fissure spewed out such a quantity of ash and fiery rock that when Hala and I burst from the stone doors, we found our way blocked by a wall of burning stone. Already the ridge stood as high as a man, with a frothing spray of molten rock spewing up behind it. I could see nothing on the other side except the wall of the citadel and the harper witch on the gatehouse stairs. A pox upon that hag! I had been sound asleep when the gate guard roused me to report that someone was watching the temple, and I had gathered my things in a flurry and rushed to the stable half awake, and so I was still clutching Rinda's journal in my hand as I turned to look for another way out of the courtyard. I did not even notice Zale until Hala reared and gave a menacing snort, and it was only out of fright that I brought Rinda's book around to shield myself. Zale's sword bit halfway through the ledger. Hala sprang forward, and the journal nearly slipped from my grasp, as it had trapped my foe's blade the way a log sometimes traps an axe. I dropped the reins and squeezed my mount with my legs and grabbed the book with both hands, and I found myself staring down the length of Zale's sword into his yellow blistered face. 
He snarled a curse upon my father's name and tried to jerk me from the saddle, but Hala was dragging him across the courtyard. It was all he could do to keep his feet, and all I could do to keep hold of the journal. The side of Zale's body suddenly turned as red as a tomato, and a searing heat stung my face. I glanced forward and saw Hala's head rising as she galloped up the ridge toward the frothing curtain of molten rock. Why my foe did not release his sword is a mystery to me, even greater than how I kept my seat when Hala sprang across the fissure. I saw the fire rush up Zale's legs. I smelled his charred flesh and heard his agonized scream. Then he became an orange flame, and I saw the fires of Kelimvor's worst hell boiling in the chasm below. It took only an instant to cross, but it seemed an eternity. My skin burned, my eyes stung, my head ached and my stomach turned, and my tongue swelled in my throat. Hala landed on the other side and streaked toward the gate, her hooves burning as she splashed down a stream of molten rock. Zale's sword drooped over and fell out of Rinda's journal, but that did not prevent the pages from catching fire. I slapped the book against my chest and succeeded only in igniting the witch's abba. For a moment I sat there burning, holding a flaming book in my hands, wondering what to do. Then I heard Hala's hooves clattering on solid cobblestones, and looked up to see the gate ahead, with a meddling harper on the stairs above the giant green fly. I saw the witch rub a pinch of dust off the gatehouse wall, and this frightened me out of my wits, as she had already proved that she could capture me. I pressed myself close to Hala and grabbed her neck with both arms, and the heat of my flaming robe made her gallop twice as fast as before. We were halfway to the gate before I realized I had dropped Rinda's journal. Needless to say, I did not turn around. There were other ways to find Zental Keep. Uruha raised her hand to cast her spell, but the giant green fly reared up to block her magic. What have you done here? the fly demanded. Though the insect remained as large as an elephant, its black eyes melted and became a pair of human eyes as dark and soft as the night. The long feeding tube shrank into a narrow nose, and the ugly mandibles came together to form a slender jawline, and the wings folded over the back to become a cascade of flowing black hair. Then its body slimmed into the figure of a shapely woman, and the air around it coalesced into a simple robe clasped by a web-shaped bodice clasp. Goddess! Ruha dropped to her knees, but she could not help peering around Mistress Avatar to see what had become of the discarded ledger. Perhaps the book contained some hint of her quarry's destination. To her relief, the journal's pages had stopped burning when it hit the ground. It now lay smoldering just inside the gate, less than a dozen paces from the advancing tide of molten rock. "'Pay attention to me, Ruha,' Mistra said. "'Answer my question. What have you done here?' Ruha looked back to the goddess. "'I was trying to stop Malik, as you instructed. I did not instruct this!' Mistra waved at the curtain of fire behind her. You have knocked down a quarter of the village, and this lava flow will destroy the rest. But you said what I annihilate will be as nothing to what I save. You said I should do whatever is necessary to stop Malik, even if it means destroying a whole kingdom. Mistra's eyes grew dark with ire. Do not be insulting. I would never say such a thing. Shocked by her goddess's reaction, Ruha lowered her gaze and noticed that the journal now lay only nine paces from the advancing lava. I thought you wanted me to stop Malik. I prayed for a sign, and you sent a shooting star. This caused Mistra to fall silent, for she remembered both the prayer and what she had been doing when it came. I sent the sign, yes, 
but that does not give you leave to destroy a whole village. What were you thinking? Ruha gave the only answer she could. That you wanted me to catch him at any cost. That I wanted this? There can be only one thing that would excuse. Mistra paused and grew thoughtful, then asked, Is that it, Ruha? Did Malik recover the Serenishad after all? Ruha shook her head. No, goddess, it is still safe in— Do not say it. There might not be much of this temple left, but it still belongs to Sirik. Ruha frowned. In contrast to their first meeting outside the wood of sharp teeth, Mistra was now using names freely. Perhaps the goddess no longer feared attracting the attention of her enemies. Or perhaps there was another explanation. Goddess, not now, Ruha. Mistra turned toward the frothing curtain in the center of the courtyard. Already the ridge of ash and molten rock had risen as tall as her avatar, and it showed no sign of abating soon. At the moment I have a village to save. I will talk with you later. Until then, the weave is denied you. Denied? Ruha stumbled and nearly fell down the stairs. You are taking my magic? The goddess paused to look back at the harper, and did not seem to notice when the lava began to swirl around her ankles. For now, Ruha, now go while you can. I will be lucky to seal this volcano of yours before it engulfs the whole village. Ruha bowed to the goddess, then turned toward the journal lying near the gate. The molten rock had closed to within three paces of it, but even without her magic, she could run that fast. Chapter 24 The citadel walls had turned orange and soft with the heat, and the rampart walkways had started to sag. A red glittering portal in the empty gateway siphoned lava back to the para-elemental plane of magma, but not as fast as the molten rock poured from the ground, and already the ridge around the fissure stood as tall as the gatehouse. At each end of the crack kneeled an avatar of Mistra larger than any dragon, sweeping cinder and ash back into the rift by the armful, fusing the seam closed with her magic breath. Yet volcanoes are mighty things, being the much-favored toys of Talus the Destroyer, and even this small one was filling the citadel faster than the goddess's avatars could seal it. Liquid stone lay in the courtyard as deep as a man's chest. Any moment it would melt through the citadel walls and send a tide of fiery syrup rolling down upon the village. But Mistra could manifest no more avatars there. The volcano was only one of a thousand matters troubling her at that moment. She had two avatars trying to win support for her upcoming trial, and one more investigating their lack of progress. Four more were attending to the troubles she had started with Sirik, for her attacks had left the one with no choice but to assail her temples in kind. At any given moment she was tracking the worm of gloom through the caves of Mount Talith, or battling a gigantes at Elven Tree, or hunting a kraken in Hillshadow Lake, or defending her temples in any number of places too many to name. And regardless of anything else in the heavens or on Faerun, one avatar stayed in the House of Knowledge, searching Ogma's library for the spell that had turned Adon's mind against her, as though the one needed to look his tricks up in a book. So, when one of Kelimvor's avatars rose out of the fissure's boiling lava, she was grateful for the help. His avatar was almost as large as the ones she had manifested, so that although he stood in the molten rock from the waist down, his shoulders rose above the brink of the fiery rift. Calimvor, you pull the cinders back into the fissure, and I will seal it closed behind you. Calimvor was so browbeaten that he actually reached up to obey. Then he remembered himself and brought his hands back. He brushed some beads of lava off his glowing chainmail, as though that was what he had intended all along, and stared into the boiling stone. 
I have no wish to involve myself in this. It is one thing to deny Sirix dead leave to depart Faerun, and quite another to destroy his temples. If you are not careful, you will start the God's War Ogma fears, and then Eo will cast you both out. Both of Mistra's avatars dropped their jaws, and the one facing Kalimvor paused to glare at him. If the only reason you came here is to issue warnings, you have wasted your time. Mistra waved her arm at the orange lake that filled the courtyard. Do you think I asked Ruha to do this? I am not even sure how she did. Kalimvor scowled for it seemed strange that a lava fissure would just happen to open at the moment of Ruha's attack. Perhaps this is Talus's doing. Mistra's avatar resumed her work. I have thought of that. It certainly has the mark of his magic, and he has as much reason to delay Malik as we do. Kelimbor nodded. And speaking of Malik, why did you let him go? It would have been a small matter to stop him. Interfering with Sirik's witness would have been a breach of my promise to Tyr not to interfere with the trial. Besides, Ruha assures me he is not chasing the Serenishad. If you are worried about your promise to Tyr, why send Ruha after him in the first place? I did not send her. The truth is, I have been avoiding her. How can Tyr blame me for what she does of her own free will? Mistra sealed a section of fissure with her magic breath, then raised her gaze. Are you going to help or not? Kalimvor looked toward the citadel's front rampart, which at that moment was tumbling down into the lava, and shook his head. If this is Talus's doing, it is not the place of the god of death to save the village. What? This time both of Mistra's avatars stopped to stare. Do you mean these people deserve what is happening? I am saying that it may not be my place to prevent it, Kelimvor replied. As god of death, my concern is with their spirits, not their houses. And that concern prevents you from having compassion? The gatehouse collapsed into the courtyard and sloshed a great wave of lava against the wall, causing a section of stone to bow out into the high road and disintegrate. At once, a slow-moving tongue of molten rock rolled into the breach. Mistra grabbed a handful of burning stone and flung it into the gap, filling it with another glittering portal to the para-elemental plane of magma. Kelimvor, if you are not here to help, then why come at all? The goddess's avatars returned to filling the fissure. I came to tell you— Kelimvor had meant to finish by saying, How Sirik drove Adon mad, but the words caught in his throat. In his mind's eye, he saw himself standing before his mirror, gazing at the reflection of a tar-covered warrior with sickles of ice in his eyes. What? Mistress swept an armful of cinders into the fissure and did not look up. You wanted to tell me something? Kelimvor closed his eyes and even he was not sure whether this was in shame or sorrow. I came to tell you that I need to find Zale. He drew his sword and probed the molten rock around his waist. There is something I must ask him. Mistra frowned. And you cannot do that in your own city? I cannot wait that long. Kalimvor continued to probe the lava, and he was careful not to look up at Lady Magic. Zael will travel through all of the elemental planes before his spirit stops burning, and I need to talk with him now. Mistra shoved an armful of cinders down against Kelimvor's chest. Then do it quickly. I will not wait to seal this. Kelimvor backed away and resumed his probing. Before many moments had passed, he pulled his sword from the molten rock and held it up before him. A flame as red as blood danced on the tip crackling and wailing as it writhed. Zael Protelius! The flame spun on Kelimvor's sword, then stopped wailing and kneeled on the steaming blade. Lord Death! Zael Protelius, why did you allow your foe to drag you into this fissure? Why did you cling to your sword when you could have let go and saved yourself? To stop the... 
Murderer! Zale's words seemed to come with great effort and pain. But when you saw that you would die and fail anyway, still you held on. Why? Nothing to fear. In death. Zael kept his blazing head bowed toward the sword. Brave man in life, sure to receive reward in death. But you are faithless. Who will reward you? For the first time, Zael raised his fiery head. You, Lord Kelimvor, trust your justice before any god who demands flattery and offerings. So stunned was Kelimvor that he shrank until his chest sank into the boiling lava. Can Siric be right? His head barely reached the chasm brink. Have I been too fair? It was then that Kelimvor perceived the infinite cunning of the one and all. To win Faerun for himself, Siric had only to step aside and do nothing. Lady Magic would do half his work, denying the weave to any force that harmed her beloved mortals, and Talus the Destroyer and the Battle Lord Tempest and Shar the Nightbringer would grow weak and start losing worshippers. Kelimvor would do the rest, treating the spirits of the noble and compassionate with such kindness that many would turn from their gods and trust to his justice instead. But most critical was this. The brave and courageous would lose their fear of death and sacrifice themselves in foolish causes, as Zael had done. Faerun would be left to the cowardly and the corrupt, and when this was so, when all the other gods had grown weak through the compassion of Kelimvor and Mistra, then would the one rouse himself from his madness and call the wicked to his worship, and then would he drive all the other gods from his world. All this Kelimvor perceived, and he saw that it was happening just as Siric had planned. Still, he refused to think he had been doing the one's work. In his folly, he believed that every man strove for bravery and nobility, and he failed to understand that shielding the helpless encouraged laziness and dependence, and that treating the dead with compassion only made life all the more unbearable. An avalanche of hot cinders crashed down upon Kelimvor's back. Another splashed down before him and covered his chain mail with hissing beads of molten stone. If you are finished there, I have a village to save. I am done in here, but I fear we are far from finished. Kelimvor lowered his blade and returned Zael to the lava. I am sorry your journey must be so long and painful. And my judgment? Zael's figure began to melt into the lava. What will I find in the city of the dead? That I will not know until you get there. Kelimvor reached beneath the lava to sheath his sword, then pulled himself out of the rift. Though his chainmail had turned white with heat and molten rocks fell from his body in globs, Lord Death hardly noticed. He was as immune to the ravages of fire as he was to every kind of agony, save that of displeasing Mistra. Siric's temple was completely gone, having melted into the lava pool and drained away to the para-elemental plain of magma. Only three small tongues of molten rock had snaked past Mistra's glittering portals and crossed the high road, and Kelimvor saw that they would consume no more than a few huts before rolling to a halt. Lord Death could have stopped these flows with little more than a thought, but he turned away and raised his arm, extending his finger to form a perch. Avner! The seraph's dark-winged silhouette appeared high in the dusky sky and circled down like a great vulture. His wings were blacker than the night, so that they seemed more shadow than feather, and he was armored neck to foot in leather polished to an ebony sheen. He carried a bow as long as his body, double-curved for power and strung with a golden cord. A quiver of glass arrows hung on one hip, and a naked scimitar gleamed on the other. 
he wheeled around behind Kelimvor, then spread his wings and landed on the god's outstretched finger. At your command, Lord Kelimvor! His eyes looked like two steel balls, for they lacked either iris or pupil, and were as gray as silver. I am ready to serve. And so you shall, my seraph. Go and watch men die all across Faerun. When you have witnessed a thousand and ten deaths, return to the crystal spire and tell me what you have seen. As you wish, Lord Death. Mistra came to Kelimvor's side. A handsome herald, Lord Death. Is he the harbinger of your newfound indifference to the helpless? Perhaps. When he returns, we shall see. Lord Death raised his hand, and the seraph took flight as silently as an owl. Kelimvor watched his messenger wheel out over the tun plain and vanish against the shadowy ground, then took Mistress' hand. I am worried, Midnight. He spoke without looking at her. I think we have been making a terrible mistake. Mistake? Mistra thought of the mistake Kelimvor had made in refusing to help her with the volcano, but she had better ways to let him know about that than just saying so. What mistake? Kelimvor turned to face her, and when he looked into her eyes, he saw the reflection of a tar-covered god. A uh, Lord Death could not bring himself to say Adon's name, for he was as much a traitor as ever, and valued his own conscience above the welfare of his old friend. A what, Kelimvor? Mistra tore her hand from his. You know how busy I am. Even as we stand here, Siric has— A mistake of conscience. And Siric is at the heart of it. Mistra raised her brow. You have my attention. Go on. Kalimvor shook his head. I can say no more, except there is more to our troubles than we can see, and Siric is behind them all. He has been behind them all along. Mistra grew thoughtful, then locked gazes with Kalimvor. This is about Adon. You know something. Kalimvor nodded. But I cannot tell you. The secrets of the dead are their own, and I will not betray the sanctity of the grave. Not even to you. But Adon— If I find Adon standing before my throne, I will treat him with all the respect he is due. Before your throne? Adon is one of my faithful. When he dies, you must know I will make a home for him in— Mistra let the sentence trail off, her eyes growing wide and wild as she perceived the meaning of Kelimvor's words. No— I will not allow him to die without faith. Chapter 25 Becoming a father is always a shock, and this is even more true if a man has not seen his wife in years. I galloped north in a state of astonishment, so stunned I hardly noticed the peaks rising higher and higher around me, nor the great westward bend the high road took before turning through Highhorn Pass. I could think of nothing except the unseemly timing of my wife's conception, and of riding straight home to rebuke her for being so unfaithful. Such was my agitation that I hardly cared that I would be riding into the arms of the Harper Witch, forsaking my sacred pilgrimage to Zentil Keep, and sacrificing all hope of finding the true life and curing the one of his madness. Nor did I consider that I would be damning myself to Kelimvor's hell for all eternity. No torment of Lord Death's could be worse than the shame my own wife had brought on my head. Only my devotion to our dark lord kept me from turning Hala around. My devotion— and also the thought of all my friends whispering behind my back. Such were my thoughts as Hala galloped down the high road along the brink of a sheer precipice, and I was so absorbed that I did not even notice when the shadow of a flying beast fell over me. The first I knew of my peril was when a huge talon struck my shoulder and jerked me from Hala's back and carried me out over the cliff's edge. I found myself dangling thousands of feet above a forest valley, 
and I knew at once who had done this. Which? Say it nicely, Malik, or you shall ride back to Candlekeep in Silver Cloud's talons. I realized instantly how the harper had overtaken me by flying straight across the mountains while Hala and I galloped around the great bend before Highhorn Pass, and I cursed myself for being so distracted that I did not anticipate her shortcut. I craned my neck around and saw the hippogriff's wings flashing silver as he climbed higher above the valley. Ruha's coal-rimmed eyes peered down over his shoulder. Not knowing that Mistra had denied the witch access to the weave, my greatest fear was that she was preparing some spell to immobilize me. I reached into my stolen abba and pulled out my dagger. Malik, look how far we are above the ground. I did not look, for then I would not have had the courage to act. I drew the dagger back, twisting my arm around to aim it at Silvercloud's equine brisket. No! Ruha yelled. You will kill us both! Not both of us! I replied, and then Mistress Spell compelled me to add, I am protected by tears' magic! And on account of these last few words, the witch had time to tap her mount's feathery neck. Bite! My dagger shot forward, and in the same instant, Silver Cloud's head darted down to attack. My blade struck his hooked beak and turned sideways, sliding along his upper mandible and sinking deep into his eye. Silvercloud screeched and opened his talons, and I dropped away. My stomach rose into my chest, then the hippogriff and his rider became specks in the sky. I plummeted past the cliff-top and looked over to see Hala galloping down the road. Then the valley rushed up beneath me, and I crashed down the billowing crown of a great oak, snapping a branch as thick as my body and tumbling down toward the ground. Meddling Harpers! Chapter 26 In the foothills of the Alfron Mountains, a thousand Holondathar footmen were carrying a hundred siege ladders up a boulder-choked slope. A steady drizzle of arrows and stones rained down from the castle of their enemies, and the wounded fell by the dozens. The closer the ladders came to the citadel, the fewer who remained to raise them. The baying of the war-dogs was echoing over the fortress walls. The seraph of death sat watching from a spire of sharp granite, and six avatars of Tempest the Battle-Lord were wandering the battlefield. With their battered breastplates and closed visors and bloodied limbs, they all looked the same as they dashed across the slope, plucking arrows from fallen warriors and healing wounds and sending the injured back to the ladders as strong as before. And still the advance was slowing. The Holondathar knew they would never take the citadel, and even the battle-lord's presence could not convince them otherwise. Mistra manifested herself beside one of Tempest's avatars, which happened to be reaching through a warrior's leather armor to pull an arrow from his lung. The man's face, normally the color of ginger, was as pale as mustard, and the sight of two gods kneeling over him seemed to stun him more than the shaft in his chest. He looked from one to the other, sobbing and cackling madly with laughter. Mistra touched her fingers to his brow, and when he had grown calm, she said to Tempus, It seems strange to heal them and then send them back to be wounded again. It is the only way to keep the battle going. Tempus paused to raise his visored face, and Mistra's skin stung beneath his hidden gaze. The Holondathar are fond of their war spells. It is a wonder they attacked at all, with you denying their battle wizards any magic. Mistra shrugged. It is not my fault if their sorcerers neglect their studies. No mortal can study twenty hours a day. Tempest pinched the shaft between his fingers and pulled it from the man's chest, and the arrowhead had no blood or gore of any kind. They would not have time to eat or sleep, much less make war. That would be a shame, would it not? More than you know. 
Tempest placed his hand over the wound and spoke a mystic word. A circle of smoke shot out from beneath his palm, and the man screamed. But you did not come here to learn the glories of war. What do you want? Adon, tell me what magic Sirik used to drive him mad. Tempest cocked his helm and remained silent. Mistress' face prickled beneath his stare, but she could not look through his visor to see his expression. The war dogs began to bay more loudly, and an eerie howl answered from somewhere deep in the mountains. An arrow struck the goddess's shoulder and broke in two, and she felt this less strongly than the battle lord's gaze. Tempest turned back to his patient and lifted his hand. A crimson palm print marked where the god had touched the man's armor, but there was no hole or other sign of the wound. Tempest stood the warrior up and pushed him toward the nearest ladder. Go, and make your Maharani proud. Despite Tempest's words, the warrior stumbled over the boulders at more of a crawl than a scramble. The battle lord shook his head in disgust. That will be one for Lord Death, though Kelimvor will never punish him as he deserves. There is no use changing the subject. Tell me what magic Sirik used against Adon. Tempest did not answer or even turn his visor in Mistra's direction. She said, So far, I have only made life difficult for your war wizards. Unless you wish me to deny the weave to any spellcaster involved in war, answer me. Tempest faced Mistra. Why would I know anything about Siric and your patriarch? Because Siric is behind this trial. He is in it with you. With me? Tempest shook his head. That is not so. He had nothing to do with my charges, except to receive them. Mistra furrowed her brow, for it was not in the battle lord's nature to lie. Always one to choose an open fight over intrigue, he either spoke the truth or did not speak at all. Who claimed Siric is behind this trial? Tempest started across the slope, not clambering over the boulders like a mortal, but stepping right through them and walking upon the empty air between. I do not like anyone lying about me. No one claimed that Siric is behind the trial. Mistra floated along at his side. I inferred it from something Kelimvor said. There is more to our troubles than we know. The god of war stopped and kneeled beside an unconscious warrior, then slipped two fingers into the man's head and popped his dented skull back into place. There is more to your troubles than you know, but the cause is Mask, not Siric. Mask? Tempest nodded. He hopes to win back what Siric stole. Mistress' heart sank. Pressuring Tempest had been her best hope of discovering what Siric had done to her patriarch, and Adon's condition was only growing worse. The last time she had looked in on him, he had been as frightened as before, and without the lassal haze clouding his mind. She had not dared probe his thoughts for fear of driving him completely insane. Mistra fixed a stern glare on Tempest, who was pressing his hand to the man's head wound and made a chopping motion with her fingers. At once, the magic faded from the battle lord's touch, and the fallen warrior remained unconscious. Tempest raised his head, and his gaze stung Mistress' skin like a sandstorm. You dare cut me off from the weave? To save a dawn, yes. Your charges are distracting me at the moment. Perhaps you would withdraw them? You cannot do this, Tempest warned. The circle will consider my actions at the trial. Until then, you will have to perform your duties without the weave. Mistra glanced at the carnage strewn across the slope. I wonder what Faerun will be like after seven days without war. Even you cannot stop war. It will survive without magic. Tempest's voice had grown more thoughtful than angry. But perhaps we can make a bargain. What kind of bargain? There was another howl, and this one seemed to rumble up from beneath the hill itself. Tempest paid it no attention. 
You must agree to restore war magic to its full force if I prove to you that war is good for Faerun. You will never prove that. Nevertheless, I will withdraw my charges if you merely agree to consider— But Fohammer, protested a wispy voice. A black shadow rose from beneath the boulders at Tempest's feet, then assumed the shape of a Holondathar footman. What about our agreement? You promised not to withdraw your charges. Mask! Mistra's sharp tone drew the attention of the Seraph of Death, who spread his wings and flew over, swooping low past a company of Holondathar footmen. More than fifty of them broke and ran for their own lines. Lady Magic hardly noticed, for her glare was locked on the Shadow Lord. This has nothing to do with you, Blackheart. But it does. Mask continued to face Tempest and did not look at her. It has everything to do with me, since Fohammer and I have an agreement. That agreement concerned Cyric, said Tempest. But it was not my doing that you expanded the charges to include Mistra and Kelimvor. Another howl sounded from between the boulders. Mask glanced into the crevice, then looked back to Tempest and spoke rapidly. Nor the tears separated the verdicts. By then I had made certain arrangements. Arrangements? Mistra's eyes grew narrow. If you are scheming against Kelimvor and me, stop it now. Or what? Mask snorted. A shudder ran through his shadowy figure. Then an extra face appeared on the back of his head. Whatever you do to me will be undone after the trial. Already I have duped you and your paramour into providing your own guilt. You have? Tempest demanded. This was just the sort of complication that he had feared when Mask came to him. Did you not tell me you had overcome your weakness for intrigue? This was not my fault. A deep snarl rumbled up from the boulders beneath Mask's feet, and he started to sidle up the hill toward the besieged castle. Besides, you have nothing to fear. Mistra and Kelimvor can save themselves no more than Cyric can. Lady Magic sneered. If that is so, Mask, what is there to stop me from destroying you now? It was Tempest who answered, Tear the just. The Battle Lord's visor swung up the slope toward Mask's retreating form. I will need to call the Shadow Lord as a witness. It is only proper to disclose whose idea it was to make these charges. Mask stopped on the spot. But if Cyric finds out I— You have nothing to fear from Cyric, Tempest said. Not if everything goes according to your plan. The Shadow Lord withered to half his normal size, and at that moment a reek of foul meat filled the air. A pair of yellow eyes appeared in the shadows at Tempest's feet, and the Chaos Hound sprang from beneath the boulders. Before the beast could find him, Mask fled up the slope and vanished into the shadows beneath the castle wall. Kezef let out a low, baleful growl and raised his slime-dripping nostrils to sniff the air. Mistra pointed up the slope. There, Kezef. Kezef cocked his great head, then let his muzzle fall into a sort of grin and bounded away over the boulders. He crashed through a heavy Holondathar siege ladder and trampled the poor footman who had been carrying it, then disappeared into the shadows after his quarry. The Seraph of Death raised his wings and vanished into the sky. Mistra looked back to Tempest and shook her head. Fohammer, you should be wiser than to involve yourself in Mask's schemes. This will come to a bad end for you. Perhaps, but I have already given my word. Tempest glanced up the slope toward the reluctant Holondathar advance. Besides, you have left me no other choice. War cannot go on like this. Chapter 27
Of all places in the City of the Dead, Rapture Round displayed most clearly the character of Kelimvor's reign. The Round was a vast circle of gardens where a dozen burrows came together, and from Penance Hill at its center, Lord Death could see them all. In Pax Cloister, a vast region of high peaks and shadow valleys, dwelled the spirits of peaceful hermits who had lived their whole lives desiring nothing more than solitude and quiet. Next to it stood the idle hamlets, which were the villages of simple country spirits who valued family and good company above wealth or power. Flanking these were the singing city and the fruitful forest, and to each of these Lord Death sent souls who would find happiness within. Bordering these wards were others filled with kind and noble spirits who had either turned from their gods or never found one at all. The vista behind Kelimvor was not so pleasant. In the acid swamp the spirits of charlatans and swindlers gathered along roadways and bridges to beg help from passerby. Next to this, the crimson jungle was filled with murderers and torturers of every sort, all changed into ravenous beasts too busy devouring each other to escape. Beside these burrows were the maze of alleys and the city of cold, where Lord Death sent the spirits of thieves and panderers, and bordering these districts were homes for all the intemperate and pragmatic spirits who had made it their business to take care of themselves and no other. You know, Jurgel, there was a time when every act I performed had to be a selfish one. As Kelimvor spoke, the seneschal's shadow-filled cloak appeared beside him. Ah, yes, the lion's bane curse. Perform a selfless act, turn into a man-eating beast. Where would you have sent me? Kelimvor turned and pointed at the web of snakes. There? Home to the hopelessly confused? I would not have sent you anywhere, Jurgel replied. Merkel would have put you in his wall of bodies, and who can say what Sirik would have done? I had a pretty good idea. The voice was Mistra's, and she appeared on the hill beside Kelimvor. That is why I fought so hard to overthrow him before he found you. Kelimvor dismissed Jurgel with a thought, then turned to Mistra. I am glad you saved me from Sirik's mercies, but sometimes I wonder about giving me his throne. I did not give you anything. The denizens of the city made you their ruler. Kelimvor's eyes grew sad. I have not forgotten. I think it would be easier to be a true god of death if I could. Mistra scowled. Kelimvor, I do not like this thinking. You are more suited to action, and I wish you would take some. Kelimvor recoiled as though struck, then raised his brow and squared his shoulders. Maybe so. Is that what you came to say? Mistra shook her head. No. I came to tell you it is Mask who started all this, not Sirik. Kelimvor nodded. I know. Avner returned to the Crystal Spire and reported everything Mask said. Including his claim that he duped us? I fear it is more than a claim. He came to demand that I punish Avner as one of his faults, and I stepped into his trap like a blind bear. I refused. Mistra frowned. But Avner died serving his queen. That would count for much, had he been one of Torm's faithful— but Avner worshipped no god except the god of thieves. I see. Mistra bit her lip. What does Mask have planned for me? I received no such demand. Kelimvor shook his head. I have no idea, but I can tell you there is only one way to counter his trap. And that is? Reflect on ourselves. Make certain we are serving our nature and the balance. Mistra rolled her eyes. I think we would be wiser to force our accusers to withdraw their charges. I will take care of Mask, but you must handle Tempus. Handle him? Kelimvor's tone betrayed his wariness. How? Withhold death from the justified side in every battle. Withhold death? Kelimvor was too stunned to say more. 
Nothing could bring all the wars on Faerun to a swifter end. Tempest will be forced to do as we ask. You are as mad as Siric, Kelimvor shouted. Of course, this was not possible. Mistra was not smart enough to be even half as mad as Siric. Even if I could decide which side is justified, and that is Tyr's purview, not mine, Tempest would never break his promise to Mask. By the time I finish with him, Mask will beg Tempest to withdraw the charges. Kelimvor cocked his brow. I thought you promised not to interfere with the trial? That was before Adon's affliction. More to the point, Mask was not part of the trial in the past, nor will he be in the future. There will be no trial, at least not for us. Kelimvor took a breath and made no reply. Mistress studied him. You are not going to do this, are you? Kelimvor shook his head. You are asking me to violate my duty as god of death. But this is for Adon. I know. Kelimvor closed his eyes. But my refusal is for us. If you do this thing, you are lost. Mistra staggered back. What has happened to you? She stepped off the hill into the empty air. I will talk to you when your senses return. Kelimvor watched the goddess vanish, then looked back toward the web of snakes. Jurgle, I am here for you, as always. The seneschal's empty cloak appeared at Kelimvor's side. How may I serve you? Did you hear what passed between Mistra and me? Did you want me to? Kelimvor thought for a moment, then shook his head. No, I suppose not. Jurgle's yellow eyes swung away, gazing down upon a bed of crimson lilies. Then I heard nothing. Is there anything else? Kelimvor nodded, then faced his seneschal. Mistra was right about one thing. It is time I started taking action. He stepped off the hilltop directly into the Crystal Spire's throne room, though the distance was farther than a camel could run in two days. Jurgle, I want you to prepare a list of all the judgments I have made since becoming God of Death. The seneschal appeared at Kelimvor's side, his empty cloak waving like a banner in the wind. All your judgments? All of them. Avner will be returning with his report soon. If things go as I expect, we will have a lot of work to do. Chapter 28 It required Hala but a short time to find me in the forest where I had fallen, for my hand was coated with Silver Cloud's blood, and she had a very keen nose for gore. Within minutes I was on her back, galloping along on my sacred pilgrimage. Aside from the strain my terror had placed on Cyric's rancid heart, I was none the worse for my long plummet. Though my thoughts remained much concerned with my wife's unfaithful miracle, I had learned my lesson and kept a careful watch over my shoulder. Apparently, the harper's hippogriff had fared worse than I during our quick exchange— I saw no sign of the witch or her beast all day, and so it was that I rode into Arabelle upon the supper hour shortly before dark. Although the one had graced the city by living there before the time of troubles, Arabelle seemed no different than any other barbarian town, with dogs wandering loose and insects swarming out of open gutters. The avenues were narrow and crooked and almost deserted, since most people were inside taking their suppers. The smell of roasted meat and warm bread filled the air. After my harrowing escape that morning and the hard ride that followed, I felt worthy of a good meal and a soft bed. I guided Hala to one of the few people on the street, a burly guardsman standing outside an alley. As we approached, he turned to face us and angled his halberd across his body. "'Well met, traveller,' said he. "'How can I—' Before I could ask him a single thing, Hala bit his halberd in two and nosed him back into the alley. "'In the name of Torm!' The guard dropped his useless polearm and reached for his sword. "'Control your mount!' 
The poor soul did not know the folly of what he asked. Before his sword could clear its scabbard, Hala bit off the astonished fellow's hand. There is little point in describing what followed, except to note that I was lucky enough to salvage his coin purse before my ravenous mount swallowed it whole. I retreated to the mouth of the alley and, by virtue of my dark abba and disheveled appearance, managed to look suspicious enough that the few passer-by who came along crossed to the other side of the street. As I listened to Hala devour her meal, naturally my thoughts turned to my own empty stomach and to the soft bed I would enjoy afterward. And the moment I thought of a soft bed, I also thought of my wife and of the unfaithful timing of her miracle. Bile filled my throat, my chest tightened, and I grew so angry about matters in Kalimshan that I did not even notice the lanky figure in the hooded cloak until he was almost upon me. I stepped out to meet him, thinking to distract him with the same question I had intended to ask the guard. Sir, can you tell me of a good inn? Of course. The figure spoke in a thousand voices, and when he raised his head, I saw Sirik's bony face. But until you find the Serenishad, what use do you have for an inn? Mistress Spell compelled me to say, I am hungry and tired. And? asked Sirik. I sighed, for I knew better than to declare I could not continue without rest. The truth was only that I felt sorry for myself, and on that account did not want to go on, and who could tell what else I might blurt out? Malek, it seems your heart is no longer in your mission. The one tapped his chest to remind me how he knew this. Perhaps you have been... distracted? Perhaps, I said, and then the harlot's spell compelled me to add, I can think of nothing except the shame brought upon my good name by my wife and the prince. Sirik smirked, which is a horrible thing for a skeleton's face, and said, I thought so. The one looked away for a moment, then said, You no longer have any need to worry about your wife and the prince. I have eliminated that problem. Eliminated it, mighty one? Yes, Malik. You understand eliminated, do you not? Do not let them trouble your thoughts again. Them? I staggered back, for it was one thing to curse my unfaithful wife, and quite another to know that it had been done. Then my wife is... gone? I will never see her again? Not in this life. The black suns beneath the one's brow flared to twice their customary size. I am surprised her death troubles you. How can you think of your wife when I am on trial? Because of the terrible shame she— Here my throat seemed to close in on itself. Then another reply spilled from my lips. Because I might miss her. The one's jaw snapped shut. Then he glared at me so long I thought he had turned into a statue. Yet he could be no more surprised than I was, for I had not realized the truth of my words until they spilled from my mouth. At last the one shook his head. I will not return her to life, Malik. She is too much of a distraction. He laid a bony arm across my shoulders, then pulled me as close as a brother. But perhaps— if you ride very hard, I will hear her calling from the fugue plain. Then, after you recover the Serenishad, you can join her in the castle of the Supreme Throne. I did not know whether to rejoice or despair, as he had not mentioned how soon this might be. That is more than I deserve. Sirik patted my shoulder. Not so, Malik. If you fail me, you will join your wife in the City of the Dead. This I promise. The one glanced westward toward the storm horns looming beyond the city walls. Now, think of your wife no more. You have other women to worry about. I pushed myself away from the building and peered in the same direction. There, silhouetted against the crimson ball of the setting sun, I saw the distant figure of a hippogriff and its rider. That witch is a demon from the abyss! 
No, Malik, corrected the one. She is a harper. Chapter 29 When a man is seized by an unreasonable fear and he knows it, he begins to fear his reason itself. He doubts what his eyes show and what his ears tell, what he smells and tastes, and even the thoughts that fill his head. He can be certain of nothing except that he is, and that something out there wants him not to be. This was the state of Adon the Patriarch. He lay in his humble bed, clutching the sides of his straw mattress, afraid to turn his eyes upon anything but the coffered ceiling above. When he looked outside, his gaze slipped between the balcony balusters and he saw Mistress Avatar on the shore of Hillshadow Lake. A cloud of hair floated like black smoke around her head, and her crimson talons were hurling lightning and fire at a many-tentacled monster thrashing about in the water. But neither the battle nor Mistress' presence disturbed Adon so much as the certain conviction he was imagining the whole thing. The fight was as silent as a mirage, the lightning and roiling fire did not rumble or crash, and when the slimy beast opened its maw to roar, no sound came at all. This was because the goddess, having no wish to disturb the sleep of her troubled patriarch, had enclosed the combat within a curtain of silence. But Adon did not know this. To him the fight seemed a dream, except that he was awake, and since he was awake, the dream could only be a hallucination, and since the dream was a hallucination, he could only be mad. This thought was a great relief to him. Like any fool who ever loved a deceitful woman, Adon preferred ignorance to betrayal. Going mad was just the excuse he needed to ignore what he had seen in the eyes of Nadisu Bahaskar. Where before a heart full of adoration for Mistra had beat in his chest, now there was only a gnawing void he could not abide. He had felt such an emptiness once before, when he lost faith in Sunni after a madman's dagger slashed his face. For months afterward he had felt hollow and sick inside, and he could not bear such emptiness again. Yet the prospect was difficult to ignore. When he looked anywhere but the ceiling, he saw Mistra in all her horrible countenance. Her snarling visage was carved into every panel of the room's immense double door, and her dreadful form was portrayed in grisly scenes sculpted into every wall. Adon remembered choosing these scenes himself though for some reason he had believed them to portray miracles instead of cataclysms. Had he been crazy then, or was he crazy now? After several hours, Adon decided to test his madness by looking upon a relief he remembered well. On the wall opposite his bed was a portrayal of the goddess joining the hands of two rival kings. He had once viewed this scene as an illustration of Mistress' divine love— if he looked upon it now and saw anything else, he would know he had lost his mind. The patriarch tore his gaze from the ceiling. The instant his eyes fell upon the carving, his vision blurred. He took a breath and squinted, forcing himself to see. He half expected the goddess to start moving, but she remained as motionless as any piece of stone. His vision cleared and he sighed in relief. There were no fangs or talons— no bare bones jutting through the flesh of her face. And yet the carving was as smooth and white as Mistress Skin had been when she last came to him. The silky long tresses could have been the smoky hair he remembered, and who was to say whether the artist had envisioned teeth or fangs lurking behind her full lips? Adon's breath grew fast and shallow, but he forced himself to study other scenes. Was the goddess turning back a fire— or spreading it across the fields? Was she stopping a tidal wave, or summoning it forth? The patriarch shut his eyes and softly cried out in despair. He was careful not to scream, for he did not want an acolyte to come check on him. They all stank of the goddess's magic, and the smell made him wretch and soil his bed. It is all so vague. Am I seeing these things or not? What things, dear Adon? Though the voice was as quiet as a thought, the patriarch knew it had not come from inside his own head. 
he threw off his blanket and rolled onto his knees and spun around to search for the speaker. The room was empty. That proves it. Adon cowered on his mattress. I'm mad. Mad? Now the voice came from behind him. It was soft, like a woman's, and sickly sweet. Not at all, Adon. If you were mad, you would belong to Cyric. Do you think I would let that happen? I am mad. Adon refused to turn toward the voice. I am hearing voices. A laugh followed. But isn't that normal when a goddess speaks with her patriarch? Something rustled on the other side of the room. Adon turned toward the noise, but saw nothing. The sound had come from a bas-relief near the enormous double doors. He broke into a sweat and stared at the scene. The carving showed Mistra dancing with a circle of horned fiends. The beasts were all about her, falling to the ground and writhing in ecstasy. Or perhaps they were thrashing in pain. Adon could no longer see any difference. The scene depended entirely upon how he looked at it. The brutes could have been grinning or grimacing, as he decided. Adon squeezed his eyes closed. If you care about me at all, dear goddess, you will leave me alone. You have nothing to fear from me, Adon. I will cause you no harm. The patriarch pushed himself across his bed, away from the voice, and stepped onto the floor. He glanced out across his balcony and saw Mistra outside, still battling the kraken. This did not shock him, for he was sane enough to recall that gods can create more than one avatar. A pair of stony footsteps echoed across the floor, as though someone had entered the room. Adon looked back toward the door and saw that Mistress Figure had stepped out of the wall carving. She was walking toward him slowly. Adon crouched behind the headboard of his bed. Stay back! The alabaster goddess was small, standing only as high as Adon's waist. Her hair floated about her head like pale smoke, and her eyes blazed with a fierce yellow light. Beneath the curve of her upper lip gleamed the tips of five little fangs. The figure waved a white claw down her pale body. How can you doubt what you see, Adon, when it is set in stone? Adon screamed, for what he saw was a fiend more wicked than any from the abyss. The doors to the anteroom swung open. Prince Tang entered, thrusting a square-tipped sword before him. Patriarch, what is— The avatar swung an arm toward the intruder. Leave us! At once the doors swung shut, knocking Prince Tang back across the threshold. He had no chance to withdraw his hand. His forearm became lodged between the great doors. There was a sharp crack, and his sword clanged to the floor. The prince allowed a cry of pain to slip from his lips, but quickly regained his usual composure. A thousand pardons, goddess, said Tang, peering through the crack between the doors. Despite the unnatural bend in his arm, his voice betrayed no pain. I did not mean to interrupt. Then be silent. Mistra fluttered her hand in the prince's direction. His eyes closed, then he slumped to the floor, his arm still caught between the doors. The goddess hardly looked at him. Instead, she raised her alabaster arm toward Adon. Now come to your goddess and take comfort. Adon could only stare at Tang's crooked arm. The Mistra he remembered would never have injured a mortal so callously. Of course not said a voice in his head. You would have turned away if you knew the truth about her, and she needed you to start her church. Mistra was always good at such games. Or have you forgotten how she played Kelimvor and me against each other? S Cyric? The instant Adon gasped the name, Mistra's avatar jumped onto the foot of his bed. Adon, come to me! The avatar's voice was so commanding that Adon found himself stepping around the headboard to obey. No, Adon, if you go to her, I cannot protect you. The patriarch stopped. Call my name now, and I can save you. Save me? Adon shook his head, praying that he was not yet mad enough to believe such a lie. You would never save me. 
Say my name, and I'll spare you her wrath. The alabaster goddess sprang off the foot of his bed. No, Adon, do as I command. She started toward him, and her lips drew back to show her fangs in all their painful glory. Adon retreated into the arch that opened onto his balcony. Keep back! Don't make me say it! Say what? Mistra's little avatar stopped a pace away. The flesh had peeled from her cheeks, and the bone underneath was as white as the rest of her. Adon, I want to help you. Then leave me alone! Mistra shook her head slowly. Her silky hair turned into black smoke and flowed into the room like bitter incense. That I cannot do. You have gone mad, poor boy. But you said— Adon gasped and rubbed his neck. The smoke had made his throat so dry he found it difficult to speak the words. You said that if I was mad I belonged to— The patriarch would not speak the one's name. Go ahead, Adon. Say it. Adon shook his head and continued to stare at Mistra. You said that if I was mad, I would belong to him. I said I would never let that happen, and now the time has come to prevent it. The statue stepped forward, raising her arm to strike. Adon rushed to the edge of the balcony. Out on Hillshadow Lake, he saw Mistra's avatar walking across the water. She did not look up, for she was peering beneath the surface, stabbing at her quarry with harpoons of lightning. With each strike, the water rose like a curtain, and still none of it made a sound. Say my name and let me save you. I'd rather die. And this was true, for Adon feared Sirik's promises even more than he feared a faithless death. I will trust to Kelimvor's justice, but I will never trust you. With that, he threw a leg over the balcony rail and looked down. Five stories below sprayed the morning fountain, surrounded by a stone terrace where the temple's faithful liked to make their morning devotions. The court was empty now. The faithful had all walked down to the shore to watch the silent battle between Mistra and the Kraken. A few dozen townspeople had also gathered at the lake to observe the spectacle. The goddess's avatar grasped Adon's arm. He tried to shove her away, but her talons were buried too deep. "'Say my name!' urged the voice in his head. "'I spurn you!' he screamed. "'I repudiate both of you!' Then Adon turned and flung himself off the balcony. He was halfway to the fountain before he asked himself where he had found the strength to pull free from the grasp of a god, and by then there was no time to recant or to embrace the One. Chapter 30 Mistra was still battling the Kraken when she felt a pain in her heart and heard a body splash into the fountain beneath Adon's balcony. Her avatar reached the terrace before the splash faded from the air, but already she was too late. The patriarch lay floating in the pool, his dead eyes staring at the sky, a cloud of red blood billowing outward around his head. A crack had opened in the fountain wall where his skull had struck, and now a steady stream of water was pouring out upon the terrace. The goddess pulled Adon's body from the pool and clutched it to her breast. Then she saw his spirit draining through the pool's cracked wall. Adon! Forgive me! The patriarch's words were garbled and prolonged. The red-clouded current had stretched his spirit into a figment from a nightmare, and his ghostly face was as thin as a snake. Siric tricked me. Adon, how can there be anything to forgive? This was not your doing. Mistra kneeled beside the fountain and waited until her patriarch's spirit pulled out on the patio in a shimmering blob. Speak my name, and I take you back. Adon's face broke into a crackled pattern. The water was seeping down between the paving stones and his spirit with it. Say, name? The shattered voice was shrill with fear. That's what he wanted. 
What he wanted does not matter, shouted Mistra. Already Adon's face had become nothing but a pattern of ghostly lines. The goddess thrust a hand into the water to give his spirit something to cling to. Call me to save you, and I shall return your spirit to your body. There came a strangled gasp, but even Mistra could not claim it for her name. The sound could have been a worm drowning as easily as the patriarch's voice. Adon's spirit sank beneath the stones. Mistra screamed, and there was such a surge of magic that spells misfired all across Faerun. Now Adon would be lost to her until he reached the Fugue Plain, and that would be some time hence, after he found his way out of the elemental plane of water. The journey would not be as painful as Zael's passage through the para-elemental plane of magma, but it would still be difficult, and Mistra vowed to have her vengeance. A swarm of onlookers arrived to gaze at the corpse in the goddess's lap. Most were her acolytes, but a few were curious townsmen who felt no shame in invading the temple's privacy. They were all too stunned to speak, on account of both Adon's death and the miracle of seeing one mistra on the terrace while another hunted the kraken in the lake. A few faithful fell to their knees and opened their hands in the starburst sign of their goddess, and others ripped their cloaks in lamentation for the patriarch. But no one thought to offer any aid, or ask what had happened, until Prince Tang ran onto the terrace. "'Lady Magic, what has happened?' The prince cradled his broken forearm to his chest, and carried his square-tipped sword in his other hand. "'What have you done to Adon?' Mistress scowled. "'What did I do, Prince Tang?' As she spoke, her avatar grew larger and stretched forward, so that she was suddenly looking down on the prince. I did nothing except trust in you to guard him. Prince Tang paled to the color of ivory. Please forgive me, Lady Magic. I have made a terrible mistake. But when I saw your statue speaking— My statue, Prince Tang? Mistra stood, still clutching Adon's body in her arms, and now she was as tall as a verbeeg. Your statue from the wall carving. No sooner had the prince said this than he perceived how easily he had been duped and began to prattle on without a trace of his usual composure. Your statue ordered me to go, then slammed the door on my arm so I could not, then it put me to sleep, and when I awoke— that is enough, Prince Tang. Mistra spoke in a milder tone, for she was a weak-willed goddess who never punished her servants for a failure they were helpless to prevent. After Tang fell silent, she lowered Adon's corpse into the arms of four waiting acolytes. Care well for your patriarch's body. He will soon have need of it. We shall. They took the corpse and started for the temple. Mistra turned back to Prince Tang, then shrank to a height nearer his. Now let me see to that break. That would be most kind, honorable goddess. The prince presented his twisted arm. I regret my inadequacy in defending your patriarch, but before I realized what was happening, I was asleep and unable to call for help. There is no need to apologize. Mistra took the prince's arm above and below the break, then pulled in opposite directions. The bone straightened with a soft pop. Tang's legs nearly buckled, but he was too vain to scream or faint, which any honest man would have done. The goddess placed her hands over the injury, then continued to absolve the prince of blame. You could not be expected to keep Adon safe from another god. Another god? Tang asked. You doubt it was Sirik? Someone wants me to believe it was Sirik. Mistra made no mention of who that someone was, for she did not want to say the name before so many onlookers. And when someone wants me to believe one thing, I am inclined to believe another. Here Mistra was thinking of the battle between the Halondathar and their enemies, when Mask had bragged about duping her into proving her own guilt. She saw how it would serve the Shadow Lord to start a fight between her and Sirik, 
and how Mask often favored such duplicity, and how the god of thieves might steal Adon's sanity instead of using spells or curses to wreck it. She decided this was exactly what had happened, and resolved to have her vengeance on the Shadow Lord. When Mistra removed her hands from Tang's arm, the swelling had gone, as had the purple color and every other trace of injury. Prince Tang flexed his fingers and smiled. A thousand gratitudes, Lady Magic. He bowed his head, but only briefly. The arm has healed. Mistra smiled. Mending your injuries is the least I can do. Pass me your sword, and you shall have a true reward. Prince Tang's eyes grew bright, and he passed the sword over at once. The hilt and scabbard were encrusted with rubies and sapphires and diamonds, but when Mistra removed the sheath, it was clear the weapon had been made for combat. The silvery blade gleamed with the legendary sheen of hundredfold shoe steel, which kept a better edge than any metal worked by mortals. The goddess ran her finger down the blade, coating the edge with a film of her sparkling red blood, and spoke a mystic syllable. Her blood sizzled away in a wisp of brown smoke, and then a crimson light gleamed deep within the shoe steel. So beautiful was this sheen that the onlookers all gasped in delight. Mistra slipped the sword into its scabbard. This blade will slay any hound it strikes, whether the creature was born from natural or unnatural loins. Though he was as inscrutable as any shoe prince, Tang could not keep his brow from rising. Any hound, Lady Magic? Yes, Prince Tang. A bewildered murmur rustled through the crowd of onlookers. Mistra ignored it and kept her attention fixed on the prince. And while you hold it in your hand, no beast can follow your spore, whether the creature be of this world or any other. Ah, yes, how very nice. Tang accepted the sword and lowered his brow, yet his eyes betrayed his confusion. Shu princes were more accustomed to fleeing assassins than hounds. This will be most useful. I am certain it will save my life. Some day. It is but a small token of gratitude for the care you showed Adon. May it serve you well. Mistra led Prince Tang back into the temple, leaving the onlookers to whisper among themselves. She could have heard every word if she wished, but there was no need. She knew her plan would work. The thieves of the Purple Mask had been stealing sheets of alabaster and cartloads of marble from her temple since the day construction began, and their spies had certainly been among the onlookers who watched her bless Tang's sword. Those same spies would report the gift to their guildmasters, and the guildmasters would see at once how the weapon might benefit their divine patron. Before Prince Tang reached his palace, Mask himself would know of the weapon's special powers, and then Mistra would have her vengeance. Or so the stupid harlot thought. Chapter 31 after my audience with the One, I took leave of Arabelle at once and galloped north through Tilverton and Shadowgap into Shadowdale, home to a nation of ignorant farmers and an irksome old twaddler named Elminster, Ruha, who had stopped in Arabelle overnight to have a healer care for Silver Cloud's injured eye, followed half a day behind, as unshakable as a bad reputation. Every so often, as I crested a mountain pass or crossed a vast bottomland, I glanced back and saw a speck in the southern sky and knew she was still there, dogging my trail as the chaos hound dogs masks. And then I cursed her for a hell hag and raised my eyes to the heavens and asked what I had ever done to her, though of course I never received any answer. The truth was she hated me not for any wrong I had caused her, but on account of my place in the many terrible visions and dreams she had been suffering of late, and because she feared these mirages would drive her as mad as Cyric if she did not stop me. But even had the witch been farther behind, I would have stopped no longer than it required to sate Hala's hunger. 
Sirik's visit had renewed the zeal for my sacred pilgrimage, as I had no wish to send my unfaithful wife to the city of the dead, or to join her there, which would certainly be my destiny if I failed to recover the true life and cure the one of his madness. With my holy devotion thus renewed, I rode day and night, giving no thought to rest or food or any need that could not be answered in the time it took Hala to gulp down her meals. And such was my fervor that when I galloped into a muddy little village and saw the one's sacred starburst and skull openly flying from the flagpole of an imposing black fortress, I stopped only long enough to demand a meal for Hala and myself. As usual, the acolytes were at first reluctant to feed me when I said I would not pay, but this changed as soon as they sensed Sirik's presence in my person. Hala was shown to the goat pen, and I was taken into a great hall and seated at the head of a long banquet table. Like the rest of the temple, the entire hall was shuddering and trembling from the effects of Mistra's unjust assaults on the one, but I was too weary to let this trouble me. As I waited for my food, two believers came and stood at my sides, their hands resting on the hilts of their weapons. One, a brawny man with flinty eyes and a narrow face, wore a purple robe trimmed in black silver. The other, whose shoulders were as wide as Hala's, was dressed in armor of red leather, and it was he who addressed me. Who are you to come into Vunlar and insult Gormstadt? Here he jerked a thumb at his silk-robed companion, then continued, by ordering his monks around in his own temple. I replied without rising. I am Malik el Sami in Nasser, and I am on a sacred pilgrimage for the One. It is a great honor for Gormstadt, and here I jerked my thumb at the man in silk, to aid me in any way he can. This caused both men to raise their brows and remove their hands from their weapons, for like any true believer, they were quick to sense the One's presence. Then a monk happened to arrive with a trail piled high with food and drink, and Gormstadt himself took the platter and held it out toward the red-armored man. "'Why don't you serve, Borstog?' Borstog nodded, then set the mug on the table before me and filled it with mead from the pitcher. This did much to restore my spirits, as it reminded me of the great honor and power that would be mine after I saved the one. "'You look tired, El Sammy, said Borstog. With his own dagger he cut a piece of bread for me, then smothered it in honey. Perhaps you should stay and rest in Vunlar. I shook my head. I am being pursued by a harper witch, and if I let her catch me, I will never cure the one of his madness. I did not know whether it was my own weariness or mistress' spell that caused me to add these last words, but as soon as I spoke them I realized what a blunder I had made. Borstag and Gormstadt scowled and stared at each other, and dropped their hands again to their weapons. I leapt up to flee. Gormstadt clapped a hand on my shoulder, and Borstag grabbed my arm, and I thought they would certainly throw me in chains and denounce me to our dark lord. But such was their awe of the presence they sensed in me, that either they thought it wiser to ignore my blasphemy, or did not notice it at all. This harper, can you describe her? asked Borstock. I saw by his white knuckles that he liked meddling harpers no more than I. Of course, you will recognize her by the hippogriff she rides and by the veil she wears over her face. Good, said Gormstadt, pushing me back into my seat. Finish your meal. Borstock will make sure that harper never catches you. Chapter 32 Prince Tang passed the day gathering his company of bodyguards and riding home to the Ginger Palace, which lay about a half-day south of Elver Salt. He finished the trip so exhausted that he commanded his servants to wash him and put him straight to bed. He did not stir until late in the night, when he was roused from a dead slumber by a strange and ghostly baying. The howl sounded at once distant and near, as though his bedchamber had stretched to a length of many li. 
Tang thought of Mistress Gift and sat up. His bed formed its own room, covered as it was by a silk canopy and enclosed by lacquered panels depicting all manner of leering monsters. These were the guardians of his sleep, which prevented evil spirits from stealing his soul as he slumbered. When the prince heard no sound from his night servant, who sat beyond the panels at the foot of his bed, he wondered if the baying had been a dream. Then came another howl, louder than before and so eerie that it sent a prickle up his spine. The night servant did not open a panel or make any other move to wake him, and Tang thought this strange. He reached under his pillow and withdrew a dagger of silvery shoe steel, then crawled to the end of his bed, wondering if the goddess had foreseen this when she blessed his sword. He wedged the tip of his knife between two panels and slid them apart, moving so slowly they made no sound at all. The night servant lay upon the floor, her eyes dead and wide and fixed upon the little lamp she kept burning on the night table. The purple cord that had strangled her remained wound about her throat, and the murky shape of the assassin stood a few paces beyond, facing away from the bed. In the flickering light, the intruder's body seemed to curl and roll like smoke. He was staring at the freestanding sword rack where Tang kept his most cherished weapons. The rack resembled a ladder, each rung a bejeweled scabbard worth an entire caravan of frankincense. In the highest berth rested the Xi'an Mistra had blessed. Tang did not call for his guards, he guessed that the intruder had already killed them. Instead, the prince watched the dark silhouette in growing puzzlement. The thief was staring at the blessed Xi'an, yet he seemed reluctant to take it. Tang did not guess that the intruder was Mask. Nor did the god of thieves sense Prince Tang's wakefulness. The Shadow Lord was consumed by thoughts of the Xi'an. Even through the scabbard, Mistra's magic radiated off the blade so strongly that it nearly blinded him. This made the thieving god more suspicious than ever, for he had known the instant he heard the guildmaster's prayer that the sword was bait in a trap. Still he had come. A weapon that could keep the chaos hound at bay, or kill him, was worth any risk. Kezef's plaintive howl sounded again in the distance. The Shadow Lord shuddered, imagining what would happen if the hound's poison-crusted fangs ever sank into his tenebrous flesh. He reached into his cloak and withdrew a piece of raw venison, and this he tossed into a dark corner. Then he took a half-starved wolf pup from his other pocket and set her on the floor to see if the sword's magic would prevent the beast from finding her meal. The pup looked around the dark room, then touched her nose to the cold marble and fell over dead. Mask nearly screamed his delight, for the weapon was more powerful than he had hoped. It had killed the wolf pup without even touching her. All that remained was to find Mistress Trap and disarm it, a task that the sword's blinding aura of magic would render considerably more difficult. From the same dark corner through which Mask had entered came another howl, this time so loud it rattled the lacquered panels of Prince Tang's bed. Tang cringed, for he feared the sound would draw the intruder's attention to his hiding place. But this did not occur. The thief, and the prince thought him to be simply that, ignored the baying and also the soft rattle of the panels, and he paced back and forth before the sword stand. In the darkness, the figure looked like an elf at some times, and at others like a man, and once it even seemed to be an orc. These changes Tang dismissed as tricks of the dim light. The prince could not imagine why the interloper hesitated, but he wished the man would find his courage. The strange howls convinced him that Mistra had foreseen the need for just such a weapon, and as soon as the intruder reached up for the Xi'an, Tang meant to attack. Unfortunately, it was beginning to appear the hound would be in the room before the fellow made up his mind. Tang kept his eye pressed to the crack between the panels, watching the intruder consider the sword stand. Twice more the hound howled, and this baying disturbed even the thief, who shuddered like empty cloth and glanced toward the sound. A low growl rumbled through the room, 
Then a pair of yellow eyes appeared in the dark corner. The eyes began to grow larger, and the prince dared wait no longer. He pulled the panel aside and flung himself at the intruder, dagger raised to strike. The silhouette did not turn so much as ripple, and the prince found himself looking into the damson eyes of a towering knoll. Like all shoe nobles, Tang had mastered the art of mortal combat, and in a blink he stopped himself short and delivered a kick to the knoll's knee that would have snapped a ginkgo tree. Nothing happened, save that the impact broke several bones in Tang's foot. Fool! sneered the intruder. Leave me alone, or I— The rumble in the corner became a blaring howl, and a sickening reek of spoiled flesh filled the chamber. Four sets of claws clattered across the floor, and the prince knew that if he did not retrieve his Xi'an, nothing would save him now. He feigned another kick, then slashed at his foe's eyes and tried to slip past to grab the sword. A murky arm swept down to block the attack, then flung the prince back toward his bed. Tang glimpsed an enormous beast loping beneath him, then crashed through a pair of sliding panels and found himself lying where he had started. Though his body ached, the prince rolled to the edge of the bed and saw a creature as large as a horse. It was the most hideous hound imaginable, with a tail of bare bone and a haze of brown breath wringing its blocky head. The beast stopped and shook itself, spraying a cloud of wriggling maggots in every direction, then leapt at the thief. Tang gasped, for he knew the hound would turn on him as soon as it swallowed the intruder. Seeing that Tang had robbed him of any chance of escape, the thief whirled and grabbed the sword, intending to complete the circle and attack the chaos hound in one smooth motion. This was not to be. A slender arm shot up from the Xi'an's supporting berth and wrapped itself around Mask's wrist. He tried to shrink free, but the smaller he made his arm, the tighter the hand grasped him. Mistra! Even as Mask hissed the goddess's name, the chaos hound tore into his leg and severed it at the thigh. A great blast of darkness shot through the room, shattering the panels of the canopied bed and smashing the furniture against the walls. Kezef's poison surged through the Shadow Lord's veins, filling him with a scalding weakness that seemed to consume him from the inside out. He felt his head shriveling into a wrinkled husk, and his limbs withering into drooping stalks, and his spirit rushed out through his severed veins. In that moment, he knew the folly of angering the goddess of magic. The Shadow Lord shook his head clear and saw Kezef's great head looming above him. The remains of his leg dangled from the dog's slavering jaws, yet the hound made no move to attack. Instead, he kept his angry eyes fixed on the Xi'an, for he could sense the blade's magic as well as its purpose, and it made him cautious. Mask looked back to the arm that had sprouted from the polished wood of Tang's stand. Mistra, wait! the Shadow Lord pleaded. All the swords except the blessed Xi'an clattered to the floor. Let me save myself, and I will tell Tempest to withdraw his charges. It is too late for that. Mistra's avatar flowed out of the sword stand and took shape beside it. She held Mask's wrist with one hand and Prince Tang's Xi'an in the other. After what you have done, you cannot buy me off with a mere boon. I thought that was what you wanted. No longer. With a flick of her wrist, Mistra freed Prince Tang's Xi'an from its scabbard. At once, the bare blade filled the room with a crimson glow. Mask's shadowy form lost all semblance to a body. It became a puddle of darkness upon the floor, and the goddess raised her arm to strike. As the sword fell, a steel gauntlet appeared on Mistra's wrist and stopped the blow short. The goddess screeched as a second gauntlet appeared and wrenched the Xi'an away. Is this what your word means? The booming voice shook the chamber so terribly that the prince's bed danced across the floor. In the next instant, even as the two gauntlets continued to hold Mistra motionless, a burly, one-handed warrior appeared before the goddess. 
His eyes seemed a fierce steel gray for a moment, then faded to become black empty sockets. Never in his dreams had Prince Tang imagined such guests. Tear the eyeless now stood between Mistra and the Chaos Hound, pointing his stump at the goddess. You promised not to interfere with the trial. Mask was never in the pavilion of Sinashore, Mistra retorted, struggling against the disembodied gauntlet that still held her arm. Lady Magic, I will have none of your excuses. So angry was Tyr's voice that Kezef dropped Mask's leg and looked away in submission. I have been watching, Tyr continued. Tempest told you he would call Mask as a witness, and still you did this. The eyeless one waved at the quivering pool of darkness on the floor. In this moment of distraction, Kezef picked up the leg and skulked into the shadows, disappearing from the room. But Mask killed my patriarch. I know what Mask did, and better than you. Tyr fixed his eyeless gaze on the empty space beside her, then commanded, Hold the goddess until the trial. No one is to see her, or speak to her, or to communicate with her in any way. As the eyeless one spoke, the gauntlet on Mistra's wrist jerked her arm rudely backward. The second gauntlet dropped the Xi'an, then seized her other wrist and pinned both her arms behind her back. Only then did the goddess's captor reveal himself. He could have been an empty suit of plate mail, since that was the only form Helm the Vigilant ever assumed. Although not as mighty as some other deities, the god of guardians was as constant as he was heartless, and on this account he was the jailer of the immortals. After being placed under his charge, no deity could escape his care, or persuade him to forsake his duty, or overpower him in any manner. Helm acknowledged Tyr's order with a nod, then pushed Mistra toward the shattered bed, where Prince Tang still cowered in fear. Lady Magic knew better than to struggle. With her own eyes she had seen the great guard destroy the previous goddess of magic during the time of troubles, and she knew he would not hesitate to kill her now. She turned to make one last appeal. Tear, how can you allow this? Mask is more guilty of interfering with the trial than I. That is for me to decide. But the weave— You brought this on yourself, Tear said, and whatever happens to the weave is your own fault as well. Helm shoved the goddess onto Tang's bed, barely leaving the awe-stricken prince enough time to scramble off. At once, four fathomless walls replaced the shattered panels. The canopy changed into a ceiling of darkness, and the mattress became a void of soft emptiness, and Mistra found herself trapped in a cage of inescapable nothingness. Helm removed the purple cord from the throat of Tang's servant and tied it to the leg of the bed. Then he took the line in his hand and vanished from the chamber, pulling Mistra's prison along behind him. Tear turned his eyeless gaze upon the quivering puddle that was Mask. Quit your trembling, Shadow Lord. The hound is gone. The dark blob assumed the shape of a one-legged man. What took you so long? Kezef nearly had me. Tear shook his head. You are lucky I came at all. If Mistra had not attacked, I would have let Kezef finish his meal. So saying, the eyeless one faded from sight, leaving Mask to reassemble his form as best he could. The Shadow Lord melted again into a shapeless mass and writhed about on the floor. First he became an orc with three arms and no legs, then a gnome with three legs and no arms, then a spider with tentacles instead of legs. Tang rose from behind an overturned couch and saw his red glowing Xi'an on the floor, next to the shifting blob of shadow. He rushed across the room to snatch the weapon up. As soon as he touched the bejeweled hilt, a tendril of cold shadow shot from the puddle and caught his wrist. Not on your life, prince, hissed Mask. I lost a leg for that sword. 
Chapter 33 Every spy fears one place above all others, and for Ruha that place was Vunlar. The town sat just north of the Dales, where the Shind Road forked off toward Zentil Keep and the North Ride continued to Teshwave, and it was here the witch had first meddled in the affairs of others. The Harpers had sent her to take a position in the Swords Meat Tavern, where she was to serve as a messenger for another agent and spy upon the Zentilar who met there. This role demanded that she dress in the immodest fashion of a serving wench, which is to say, without veiling her face or much of her bosom, and she was pretty enough to attract a man's eye. It was not long before a slave smuggler crossed her palm with a silver coin, and she accepted the coin with thanks. Now it was true that Ruha was fresh from the desert, and did not comprehend the meaning of the exchange, yet a bargain is a bargain, and she had no right to refuse the expected services. The smuggler grew angry and drew his dagger, and he would have slain her if his own man, who happened to be the very spy Ruha had been sent to aid, had not leapt to her defense. The two were forced to fight their way out of town, leaving the smuggler free to sell a hundred wretched souls into slavery. Since then, the Harpers have called this incident the Vunlar debacle. So it was with an anxious heart that the witch arrived in Silver Cloud and circled low over the fork in the road, wondering which way I had taken. Her usual means of solving such dilemmas was to land and ask after a hell-horse, for Hala never failed to leave the locals with good reason to remember her. But the witch knew better than to ask such questions in Vunlar, where the villagers were prudent enough to mind their tongues. What was more, the witch had slept no more than five hours in five days, nor had there been much time to study Rinda's journal, and, despite the loss of his eye, Silvercloud had been on wing most of that time and worn himself down to feathers and bone. Ruha had no choice but to rest and make some discreet inquiries, trusting her veil to shield her identity and the strong ale of the local taverns to loosen the villagers' tongues. The witch removed her harper's pin and tucked it inside her robe, then landed at the edge of town. She led her mount past the sword's meat, where she had failed so miserably as a serving wench, then onward to Vunlar's only remaining inn, the sign of the shield. The witch paid four silvers for a goat, hoping Silver Cloud still had strength enough to eat, then told the liveryman to leave the hippogriff saddled. When she entered the tavern, she carried Rinda's journal tucked beneath her arm. The common room was rough-hewn but clean, with panels of white daub set between open posts and beams. Nearly two dozen people sat drinking ale and awaiting the contents of the kettle bubbling upon the hearth. Ruha took a seat in a corner, where she could turn toward the wall when she lifted her veil to eat, then opened Rinda's journal in the hope of finding some hint of my destination. As for Siric, now he sits alone in his shattered keep, lost in delusions of grandeur and absolute power, leaving his church on Faerun to grow ever more fragmented and weak. Some say this is because losing the city of the dead drove him insane, but I know better. Siric was the first to read the Serenishad. His own lies drove him mad. The witch yawned. It was one thing to remain alert while riding a cranky hippogriff hundreds of feet above the ground, and quite another to stay awake in a warm inn steeped in the aroma of barley soup. The letters grew blurry and her chin dropped toward her chest, and when the heavy leather cover thumped down upon the tabletop, she did not even hear it. Ruha would have dozed straight through the meal, had a familiar bellow not menaced her slumber. "'Give us some tankards, girl!' The man's voice was full of arrogance and spite, and even in her sleep the witch recognized its owner, Borstag Helamethel. "'And be quick about it. We've a thirst the size of the moon sea!' The witch opened her eyes to see four men taking seats at the next table. Three wore the chain-mail of the city guard, and the fourth, Borstag himself, wore red leather trimmed in silver. 
He was the brawn of Vunlar, the elected ruler of the village and a notorious hater of harpers. Though his back was turned and Ruha's face hidden safely behind her veil, the witch's pulse raced in her ears. Borstag had always favored the sword's meat. He had even been there the night of her debacle. She could not imagine what he was doing in the sign of the shield. No sooner had the brawn taken his seat than a fifth man entered the tavern, this one dressed in armor of black leather and steel plate. A veritable giant, he stood two heads taller than any one present. His dark beard and eye patch gave him a roguish look that caught the eye of every wench in the room, though he seemed to have eyes only for Ruha. He strode to her table and sat down, his torso eclipsing Borstock and the guards. Well met, Ruha, said the man. He spoke too loudly for the witch's peace of mind, as anyone nearby would hear his words without the effort of eavesdropping. You seem to have a problem. Perhaps I arrived just in time. Though all the serving girls had been happy to ignore Ruha while she slept, a wench appeared unbidden, carrying the four ales for which Borstag had called. Without taking her eyes off the newcomer's handsome face, she placed three mugs in front of him and gave the fourth to the witch, and neither Borstag nor any of his fellows protested. The stranger flashed a dazzling smile. I lack even a copper. The serving girl blushed. That's all right. I'll pay myself. She returned his smile, showing a mouthful of teeth as big as they were crooked, then whirled away to return to her duties. The stranger raised a tankard and began to gulp it down. Ruha leaned across Rinda's journal. Who are you? The man tossed the half-full tankard on the floor, where it shattered and left a dark stain. A few patrons glanced toward the corner, but as soon as they saw the big stranger, their scowls faded and they returned to their business. The fellow wiped his mouth on his sleeve and raised a hand to his eye patch. Come now, you know who I am. The stranger flipped up the patch, revealing an empty socket filled with whirling stars. I am the one who has been helping you catch Malik. Ruha gasped, for after Mistra's rebuke, she had guessed the identity of her benefactor. T Talus? The stranger nodded, then drained another tankard and hurled it against the wall. Again, no one objected. You tricked me, Ruha said. I helped you, and I am willing to help you again, if you ask very nicely. Ruha shook her head. Mistra is angry enough at me. Mistra is no use to you now. Talus drained half a tankard, then looked around the room as though trying to decide where to throw it next. The inn's other patrons simply watched, their faces betraying different mixes of bewilderment, fear, and awe. Tear has her locked away until the trial. You do know about the trial? And after the trial is over... Talus shrugged, then flung the tankard against the ceiling behind him. It exploded into a shower of ale and pottery, soaking an entire table of patrons. Talus tugged at his beard. Shall we just say that after the trial you will be calling on me for your magic? And touch off a new disaster every time I cast a spell? Ruha countered. I would rather do without. Truly. Talus pointed at Ruha's tankard. May I? Ruha pushed the mug forward and said nothing. Even if I am wrong about the trial, you need my help now. Talus lowered his voice. I do believe those boys behind me know you for a harper, and you understand what that means in this town. Without your spells— The destroyer sat back and raised his brow. The odds are not in your favor. Ruha glanced toward the door and saw that she had chosen a poor seat, for Borstag and his men would cut her off before she reached it. Nor was the window a convenient exit. She would have to leap over their table to reach the casement, and then it only opened into the street, so that she would have to pass by the tavern's doorway to reach the stable. Still, hippogriffs offered some advantages to a woman in a hurry— 
and she knew the window was her only hope. The witch looked back to Talos. I see your point, but I must take my chances. Tiny forks of lightning crackled in Talos's eyes, the empty one as well as the other, and his smile froze on his face. You refuse me? Ruha nodded. I am too old to learn a new way of magic, but if you still think it important to stop Malik, you could tell me where he is going. Why? You will not live long enough to catch him. Talus raised Ruha's tankard over his shoulder and, without looking, poured the entire contents over Borstok's head. Then he left, not vanishing in a flash of lightning so much as becoming one, and only a pile of smoking ash remained in place of the bench upon which he had been sitting. Borstag's deputies rose at once, blocking Ruha's route to the door, but the brawn himself merely wiped the ale from his face and turned to gaze at the witch. Ruha tucked her lip behind her teeth as Zael had taught her, then, praying that the tavern walls were too thin to muffle a whistle, gave a mighty trill. Borstag rose, but did not reach for his sword. This Malek you are trying to catch. Describe him. Ruha's heart caught in her throat, for she could not imagine the very man she feared most would tell her which way her quarry had gone. Yet she stood to lose nothing by answering. He is a pudgy little man with swarthy skin and eyes that pop out like a bug's. But you are most likely to recognize his horse— it is a magnificent beast with sapphire eyes and a monster's teeth. Borstag narrowed his eyes. Your voice seems familiar. He scowled and stepped over to her table. Why do you want to catch this Malik? Ruha replied without hesitation, for attempting to disguise her voice now would only heighten the bronze suspicion. He is a thief, and he has stolen something very important to me. She had given the same answer in a hundred places, and it had always satisfied whoever was asking, but not Burstag. He hated Harpers as much as he loved being the brawn, and he was only looking for some pretext to arrest Ruha that would not anger the inn's owner and cost him votes at the next election. Burstag glared at her, trying to unnerve her, but Ruha was accustomed to such games and returned his gaze in kind. The brawn looked away first, reaching down to seize Rinda's journal. What is this, your diary? He flipped the page and began to read. As for what became of the true life of Siric, I have heard that Fazul Chembril still keeps it in a safe place in the ruins of Zental Keep. Of course! Ruha gasped softly. Borstag paid her no attention and continued to read, still searching for some pretext to seize her. Although I wish it were in the hands of a more trustworthy caretaker, I pray this is true. The true life is the only way to unchain the minds imprisoned by the Serenishad's lies, and I fear the day will come when its plain truths are needed to save— Here Borstag quit reading. What is this blasphemy? And now his voice quivered with anger, for he was a loyal devotee of Sirik's temple in Vunlar. Sacrilege is against the law here. Ruha did not answer, for she was too stunned by what she had perceived. Clearly, her quarry was on the road to Zental Keep. That much was obvious. But could it be that the crafty little spy meant to recover the true life of Siric, that he actually intended to cure Siric's madness? The witch's mouth fell open, for she was much awed by the brilliance of the plan. Didn't you hear me? Borstock repeated. This book is against the law in Vunlar. Then you may confiscate it. It belongs to Malik. This confused Borstag for a moment. Ruha started toward the door. If you will excuse me. Wait a minute. I know that voice. Borstag reached across the table and jerked the veil from Ruha's face. 
You! The witch tucked her lip beneath her teeth and whistled again, then fainted toward the door. At once, Borstock and his deputies moved to cut her off. She spun around and rolled over her table, then leaped onto the next one and bounded across the room from tabletop to tabletop. Stop, Harper! the brawn yelled. Stop her! His command came too late. Ruha was already diving through the window and calling for Silvercloud. She hit the street and tucked into a roll, and when she returned to her feet, the hippogriff was flying over the stable gate. The witch did not command the beast to land, but threw up her arms and let him catch her in his talons. By the time Borstock came scrambling out into the street, the pair was already sweeping over the temple of the dark god reborn and making for Zental Keep. Chapter 34 A line of dark ramparts rose up from the distant horizon, blocking the road ahead. The umber ribbon of the river Tesh oozed down from the west, and the gray moon sea swept out to the east, and a pall of yellow haze hung low over the battlements, just as Rinda had described in her journal. At last I had reached my Mecca, the great Zental Keep. I would have urged Hala into a gallop, save that she was already flying up the road at her customary dead sprint, and it was all I could do to keep from bouncing off her back. My long journey was over, yet the hardest part of my quest remained ahead. Now I had to steal the true life of Sirik from Fazul Chembril and convince the one to read it, and I had only four days before the trial. As Hala carried me nearer to Zental Keep, I saw that the One had punished the city terribly indeed for its betrayal. He had allowed the dragons and giants to reduce the barbicans and watchtowers to jagged ruins, and long stretches of pale stonework marked the many repairs necessary because of their attacks on the ramparts. Of all the city's buildings tall enough to rise above the walls, only a few retained their highest stories, and fewer still had roofs. It was difficult to tell more from a distance, for a huge round knoll stood on the far side of the river, and the details of dark shapes vanished against the craggy face of this strange hill. When Hala and I drew close enough to see a cluster of shacks outside the gate, I realized Zental Keep was not the vast city Rinda had described in her journal. The whole town stretched but a thousand paces from east to west, and it could hardly have been a tenth that broad without spilling into the river Tesh, which separated it from the rounded knoll beyond. Such a tiny hamlet might have seemed a city to eastern barbarians, but it was barely more than a crossroads to a worldly merchant from Kalimshan. I reined Hala to a trot, then noticed that the hill across the river was made entirely of broken stone. It resembled a rubble pile, for among the rocks were many large slabs of mortared wall, which seemed carelessly tossed. Had the mound not been so many times larger than Zental Keep itself, I would have thought it some sort of dump. Hala trotted into the midst of the shanties outside the gate, and the strange hill passed out of sight behind the city ramparts. The gate stood open. Two guards stepped out of the gatehouse and crossed their halberds across the road. Each was as large as a harem eunuch, and over their chainmail they wore black tabards emblazoned with the emblem of Zental Keep, a white gauntleted fist surmounted by a jewel. I tugged on Hala's reins, bringing her to a stop beneath the portcullis. At once a mob of beggars filled the street beyond, ready to assail me the instant I was granted entry. Two men also emerged from the shacks behind me. One held a flimsy map in his hand, and the other was leading a rag-swaddled youth, whom he no doubt intended to pass off as a guide. Fearing Hala would make a meal of the boy, I waved these three away and fixed my attention on the guards before me. May I enter? State your name and business in Zental Keep, commanded the oldest. From behind him came the acrid smell of burning peat and the gentle murmur of a city at work. 
and show your coin so we'll know you can afford to pay your way. Now, any merchant who has visited as many cities as I have knows better than to show his money at the gate. If the guards are not thieves themselves, then they are certainly working with thieves, and even if they are honest, they are only trying to decide how much of a tariff to charge. I made no move to show him anything. Perhaps it would be better if you told me how much it costs to enter Zentel Keep, and I will decide whether or not I can pay. The guard studied my tattered abba and my magnificent mount, trying to decide whether I was a stealer of horses or the victim of highway robbers. His only interest in the matter was that he could charge the thief more than the victim. Hala snorted black vapor and eyed the two soldiers, and I prayed she realized how hard their chain mail would be on her teeth. At last, the oldest guard decided I looked more the victim than the thief. The tariff is a silver piece. A silver piece, I cried. Having accumulated a small coin reserve from Hala's victims, I could have afforded ten times the price. But my father had taught me the wisdom of making any venture profitable, and so I shook my head. I will be sleeping in the streets. I can give you this and nothing more. I reached into my abba for a copper, but Mistress Magic compelled my hand into the pocket where I kept my silver pieces, and it was one of these I flipped to the guard. He caught it and smiled in surprise. It was all I could do to stifle a cry of disappointment, as I felt certain he would have let me in for no more than three coppers. I nudged Hala forward. She took two steps, then came nose to blade with the crossed halberds and bared her sharp fangs. The guards raised their brows, but not their weapons. Now state your name and business, said the younger of the guards, and I could tell he enjoyed this part of his duty more than his fellow enjoyed collecting the tariff. We don't want no bad elements in Zentel Keep. My name is Mu— here, Mistress' accursed spell caused me to choke on the lie I had meant to utter. My name is Malik El Sami in Nasser, and all you need to know of my business is that it is a private affair involving a resident of your city. And then the harlot's spell also compelled me to add, Fazul Chembrel. I knew at once this was a terrible misfortune— the mapper and the hired guide retreated to their shacks, and the beggars vanished into alleys, leaving only a straw-haired crone and two old men to assail me. I cursed the harlot's magic for a pox, since I hardly wanted it known I had come to find Fazul Chembrel. Yet the oldest guard reacted calmly, lowering his halberd and motioning his companion to do the same. He stepped to my side. You'd be wiser not to mention the High Tyranar's name too loud. As he whispered this, Hala casually swung her head around as though to watch the man, and had he not been cautious enough to move his halberd between his shoulder and her teeth, he would surely have lost an arm. Fazul's on Lord Orgoth's short list for the block. I see. Hoping to make the best of a bad situation, I leaned down to ask, Can you tell me where to find his palace? Palace? In Zentel Keep? Then perhaps the temple of Iachtu Zim. I have come such a long way. You're one of the faithful? The guard raised his palm and blinked twice with both eyes, and I, being accustomed to buying goods from certain people who use secret symbols, discerned the signal at once. I repeated it myself and nodded, thinking myself safe from the harlot's magic as long as I resisted the urge to speak. But then my mouth opened of its own accord, and these words spilled out, I am faithful to our Lord Sirik, the one and all. A Syracist? The guard stepped away as though I were a leper. A stinking, filthy Syracist? Having been on the road for so many days, 
I was certainly all those things and more, yet I did not need to hear this from a lowly sentry. I kicked him in the chest and slapped the reins, and Hala sprang past the younger guard into Zentel Keep. Now, in any other city, the guards within the gatehouse would have launched a flurry of quarrels after us, but instead it was only a single stone that came sailing over my shoulder. Syric worshipper! cried someone behind me. I glanced back to see the young sentry and his older companion gathering more stones, and then a swarm of rotten turnips came sailing out of the gatehouse and landed wetly upon me. It would have been better if they had fired their crossbows, as then tears magic would have protected me, and I would not have been coated in rank-smelling slime. The gate guards launched their stones. Syric lover! Puzzled by the strange alarm the guards were raising, I turned forward and saw the beggars rushing from their alleys. They began to fling all manner of garbage at me, and they were joined in this by well-dressed citizens throwing stones and by masons hurling trowels of mortar. Someone in a high window even tossed out a full chamber pot, which shattered over Hala's head. This was too much for such a proud beast— she reared up and snorted black steam from her nostrils, then whirled on our attackers and began to strike them down with her hooves. There was nothing I could do except keep my fingers twined in her soiled mane and hold on. I felt Syric's heart grow angry in my breast, and soon my blood was slurping in my ears so loudly I could barely hear the insults of the crowd. Hala's flashing hooves sent a burly mason crashing through the wall he was repairing, and I pointed at his bleeding head. Fools! This is what awaits those who insult the one! Hala whirled on a silk-robed merchant and sank her teeth into his shoulder, then flicked her head and sent him sailing across the street. I traced his arc with my finger. Such is Syric's wrath! At last the crowd began to back away, leaving me a moment to look around. We were on a busy cobblestone boulevard lined by large official buildings of gloomy-looking stone. Many were swaddled in scaffolding and surrounded by piles of rock, as the masons were still laboring to repair the damage done the last time Zentel Keep insulted the one. At the far end of the avenue, which was no more than five blocks away, another gate hung open, revealing a half-constructed bridge arcing across the river Tesh to the strange rubble mound I had observed earlier. The tramp of running boots brought my respite to a quick end. I glanced back to see a host of black tabards rushing out of the gatehouse. Although Tyr's protection would shield me from their halberds and crossbows, it would do little to free me from their dungeon if I let them catch me. I urged my mount toward the river gate, and that is when the straw-haired crone leapt into Hala's path. She was one of the beggars who had not vanished into the alleys when I mentioned Fazul Chembrel's name. The crone raised her hands. Wait! Hala snorted black steam and reared up, and the beggar woman cringed and covered her head. Spare me if you love Syric. Hala's hooves came down beside the crone, and the crossbows clacked behind me. Two quarrels struck me full in the back, but became entangled in my filthy abba and caused me no harm. The crone's jaw fell. In the name of the one and all! Old woman, what do you want? I glanced over my shoulder and saw the guards less than ten paces away. I have no time. Then help me up. The crone raised her arm. You'll be safe in the temple. I grabbed her hand and pulled her up and spurred Hala into a gallop. Syric has a temple in this blasphemous city? Turn left. The crone pointed down a side alley, then added, There are those of us who know Zentel Keep deserved the raising. We are not popular, as you have seen— but Lord Orgoth fears the One's wrath and protects our temple. 
we galloped twenty paces down a squalid lane so narrow my legs scraped the walls on both sides. In the space of that distance, Hala leapt two sleeping beggars and bowled over another. Then the crone let go of my waist and pointed down another gloomy lane. Turn right! We skidded around the corner, galloped another dozen paces, and burst onto a boulevard even larger and more crowded than the one by which I had entered the city. Left, as I guided Hala around the corner, the mayor made a detour to a street vendor's cart and smashed his chicken cage and snatched up a crowing rooster, which she devoured feathers and all as we galloped down the avenue. Over my shoulder I asked, Can you help me find Fazul Chembrel? Of course, but you shouldn't have asked for him at the gate. He keeps spies there just as we do, and now he'll be watching for you. It couldn't be helped. I answered, and this was as true as anything I said that day. After no more than a hundred and fifty paces, the crone guided me down a short side street to the courtyard of a squat black building. Its condition was no better than most structures in Zentel Keep. It lacked much of its second story and roof, and the city's blasphemous residents had defiled its walls with all manner of profanities blaming Cyric for the raising. Given the sacrileges I had witnessed so far, the one had shown the city more mercy than it deserved. The crone slipped off Hala's back and began to pound on the copper doors of the temple. Friar Forno, this is Sister Svanhild. She motioned me forward. Open the doors and quickly. The one has sent us a savior. Chapter 35 In a place as vast as Faerun, many hundreds die each day, and so the seraph of death required but a short time to observe the final moments of a thousand and ten, as Lord Kelimvor had commanded. Now Avner stood in the crystal spire, recounting all he had seen. Lord Death sat slumped in his crystal throne, his face weary and dark as he listened to the report. In the swamp of Nether, Avner continued, a black dragon rose up beneath a punt in which Goodwin of Haywood was riding. The instant the worm opened its mouth, Goodwin drew his sword and leapt into its jaws. Kelimvor raised his sullen eyes. To what purpose? None. The punt was already sinking, and his companions were either drowned or swimming for safety. There was no question of saving the treasure, and Goodwin might well have saved himself by diving into the water. And perhaps one of his drowning companions as well? Yes. He was a good swimmer and lightly armored. The Seraph of Death paused a moment. Studying his god's stormy mood, then said, Goodwin's death was the thousand and tenth. Shall I go and observe more? Lord Death gave no answer, for there comes a moment when even the blindest fool perceives the mistake of his ways. Kelimvor saw that he had made a poor god of death, especially compared to Cyric, who knew in his infinite wisdom that humans are weak and selfish creatures who will always seek the easy way to do anything, except when they fear some incredible pain or anguish. On this account, the One had made his realm a place of bitter sorrows, to prevent the faithless and the false from seeing death as an escape from their harsh and vulgar lives, and also to prevent the faithful from turning their backs on their own gods. All this had Cyric done for the good of Faerun's mortals, like a stern father who loves his children well enough to give them a harsh upbringing. Kelimvor perceived these things at last, and he sat sulking for many long minutes. Like any jealous child, it angered him that his rival should be right when he was wrong. He kept thinking the matter over and over, until at last he convinced himself that his error was due to a laudable concern for Faerun's mortals, whereas Cyric's reign had been but the accident of a brutal and selfish nature. 
When he had finally convinced himself of his righteousness, the god of death fixed his gaze on Avner. You could watch ten thousand and ten deaths. It would change nothing. If worthy men do not fear dying, they will leave life to the unworthy, and all Faerun will suffer. The seraph of death's black wings sagged. But surely it is not wrong to be fair to the dead. It is not my place to be fair. Kelimvor shifted his gaze to the empty air beside Avner. Jurgle. The seneschal's shadow-filled cloak appeared at once, his yellow eyes glowing beneath the hood. I am here for you, as always. How may I serve? I have been remiss in my duties. Have you prepared the list of my judgments as god of death? In Jurgle's white gloves appeared a scroll as thick as a giant's waist. I have. Good. Kelimvor glanced at his seraph of death, then said, We will begin the difficult case of Avner of Hartwick. Had Avner been alive, his knees would have gone weak, and he would have felt sick to his stomach. As it was, he merely dropped a few shadowy feathers, and did his best to stand up straight, determined not to embarrass himself by falling to his knees or begging for mercy. If Kelimvor noted Avner's stoic acceptance of fate, he did not show it. Bring me the list. The god of death motioned Jurgle forward, then took the scroll and began to scan names. Now go and fetch the god of thieves, if he will stop gloating over Mistra's imprisonment long enough to see me. He will not have the choice. Jurgle did not turn toward the exit. He merely began to float toward it. Avner stepped aside and let the seneschal pass, catching a glimpse of himself in the perfect mirror on the wall. Instead of the mighty seraph of death, he saw a sandy-haired orphan of ten years, doing his best to hide his terror behind a mask of cynicism and cunning. The narrowed eyes and furrowed brow did less to make the boy look dangerous than lonely. Avner lost his poise and began to tremble. Kalimvor looked up from the scroll long enough to cock an eyebrow, then returned to his reading and left Avner to the horrors of his imagination. Jurgle appeared before Lord Death's throne. Mask is in the anteroom, awaiting your summons. How kind of him! Show him in. At once the Shadow Lord's wispy voice filled the judgment hall. I am under Tear's protection. A second jurgle appeared in the doorway, his disembodied white glove dragging along a tangle of writhing shadow. I warn you, Kalimvor. Mask stopped squirming long enough to assume the shape of a huge fearbulg. The warrior had both legs, but only one arm, and in his hand he held the magical Sheehan stolen from Prince Tang. The jewel-encrusted sword was barely as long as the fearbulg's forearm. If you want to share Mistra's cell— Kelimvor rolled his eyes. Helm has his hands full guarding Mistra. But I have not called you here to assault you, Mask. There is no need to put on airs. They mean nothing to me. To emphasize his point, Lord Death nodded toward the mirror. Mask's reflection was that of a little creature with a dog-like muzzle and a pair of goat's horns on its scaly head. This kobold had two faces and seemed even smaller and more spindly than most, for there was only one leg beneath its hips, and the huge shoe sword in its hand was longer than its body. Mask cried out and changed his shape to that of a burly minotaur, his reflection remained that of the kobold. The Shadow Lord began to shift forms faster than a mortal could blink, becoming a Bedain Sheik, a knight of Mithdranor, and a dozen other noble warriors. The image in the mirror always remained that of a pitiful little kobold with a sword bigger than he was. At last the God of Thieves gave up and simply assumed the kobold's form— then allowed Jurgle to drag him toward Lord Death's throne. Is that what you brought me here to show me? Not at all, 
Kelimvor replied. I asked you here because I have been reconsidering the case of Avner of Hartsvale. Mask glanced at the Seraph of Death, seeming to notice him for the first time. Reconsidering? Perhaps I was mistaken in refusing to return him. Mistaken? Mask's tone grew angry. In his arrogance, the god of thieves believed that Mistra's imprisonment had caused Kelimvor to fear him. He puffed his figure into that of a burly dwarf, then raised his nose and dared to place his foot on the crystal step beneath Kelimvor's throne. It is too late to beg my forgiveness. I am not begging anything, especially from a craven little god such as you. What I am doing is offering to give Avner's spirit over to your care. My care? To hide his surprise, the god of thieves scratched his scruffy chin and turned away. He began to look the seraph up and down, as any man might before purchasing a camel, but the Shadow Lord was not trying to drive the price down. He was only buying time to think. If Kelimvor started acting like a proper god of death, the verdict at the trial just might go in his favor, and then Mask would have yet another powerful enemy. The Seraph of Death stood as straight as a rod and glared down at the Shadow Lord's spindly silhouette. True, he had once worshipped the God of Thieves, but he had also answered the high call of duty and not flinched. Nothing Mask could do would change what Avner had become in that moment. At length, the Shadow Lord twisted his kobold's snout into a snaggle-toothed smile, then turned to face the God of Death. You expect me to take him back, after you have ruined him? I do not expect anything. I only ask if you want him. Mask shook his head. Not now. Not until he proves himself worthy. Proves himself? Kelimvor leaned forward. How? The Shadow Lord tipped his snout up and scratched his chin. Let me think. Something will come to me, I am sure. He made a great show of studying the ceiling. I have it. Something you will appreciate more than I. He can free Mistra. No one can do that, Kelimvor objected, not with Helm guarding her. Ah, well, I thought you might say that. Mask shrugged. Too bad. If he succeeded... I was going to make him my seraph of thieves. As it is, I suppose you will have to change him into a rat and send him into the maze of alleys. The Shadow Lord shook his head as though disappointed, but when he turned to leave, his shadowy muzzle was grinning. I can do it. Mask stopped on the spot, then whirled around and pointed his kobold's snout at Avner. What did you say? I can do it. Allow me to borrow a few things from this chamber, and I will free Mistra. Take anything you like, Avner. Now it was Kelimvor's turn to smile. When you have succeeded, I am certain the Shadow Lord will keep his word. Will you not, Mask? Mask's first thought was that Lord Death had tricked him. But how could the god of death have known he would insist on testing the seraph, much less foreseen the nature of the test? The answer was that he could not have. Avner's boast was nothing but the desperate attempt of a condemned spirit to escape his fate. Mask twisted his kobold's muzzle into a confident smirk, then looked up at the seraph. Agreed. If you can free Mistra— then you are a better thief than I. Chapter 36 Time has no meaning for the dead, so when Adon found himself standing on the blinding expanse of the Fugue Plain, it was with no idea how long it had taken to get there. He recalled striking his head on the fountain and opening his mouth to scream, and then a great tidal wave had rushed down his throat to fill his lungs. 
His spirit left his body with less effort than it takes a man to slip from his robes. The cold waters swept him away, and Mistress' face appeared on the surface, blurry and rippling in the current, once again the beautiful goddess of his memory. Then Mistra asked him to speak her name. The hatred returned to her eyes, and the anger rose again in her voice. Adon cried out and sank into the depths of a black, cold ocean, and the goddess's image shattered above him and vanished. After that, his journey became at once endless and ephemeral. A swirling light appeared in the darkness ahead, and he swam in its direction until the waters thickened into a sea of slurping, sucking ooze. The swirling light became a distant glow, and he burrowed toward it until the mud hardened into a granite plateau. The distant glow became a radiance shining on the horizon, and he stumbled after it until his march became a numb and mindless trek. Then the radiance became a boundless white expanse, and the patriarch found himself standing upon the fugue plain with no certain memory of how he had come there. The ground quivered beneath his feet like something alive and restless, and the air buzzed with the drone of a million voices, and all around him the spirits of the dead beseeched their gods to come and rescue them from this empty wasteland. Nearby a matron cried, O oh, Chantia, great mother, golden goddess of grain, merciful giver of life, answer this, the call of your faithful servant Gusta, who has borne fifteen children and planted a bountiful field each spring and prayed to you every day of her life. I beg you, take me into your garden. A shaft of golden light split the sky, and over Gusta's head appeared a winged herald bearing a yellow cornstalk. The harbinger lowered her stalk, and a flaxen beam shone down to engulf Chantia's beseecher. At once, the cares and concerns of Gusta's life melted away, and her spirit grew so light that it floated up the flaxen beam into the herald's arms. A short distance ahead, the spirits of a hundred warlocks and sorceresses had gathered into a great throng, all facing the same direction and staring at the sky. A low murmur rose on the far side and raced toward Adon and broke over him with all the force of a wave upon the ocean. Mistra! So loud was the cry that the patriarch grimaced at its volume. He could imagine it crossing the heavens and reaching Mistra's ears in her palace of shimmering magic. O oh, Mistra, lady of mysteries, guardian of the weave, answer this, the call of your faithful worshippers. A hundred voices spoke at once, yet their words were clear. When will you deliver us, we who have spent our lives studying your wonder, spreading the glory of your magic to every corner of the land? Hear the appeal of your worshippers, Lady Magic. Look! Here is Mandra the Mighty, who changed the Sea of Petark to wine, and here is Darshan the Dread, who filled the chasm of Narfel with diamonds, and here is Baldemar the Brilliant, who— The prayer droned on, proclaiming the loyalty of Mistress Faithful and the feats of each, and before five wonder-workers had been named— the patriarch saw the heralds of a dozen other gods appear and retrieve their worshippers. Of all the deities of Faerun, only Lady Magic seemed content to ignore the pleading of her worshippers, to leave them gathered upon the fugue plain like a lost herd of cattle. A dawn ran over to the crowd. Stop it! He pushed his way to the center. Mistra won't come! She cares nothing for us. The throng fell silent, and all eyes turned to stare at him. Forgive me. Adon turned in a slow circle. Mistra deceived me, and so I have deceived you. An enchantress as beautiful as any woman on Faerun stepped close and looked the patriarch up and down, then shook her head in sadness and turned away. It is nothing she said. 
Only poor Adon. Adon grabbed the woman's arm. I have seen Mistress True Face. She is an evil hag. If she cared for us, why hasn't she sent a herald for us? She will, answered another spirit, this one a tall, black-bearded wizard. We must believe she will. Why? Adon cried. Don't you see she has deceived us? Poor Adon. The enchantress reached up and touched his cheek. Poor mad Adon. Adon pushed the enchantress's hand away. Listen to me. Mistress' eyes burn with hatred. Her mouth is filled with poison and fangs. Enough! The black-bearded wizard slammed a palm into Adon's chest, knocking him to the ground. If we listen to the patriarch's madness, we will suffer his fate. He is faithless. Faithless! gasped Adon. We must leave him. The enchantress backed away, forcing the other spirits behind her to do the same. His madness will destroy us all. As one, the throng drifted away, leaving Adon alone on the fugue plain. He watched them go, and when they were so far away he could no longer hear their prayers, he rolled onto his knees. He clasped his hands before his chest and looked toward the heavens. O oh, Kelimvor, Lord of the dead and judge of the damned, heed this, the call of your dear friend Adon. Chapter 37 The believers of Zentil Keep were the strangest group of faithful anywhere on Faerun. All seventeen lived in the same hall of cold stone, and slept in the same crib of straw, and washed themselves in the same baths, and ate from the same wooden basin, and shared among themselves everything they owned, without rancor or enmity of any sort. They said they did this on account of the many privations of their city, and especially of their temple, but any fool could see they liked matters as they were. As we sat on the barren floor passing the gruel bowl from hand to hand, they did not own a single spoon. There was much joking and laughing and warm touching, and no one ever complained when he emptied his bowl and had to go refill it from the kettle. Svanhild was standing by the fire, describing my entrance into the city. And Malik said, I am faithful to our Lord Sirik, the one and all. He didn't care whether the guard or anyone else knew he was a believer. Svanhild no longer looked the crone, having washed her grime off in the temple baths. She had done the same for me. As I said, the believers of Zentil Keep share everything, and supplied us with the same flaxen robes worn by everyone in the temple. Hers fit just tightly enough to prove she was no more than half the age I had thought at the gate, but of course I had already seen this in the baths. He kicked the guard aside. Svanhild pulled up her robe and raised a well-shaped leg to demonstrate, and rode into Zentil Keep as proud as Lord Orgoth himself. Then, when the believers' shower started, Hala reared and began cracking heads, and Malik yelled, this is what awaits those who insult the one. Svanhild pointed her finger at the floor and spoke in a voice deeper than my own, which drew many loud guffaws from her fellows. They were not laughing at me, but at the blasphemers whose skulls had been split by Hala's hooves. Such is the wrath of Sirik, he yelled, and the guards fired their crossbows. Now Svanhild fixed her gaze on me, and I have never seen such devotion in the eyes of a woman. The bolts didn't even scratch him. You should have seen the guards' faces. I felt the heat rise to my cheeks, for Svanhild had already hinted she wished to attend me after dinner. In truth, her advances had been so bold they filled the heart in my breast with a sense of godly dew, and it was a wonder I had not enjoyed her already— especially after so many seasons away from my wife. Yet what were women to me when the true life was at hand? 
I could think of nothing but stealing the book and curing the one's madness, and of saving myself from the city of the dead, and of the great reward Sirik would bestow on me after he won his trial. Of course, I also thought of the four short days left to do all this, and of the difficulty of finding Fazul Chembrel in a city as strange as Zentil Keep, and of the chance that he no longer had the true life of Sirik. But most of all, I thought of the terrible consequences for the one's church if any part of my plan failed, and it was on account of this that I felt little interest in eating the temple's gruel or sleeping in its crib of straw, and certainly not in sporting with its women. Malik? Svanhild shook my shoulder. I had been so lost in my thoughts I had not noticed her leave the fireplace. Friar Fourneau asked what spell you used. Spell? I shook my head clear, then looked across the circle to Fourneau Black Sun. The friar, as they called him, was a snake-eyed man of fifty, as gaunt as his acolytes, and far too ready with that lizard's grin of his. On his index finger he wore an iron starburst and skull signet. I know no spells. Fourneau creased his slender brow, and somehow that smile remained upon his thin lips. You're not a cleric? No, I am the finder of the book. I had told Svanhild about finding the Serenishad as she scrubbed my back. As there had been several other people in the bath, these events were already known throughout the temple. I have never needed magic to serve the one and all. Forno's smile drooped at the corners. So I have heard, but the great annihilator's spells are more powerful than my own. The friar and his acolytes called Fuzul Chembrel the Great Annihilator, as he was the one who had read the True Life on the morning of the raising and ruined Zentil Keep's faith in Sirik. You will forgive me for finding it strange that the one would send someone with no magic to punish our enemy. The heart in my breast grew cold and spiteful and I was seized by the urge to pull my dagger and strike this fool dead. I resisted this temptation, and not only because I feared his acolytes would never let me reach him. According to Svanhild, Forno Blackson was the only person in the room who knew where to find Fazul Chembrel, and he had not yet parted with this knowledge. I forced myself to return the friar's smile, and tried to conceal my anger. I only asked you to help me find Fazul Chembrel. I picked my next words carefully, on account of Mistress Truth Spell. I did not say the one sent me, or that I came to punish Fazul. Forno's eyes flashed with anger, but his smile remained intact. But you did not say otherwise. Perhaps you should tell us what you do want with the Great Annihilator. Knowing I could not lie, and that neither Forno nor his acolytes were likely to approve of my plan to cure the one, I clenched my jaw and said nothing. But neither did I look away, for the cold anger in my breast was making me bolder than I should have been. The lizard's grin vanished from the friar's face. I am not comfortable helping just anyone find the great annihilator. In any other temple of true believers, such an explanation from the high priest would have been an unthinkable sign of weakness. In Zentil Keep, it seemed as natural as the bricked-over windows. A foolish attack is sure to bring swift retribution, and Lord Orgoth would simply stand by and watch. Nothing would please him more than to be rid of our temple without risk to himself— as only fear of the one's wrath makes him tolerate our presence. Svanhild was quick to leap to my defense. Malik is hardly some bumbling neophyte. He has touched the Serenishad, and he has spoken face to face with the one. Or so he says. Forno's eyes grew as dangerous as a cobra's, and he did not take his gaze off me. But we have only his word. How do we know that he isn't exaggerating? 
It was a strange temple indeed where Cyric's faithful hesitated to call each other liars. Svanhild thought for only a moment, then answered, We know by what I saw at the gate. Crossbow quarrels do not bounce off the backs of normal men. And we also know because of Hala, added another sister of the temple, a raven-haired beauty called Thur. She pointed to the far corner, where my magnificent horse was devouring the temple's only milk goat. How many horses eat flesh and exhale black fog? That is a good point, replied a sister named Oda, and then a brother called Durin added, I believe him. This occasioned a general course of head-nodding and agreement. As I looked around the circle, I saw that all the sisters of the temple— and several of the brothers were looking at me with the same expression of yearning I had already noticed in Svanhild's eyes. No doubt this adoration had more to do with the god's heart in my chest than seeing my stout figure in the baths. At least, in the case of the men, I hoped so. Fourneau's expression flashed from shock to outrage to cunning, then settled on benign acceptance— this countenance looked as false on his face as a mask of brutish ferocity would have appeared on mine. Well, then, it seems the matter is settled. The friar clasped his hands together and rose. Why don't I get a little surprise I've been saving? Then we'll sit by the fire and plan our vengeance on the great annihilator. Svanhild frowned. Surprise? You'll see. Forno replied, Wash out the chalice, and I'll be right back. Forno lit a torch from the fireplace, then crossed the barren hall and disappeared into a dark stairwell. Though clearly troubled by the friar's offer, Svanhild took the chalice off the fireplace mantle and went up to wash it out in the roof cistern. As soon as they were gone, Thur came to sit at my side. She slipped her arm beneath mine, brushing the hilt of my dagger beneath my robe, and nestled up close. She brought her lips near to whisper in my ear. Before she had a chance to embarrass herself, I patted her hand. Forgive me, Thur, but Svanhild has already asked to attend me later. Here, the harlot's accursed magic compelled me to add— and even with her I fear I am too consumed with Fazul Chembril to enjoy any sport, besides which I am only recently widowed. Thur frowned at this. Widowed? What does that have to do with anything? Then she leaned a little away from me. Oh, look, I know you're one of the chosen, but that's not what I— Forno's steps rang out from the stairway, and Thur fell silent. She continued to hold my arm, but I could tell she was reluctant to make the friar jealous, as she no longer pressed herself quite so tightly to my side. Svanhild returned from the cistern an instant later. She showed no irritation at seeing another woman sitting so close to me— but only came over and sat on my other side, and pressed herself as close as Thur. What a pity my thoughts were so consumed with Fizul Chembril! The friar stepped into the middle of the circle and displayed his prize, a dusty bottle of scarlet liquor. I noticed at once that he had exchanged his signet ring for another, as no merchant with an eye as keen as mine would mistake tarnished silver for cold iron. The finest Mullmaster port money can buy, Forno proclaimed, or should I say that a quick hand can steal? This drew nervous laughter from the acolytes, who seemed equally split between avoiding my gaze and casting furtive glances in my direction. Perhaps they thought I was selfish not to send either Thur or Svanhild away, or perhaps they knew something about the friar's relationship with Thur I did not. Forno came over and made a great show of uncorking the bottle, then reached down to Svanhild. The chalice, my dear. Svanhild glanced at me. Sister Svanhild, hand it to me. Her hand was trembling. 
she cast her eyes down, as if she might be jealous of Thur after all, then passed the chalice to Fourneau. As he filled it, I leaned closer to Svanhild. "'You have nothing to worry about,' I whispered. Svanhild looked up with surprise in her eyes. "'No?' Forno drank from the chalice and made a great show of swishing the port around in his mouth. "'I have already told Thur,' I whispered. "'I am too consumed with my mission for any sport tonight.' Svanhild wrinkled her brow, betraying her disappointment, and she hissed, "'But, Malik!' The friar smacked his lips and pronounced, "'A fine bottle!' He refilled the chalice quickly, then swirled the contents around and passed it to me. Svanhild intercepted the cup. "'Svanhild!' the friar said. "'Don't you think we should let Sirik's chosen drink first? Svanhild looked from me to her fellow acolytes. They all averted their eyes at her shameful behavior, yet she did not release the chalice. A bitter coldness began to fill my breast at this strange affront, for I had not tasted a drop of port, fine or otherwise, since leaving Kalimshan. Thur reached across my chest to take Svanhild's hands. Let him drink. She took the cup and passed it to me, and I saw that her hands were trembling just like Svanhild's. What harm can a little port cause someone as mighty as Malik? Now, had I not already raised the chalice to my lips, I might have thought twice about drinking. But as it was, the port was already upon my tongue and halfway down my gullet before I realized what her words implied. Even then I doubted them, for the port did not bear the slightest hint of bitter taste or mordant smell. Indeed, I was not certain the friar had poisoned the drink until my stomach grew strangely full and the soft mass in my chest began to gurgle and race. I swallowed about half the contents of the chalice, then lowered the cup. The friar's eyes were already as wide as saucers, and his color had gone from pale to ghostly. A fine port indeed, Forno. My ears were filled with such a gurgling I could barely hear my own words, and my stomach felt as swollen as a woman's before she gives birth. Yet I could see by the friar's reaction I should have been dead before I lowered the cup. Now, will you tell me where I can find Fazul Chembril? Or would you like to finish what's left of the port? I stood and thrust the chalice back into the friar's hands. He stared into the cup, trying to decide if his poison had failed, or if I was as great as Svanhild claimed. My head began to pound. A terrible coldness seeped from Sirik's gurgling heart into my breast, and this had nothing to do with the poison. "'Your decision?' I demanded. The chalice slipped from Forneau's hand and clanged to the floor, spilling red port across the stones. He dropped to his knees and kissed the hem of my robe. "'I was only trying to honor our lord of murder!' He was referring, of course, to the venerable act of killing an unsuspecting guest. "'I didn't know you were chosen!' I did not say I was. I could barely hear him over the gurgling in my ears. "'Now, where will I find Fazul Chembril?' His gaze followed my hand as it slipped beneath my robe and withdrew the shining blade of my dagger. Don't, he pleaded. I'll take you there myself. I shook my head, for I knew I was not strong enough to resist the cold yearning in my breast. Tell me, or I will kill you now and let the one punish your silence in the next life. This threat was too much for Forneau. His old tower. My spies tell me that is where he worships Yachtu Zim. I looked up and saw the eyes of the acolytes shining in eagerness, for the murder of a master venerates the one even more than the killing of a guest. Svanhild showed her approval by nodding excitedly. I can find the tower, she said. It's in the ruins. I glanced around the barren hall 
for I had thought we were in the ruins, then raised my dagger high. Forno closed his eyes, knowing he could not resist the chosen of the one. The viscid mass in my chest squeezed slush through my veins, and I stepped forward to take my vengeance. Then I imagined Forno's spirit down on the fugue plain with my wife, calling for our dark lord, and I knew by the cold lump in my chest that Cyric would never answer him. The poisoning had become a great sacrilege, distressing the one's heart as it had, and this could not be forgiven. The friar would be hauled before Kelimvor and found to be ignoble as well as false, and then he would be sentenced to an eternity of torment. My arm would not come down to strike the infidel. I clenched my teeth and tried harder, and all that happened was that my hand began to tremble. How could I be so weak? It was a terrible impiety to leave Fourneau's treachery unavenged, yet I could not strike, not even when I called upon Cyric's heart for strength. I cursed the harlot's spell, but I knew I alone was at fault. I was so afraid of Kelimvor's tortures that I could not send another to face them. Even now it shames me to admit such cowardice. I stood holding the blade aloft so long that all the eager faces turned to looks of puzzlement, and Forno opened his eyes to gaze up at me piteously. Svanhild frowned and stepped away from my side. Well, Malik, will you kill him or not? I tried again to bring the dagger down, but I was too weak, especially with my victim staring up into my eyes. I shook my head. No. A startled gasp rose from the acolytes. I saw the yearning vanish from Svanhild's face. Then Thur grasped my arm. Of course not. Malik has no need to prove his faith. Thur took the dagger from my hand. We're the ones who must prove ours. Chapter 38 The Caliph has a saying, If it is not cruel, it is not punishment. In service of this motto, his jailers have devised many implements of ingenious and splendid design— they have constructed machines that can bend the victim backward until his head touches his heels, and have forged little tools that can keep him laughing until he ruins his voice, and have built one hideous device that tightens around the prisoner's chest each time he exhales. Yet the caliph would have traded all these treasures for the simple prison in which Helm confined Mistra, which was more brutal than all the racks and hooks in Kalimshan. The goddess sat on a bed of soft emptiness, cursing Tyr for a fate she alone had caused. So cramped was her prison that she could not lift her head without thrusting it into the cold void of the ceiling, nor lie straight without touching the unbreachable nil of the walls. Yet her agony was not physical, for the bodies of the gods can endure any torment with less pain than a mortal feels in bright sun. What troubled Mistra was a dawn. Her patriarch was down on the fugue plain, crying out in madness and confusion, his voice so full of anguish it muffled the pleas of all her other faithful. O oh, Kelimvor, lord of the dead and judge of the damned, heed the call of your dead friend Adon. Take mercy on my soul and on all the poor souls who have ever worshipped Mistra, the goddess of lies. She is filled with hate and envy, and she deceives all who worship her. She has left us to rot, and I beseech you, the fair Lord, the kind and merciful Lord, to take pity on our wretched souls and give us shelter in the city of the dead." Mistra wailed in agony, for no torture could hurt more than this. She had heard Adon's treaties a thousand times, and each time she had tried to answer but failed. Helm's prisons existed outside time and space. Any deity trapped inside was cut off from all godly powers. That Lady Magic could hear the worshippers' voices was but a courtesy of her jailer, 
given in acknowledgment that the charges against her remained unproved. Mistra could have asked for silence, but she did not, for she believed Kelimvor would try to free her and wanted to be ready when the time came to escape. Adon's plea to Kelimvor droned on for the thousand and tenth time. Mistra let out a great sob and swore that when she escaped, the first thing she would do was comfort her patriarch. Then she steeled herself to hear the prayer again. But Adon's voice fell silent. Mistra's first thought was that he had lost all hope, and she ached to send a harbinger down to comfort him. Then she realized that Kelimvor would have heard Adon's pleas as clearly as she had. Surely Lord Death had sent one of his own escorts to answer the patriarch's appeal. No sooner had Mistra consoled herself than an avalanche of prayers filled the hush left by Adon's silence. Of mysteries, why have you deserted me? Mother of magic, I am alone and without guidance. Answer me! Answer my prayers! Answer! These prayers came not only from her most devoted clerics, but from ordinary spellcasters as well. The desperation in their voices stunned the goddess. Even with her locked in Helm's prison, the weave remained, and any devoted student of magic could still tap it. Frightened to use my magic! My light spell blinded half the town! How have I— The sphere melted the king's favorite. Talus! The name flashed into Mistra's thoughts like a lightning bolt. Three years ago, she had started to scale back the magic of devastation. The destroyer had retaliated by beginning a quiet campaign to subvert her worshippers, secretly allowing the most destructive of them to use him as a conduit to the weave. Seeing that it was easier to control a plot she knew about than one of which she remained ignorant, the goddess of magic had feigned ignorance and allowed Talus to continue. It did not surprise Mistra to learn that the destroyer had seized the opportunity of her imprisonment to further his plot, but she did not realize the extent of his success until she heard the prayer of the harper witch Ruha. "'Sorry for my mistake, goddess. But if you cannot forgive me, why do you allow Talus to steal your worshippers? I refused his offer, for I did not enjoy being a scourge to the land, even when I thought it was your will. But many others have not done the same. During the flight from Vunlar to Yulash, I had to avoid five savage whirlwinds, and one time the smoke from the burning forest grew so thick. Mistra rolled onto her hands and knees. Helm! The god of guardians made no response. Like any jailer, he was accustomed to much yelling and screaming from his charges, and he knew the wisdom of ignoring it. Helm, you must know what Talus is doing. You cannot allow it to continue. Still there came no response. He is stealing the weave. It is your duty to let me out. Helm stuck his head through the wall of nothingness. His visor remained down as always, and so he resembled a closed helmet hanging on a dark wall. How dare you presume to tell me my duty? My duty is to keep you here. If you had been doing yours, Talus would not have stolen so many of your worshippers. Even Ogma says that. So many? How many? The god of guardians shook his helmet. I dare not guess. But many centuries hence, I am sure this will still be known as the month of disasters. Helm, listen to me. Mistra clasped her hands before her. You must let me out. I cannot. It is my duty to keep you here. You are the god of guardians. Have you no duty to guard Faerun? Like any harlot, Mistra knew just the words to make a man doubt himself. In the time of troubles, you were the one who kept the gods out of the heavens. Much of what they destroyed has never been repaired. Will you let Talus demolish the rest? Helm fell silent, though his visor hid what he was thinking. 
I am the only one who can stop Talus, Mistress said. You know that. No, you are the one who neglected her duty, and you are the one who violated her promise to Tyr. If Faerun suffers for that, it is on your head, not mine. With that, the God of Guardians withdrew, leaving Mistra to the pleas of her faithful and her bed of emptiness. Chapter 39 In the burning gallery in the crystal spire, four of Kelimvor's avatars sat in four identical thrones, staring out over four endless lines of terrified spirits summoned from all reaches of the City of the Dead. The souls coughed and choked in the black acrid fumes that swirled off the walls of smoldering coal, and many of them murmured in soft tones, wondering why they had been called into this place of smoke and darkness. And when they reached the head of the line and learned the answer, some would cry out in delight, and others would wail in despair, and they would fling themselves at Lord Death's feet and kiss his toes or clutch his legs, but he paid no heed to any of them. The souls would vanish and reappear in their new home, and Jurgle would call the next forward and read his history, and Kelimvor would pronounce a new judgment, and the spirit would wail or rejoice and fling himself at Kelimvor's feet, and so the re-evaluation continued hour after hour, day after day. In the Hall of Judgment, where the crystal ceiling had turned as brown and smoky as topaz, two more Kelimvors sat passing judgment on all the souls recently arrived in his realm. As these spirits heard their sentences, no laughing or wailing ensued, but only stunned gasps and long, sorry silences. Out in the city, three more avatars reshaped the many districts and boroughs into ghettos better suited to the realm of the dead. Kelimvor blew a great breath over Pax Cloister, and the shadowy valleys and wooded mountains became a desolate land of howling dust and barren peaks. In the same moment, Lord Death let out a tremendous bellow in the singing city, and the whole quarter fell as silent as a tomb. He waded into the acid swamp and seeded the quagmire with handfuls of pebbles, which swelled into stone islands where the charlatans and swindlers might find refuge from their soggy existences. No longer would Lord Death's judgments be decrees of eternal bliss or unending agony. Now the dead would make of their lot what they could, just as they had in life, except that they would dwell only with others like themselves, which was certainly enough to make any mortal stay faithful to his god. The last avatar stood at the city gate, rubbing the portal's alabaster face with his bare hand. Wherever his palm touched, the stone shimmered like quicksilver and hardened into a mirror like the one in his judgment hall, so perfect that it revealed the flaws of any onlooker. Now, as the false and faithless approached Kelimvor's city, they would see themselves from many paces away and have time to contemplate the flaws that had brought them to the city of the dead. It was to this avatar that Jurgle brought the spirit of Adon, Mistress Patriarch. I have the one you requested, Lord Death. Before the god of death could look away from his work, a voice screeched, Kelimvor! Two spindly arms wrapped themselves around his knees. You have answered my prayer. Lord Death turned and plucked up Adon's wretched figure. The patriarch stood only a quarter as tall as Kelimvor, and he looked as demented as any lunatic. His cheeks were as hollow as bowls, and his hair whisked into a tangled mess, and no bruise has ever been as purple as the circles beneath his eyes. Kelimvor sighed at the spectacle. Adon, what shall I do with you? What you do with me doesn't matter. The patriarch pointed across the white vastness of the fugue plain. It is the rest of Mistra's worshippers you must save. 
They are out there praying, and she won't come. She cannot answer her worshippers. Kelimvor made no effort to explain further, for he knew Adon's mind had been touched by Sirek, and that mere words could not undo the cunning of the One. And it is not my place to aid the faithful of another god. I sent for you only because your prayers have made you one of the faithless, perhaps even one of the false, as you have tried to subvert the worship of Mistra. Before naming your punishment, I shall have to decide which one you are. Adon gasped. Punishment? This is the city of the dead, where the false and the faithless pay the cost of their shiftless lives. You would not be here if you were not to be punished. But Mistra is a fiend! Adon staggered back, then stopped when Jurgle's disembodied gloves caught his arms. The patriarch paid his captor no attention. I have seen her true face. She cares nothing for her worshippers. Even if that were true, it would make no difference to me. There was a catch in Kelimvor's voice, and he avoided Adon's gaze. As long as they remain faithful to her, I cannot touch them. You, on the other hand, have placed yourself entirely in my hands, and you must suffer for it. Adon's haggard expression changed from bewilderment to anger. But you promised to be fair and just. You promised you would not torture the damned. Kelimvor glared down, his eyes burning red. Neither your madness nor our past friendship gives you leave to speak to me as you have, and this is the last time I will warn you. As for my promises, I decide what is just, and there is no need for me to torture the damned. They shall do that themselves. Adon's jaw fell. What happened to you? His shoulders slumped, then his face curled into a mask of lunacy. I should have known. You always were Mistra's. That is enough. Kelimvor underscored his command with enough force to drive Adon to his knees. I have warned you. Kelimvor was interrupted by a thunderous peal of laughter. Your warnings mean nothing to a dawn, throne thief. A huge, crimson-tinged skull appeared in the air. In fact, I demand to know where you are taking him. A dawn is one of my faithful. The patriarch's eyes grew wide with horror, and beneath the one's head appeared a skeleton covered here and there by pieces of armor and patches of leathery hide. The avatar stood half again Kelimvor's height, though, of course, size means nothing at all to the gods. Adon, is Sirik's claim true? Kelimvor asked. Have you ever prayed to him? Never. Sirik smiled patiently and shook his skull. Tisk, tisk, Adon. You must not lie. Only I can save you now. Adon scurried to Kelimvor's side, dragging Jurgle's shadow-filled cloak behind him. Sirik reached down to take them both, but Lord Death lashed out and caught the one by the wrist. Then Kelimvor dared to lock eyes and grow just as large as the one and all, and Jurgle pushed Adon through the city gates without bothering to open them. Give him back, Kelimvor, hissed Sirik. Call him out now, or I will see you locked in Helm's prison with your whore. You have no claim on Adon, Kelimvor replied evenly. If you did, he would have called you instead of me. Adon is mad, Sirik exploded. That makes him mine. That makes him your victim, not your worshipper. Tyr will see the difference if you care to call him. Sirik jerked free and stepped back. From the wrist down, his hand remained in Kelimvor's grasp, but such things are of no consequence to the gods. The one shook his stump in Lord Death's face. You cannot cheat me out of my prize, Kelimvor. He is my proof. Proof? 
Kalimvor discarded Sirik's severed hand as though it were nothing but trash. Proof of what? Of my guilt! The one's hand dragged itself toward its master, the bony fingers rising and falling like spider legs. The charge against me is innocence by insanity. I am no innocent. Could an innocent steal Mistress Patriarch? Kalimvor shook his head. You stole nothing except his life. Adon's prayer makes him false and faithless to Mistra, not faithful to you. He grew just tall enough to look down upon the one. Adon is mine now, and so is this realm. Sirik extended his stump, and in the next instant his severed hand flew to Lord Death's throat and clung there like a fiend. You have not heard the last of this. Tear is on my side. Then get him. Kalimvor pulled the one's hand from his throat, tearing out his own larynx in the process, and thrust this whole mess at Sirik. Until you do, leave me alone. I have much to do before the trial. The wound in Kalimvor's throat healed as he spoke. He turned his back on the one, returning to his work on the perfect mirror, and watched Sirik's reflection vanish in a burst of black steam. Jurgle returned at once, dragging Adon's astonished spirit with him. I await your command, Lord Death. Kelimvor stared across the empty plain. I wonder, will Sirik return? The shoulders of Jurgle's empty cloak rose and fell. It hardly matters. You were well within your rights. All the same, Lord Death, said Adon, I thank you for not turning me over to him. Kalimvor glanced down at the patriarch. Do not thank me until you have heard your sentence. He turned his gaze upon the yellow eyes floating beneath the hood of Jurgle's cloak. Take him to the crystal spire and put him at the end of the line. See that he stays there. Jurgle's eyes flashed gold, then he bowed. As you command. With that the Seneschal split into two avatars. One pushed Adon into the City of the Dead, this time opening the gate first, and the other remained behind with Kelimvor. If I may have your permission to suggest it, said the Seneschal, I believe there is a solution to your quandary, one well within all these rules you have made for yourself. Kelimvor cocked an eyebrow. I am listening. Let Adon see Mistra through your eyes. Your perceptions should be powerful enough to counter those of Sirik. Kelimvor sighed. I wish it were that easy, Jurgle. But love is not the same as worship. Adon must see Mistra as a goddess. And to me, she is still as human as I am. Chapter 40 Hala kneeled in the alley behind us, gnawing on a thigh bone and making a dreadful noise. Fortunately, most passerby only gave a start and scurried past without looking down the murky lane. But once, three burly guardsmen had stepped into the shadows to see what was causing such an awful snarling, and Svanhild and the other acolytes had been quick to guarantee that they would cause us no trouble. Why Hala could not have stayed at the temple and finished her meal there was a mystery to me. After the friar's death, I had demanded that we leave immediately to find Fazul Chembril, and the acolytes had led me to a secret tunnel. Hala had insisted on following, crawling through the cramped passage on her knees and hocks, and dragging along Forno's entire leg. Her companionship had forced us to traverse the length of the city through alleys and byways. Even in Zentel Keep, flesh-eating horses were a rarity, and we had no wish to alert Fazul's spies to our approach. And now I stood watching the South Force Gate, wondering how we were going to sneak a blood-smeared mare past the sentries. What are you waiting for? 
though the question came from behind me, I knew at once who had asked it. The alley had suddenly gone cold, and it smelled of death, and a thousand voices filled my ears. I spun on my heel and found myself facing a bloody wraith in black leather armor. Sirik's bare jaws worked back and forth, grinding his teeth together and filling the alley with a terrible growl, and in the bony sockets beneath his brow the black orbs of his hallowed eyes burned darker than ever. If he noticed the sixteen stunned acolytes kneeling behind him, he did not show it. Hala herself seemed unimpressed. She continued to gnaw on her bone and paid him no heed. Sirik raised three finger bones. Three days to trial. I did not answer, fearing the harlot's spell would force me to say something unwise, such as the truth. A thousand pardons, most honored God, but I cannot do as you ask, because I am busy doing what you require. I am seeking a way to cure your madness. Sirik laid a skeletal hand on my shoulder. Good news, Malik. I tricked Mistra into attacking Mask, and now she is locked in Helm's prison. Truly, it was a testament to the one's cunning that all the other gods believed this a result of the harlot's own folly. She will trouble us no more, but I need the Serenishad more than ever. At mention of the hallowed book, Svanhild and several other acolytes raised their heads. The one squeezed my shoulder so tightly my clavicle ached, then continued, That pus-drinker Kellumvor stole my evidence. Evidence? Adon's soul. I took him from Mistra. The harlot's patriarch prays to you? I was very excited, as I knew nothing at that time about the one's efforts to subvert Adon. How wonderful! He does not pray to anyone. The one released my shoulder, then looked down the street. A stream of filthy masons and day-workers were pouring through the gate, returning across the force bridge to pass the night in the safety of Zentil Keep. That is my point. I drove him mad, and he disavowed Mistra, and now he never prays. If that does not make him mine, what does? I don't know. I had let this slip before I realized I did know, and, of course, the harlot's magic compelled me to say more than was wise. I don't know why you think driving him mad makes him yours. If he prays to no god, then he is faithless and belongs to Kelimvor. In the next instant I flew into the wall behind me and dislodged a dozen blocks and brought them crashing down on my head. Without Tyr's protection, I would certainly have been killed on the spot. Though I did not see Sirik move, I suddenly found his bony hand pinning me to the fractured wall, and my eyes were staring down into the orbs of black ice beneath his brow. I am tiring of your honesty, Malik. As am I, mighty one. I will try to do better. Just get the Serenishad, hissed the one. Otherwise, you'll be joining a dawn in the City of the Dead, and sooner than you'd like. Sirik released me. My legs buckled and I dropped to my knees, and when I looked up, the one was gone. The acolytes bounded to my side like a litter of puppies, kissing the ground where the one had stood, and the cloth where he had touched my filthy robe, and the stones where he had slammed me against the wall. Only Svanhild and Thur seemed less than thrilled by the visit of our Dark Lord, but still they pressed themselves tightly against my body. Svanhild proclaimed, To speak to our Dark Lord in such tones and survive! Malik must be very close to him indeed! She made certain to look at each of the other acolytes as she said this, for the contest to replace Forno had already started. Aren't we fortunate I recognized him at the gate? As long as the one does not blame us for his failure, countered Oda, who also wished to be the new friar. She pushed her way forward and pointed an accusing finger at me. 
If you wish to recover the Serinishad, what are you doing here? We sent letters to every temple in Faerun saying Rinda had taken it and fled the city. How else could I answer except to slap Oda in the face? I could hardly have said I was trying to cure the one's madness. She would have fallen to her knees and betrayed me to Sirik at once. So I did what I had to and shoved her into Svanhild's arms, and Svanhild's quick dagger was to thank for the rest. By the time Oda's body slumped to the ground, Svanhild had whirled around to face her fellows. I am sorry about Oda, but she had no right to question the favored of the one. Of course, this was only an excuse for eliminating her rival, but the acolytes were quick to accept the explanation, especially while Svanhild's dagger remained unsheathed. Oda's death seemed to upset only Thur, and she turned her wrath on me. Are you afraid to do your own killing, Malik? First I must slay Forno for you, and now Svanhild must murder Oda. I am beginning to think you are an impostor. I slapped her as I had slapped Oda, then shoved her into Svanhild's arms, expecting the same speedy solution to my problem. This time my ally's arms were too slow, and Thur sprang back at me with a thin stiletto in her hand. The weapon snapped the instant it touched my breastbone, thanks to Tyr's protection. Svanhild pulled my attacker away, but this time she stayed her bloody blade. Forgive her, Malik. Thur meant no harm. Oda was her closest friend. I scowled at this, then looked into Thur's angry eyes. I have enough to worry about. If I let you live, you must give me your word on the one to make no more trouble. Oh, I promise. Thur's smile grew as sweet as her eyes were angry. On my soul as a true believer. I was much relieved at this. I did not have the stomach to do as I had threatened, and I knew better than to think the rest of the acolytes would continue to abide someone else doing my killing. I nodded to Svanhild, who smiled and pushed Thur into the waiting arms of the other acolytes. Then Svanhild glanced up at the sky, which was growing purple with twilight, and motioned her fellows out of the alley. We must hurry, or the guards will close the gate. The acolytes filtered into the street. I continued to stare at Oda's corpse, and I could not help thinking that if I became a problem, Svanhild would deal with me just as efficiently. Malik, are you coming? Of course. I jerked my gaze away from Oda's body and saw that the other acolytes had disappeared into the crowded street. I stepped to the mouth of the alley, where Svanhild stood waiting, and Hala rose to join us, still gnawing on Forno's thigh bone. Svanhild took one look and shook her head in disgust, though I could not say whether this was directed at me or my faithful mount. Can't you do something about your horse? This was a command, not a question. With that bone hanging from her mouth, the gate sentries are sure to notice us. I turned to Hala. Hala, can you leave that behind? You're asking her? Hala is a very temperamental mare. In truth, I did not know what would happen if I tried to take the bone away, for I had never forgotten the one's warning to let her eat whatever she wished. You have seen her power. Svanhild scowled. And you have seen how Zents treat true believers. She gestured at the workers flooding back into the city across the force bridge. Do you really want to start a believer's shower as we go out to seek the tower of the great annihilator? Or perhaps you think Fazul won't notice? I glanced at the mass of burly men coming toward us. Svanhild's plan called for us to take advantage of the deluge to leave the city while the guards were too busy to pay close attention. The sight of Hala chewing on a human femur would certainly make us conspicuous. Reasoning that Tyr's protection would shield me, I took a deep breath, then snatched the bone from the mare's mouth and threw it on a roof. 
Hala whinnied in surprise, then raised her head to look after the femur. For a moment she seemed ready to scale the wall after it, and her eyes grew as stormy as a thundercloud. Then she lowered her head and snorted black vapor into my face. You should have <coughs> stayed in the temple, I coughed. Make no trouble, or I will have the one turn you back into the nag I found. I grabbed Hala's reins. A low, purring growl rose up from her throat, but she did not balk or resist as I pulled her into the deluge of human flesh. There was no sign of the other acolytes. Presumably they had already passed through the gate and crossed the bridge. The street stank of sweat and lime and river sludge, and my skin crawled beneath the constant press of the workers' grimy bodies. It did not take long before Spanhild and Halla and I were covered with as much slime as everyone else. Whether this was part of Spanhild's plan, I did not know, but by the time we plowed our way to the gates, it was impossible to tell us from the filthy wretches pouring through from the other side. I pulled Halla past a sentry's nose, and all he did was say I was crazy to take my horse into the ruins after nightfall. Svanhild and I waited a few minutes for the flood of workers to slow to a rush, then pushed our way onto the force bridge. It was a long, arcing structure wide enough to allow three dray wagons to travel abreast. But a quarter of the way across, where it was undergoing repairs, it was encased in a skeleton of wooden scaffolds and narrowed to the width of a single donkey cart. Here Svanhild and I mounted Hala and used her bulk to push our way through the flood of workers, and it was not long before we crested the top of the bridge. Even with dusk falling, the sight ahead took my breath away. Before us loomed the rubble pile I had glimpsed upon entering the city, a veritable mountain of broken stone and splintered timbers. Here and there I saw the jagged remains of a tower, or a section of marble wall, or a thousand paces of straight furrow that had once been a street, but mostly I saw a jumble of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of square-edged boulders. In the name of the one, what is it? Svanhild hung her chin over my shoulder. The ruins, what used to be Zentil Keep. Then what is that? I waved my arm at the city we had just left. That was the foreign quarter. General Vrak and his orcs saved it from the giants when they destroyed the bridges. They were acting on the one's orders, of course. Of course. Mistress Spell compelled me to add nothing, for at the time I did not know this to be a lie. As Hala descended the other side of the arched bridge, I noticed that a few blocks of the old city were being rebuilt near the river shore. The buildings all seemed fortresses unto themselves, with no doors or windows or portals of any kind on the first two floors. They could only be entered via a long set of wooden stairs that ascended three stories to a fortified drawbridge. This caused a shudder to run down my spine, for I could only imagine what creatures would warrant such precautions. When we reached the bottom of the bridge, a spindly figure no taller than myself slipped out of the shadows and startled Hala. She reared, dumping Svanhild onto the muddy road behind us, then turned to lash the intruder with her hooves. The spindly figure fell to his knees and covered his head. In the name of the one, don't kill me! It was Durin, a brother of the temple. And if you kill me, don't let your horse eat me! Hala set her hooves down without doing either. Where are the others? Svanhild demanded, gathering herself up. We were to gather here. Following the great annihilator, Durin whispered. He pointed into the shadows behind him. Thur spotted him as she came down the bridge, and he was alone. Svanhild jerked Durin to his feet. Then why are you still groveling? Show us the way. She shoved him into the shadows, then raised her arm to me. I can't believe our luck. 
I grabbed her hand and pulled her onto Hala's back. Indeed, I cannot believe it either. Chapter 41 The Seraph of Death entered the heaven called Mechanus exactly where he intended, in the night sky over Everwatch Castle, the citadel of Helm the Vigilant. The fortress was a heaven unto itself, which made it larger than any kingdom in Faerun. It consisted of five concentric wards of five sides each. Every few minutes a great clunk would sound deep beneath the ground, then the entire realm would shudder and turn exactly one-fifth of a circle. The innermost ward was larger than the entire city of Brilliance, which is very large indeed, and in the heart of this ward stood Helm's looming keep, watchful tower. The tower had five sides and rose five floors above any building in Everwatch. The uppermost story was ringed by an iron balcony and enclosed by walls of glass, and it was inside this glass room that Mistra's prison sat, with the great guardian standing watch outside on the iron balcony. The Seraph of Death waited until Everwatch turned another fifth of a circle and carried Helm off to look in a different direction, then swooped down to within a halberd's length of the balcony rail. He hovered there, staring through the glass at Mistress Prison. It looked less like a black box than a square of emptiness, for that part of the chamber seemed not to exist at all, which was exactly the case. A great clunk sounded below, and Watchful Tower turned another fifth of a circle. Avner swung his shoulder satchel around to his belly. Though the bag looked empty, it was filled with all kinds of equipment, including the items he had asked for from Kelimvor's Judgment Hall. The Seraph withdrew three silver hooks and hung them in a long line across the empty air. Then he reached into the pouch and grabbed a corner of the perfect mirror he had borrowed from Kelimvor's throne room. As he pulled, the mouth of the satchel kept expanding, and though the mirror was twice as wide as he was tall, he had no trouble withdrawing one whole end. The gears clunked, and Watchful Tower turned again. The Seraph of Death reached around behind the mirror and found a golden thread he had affixed to the back. He hung this line over the first silver hook, then he flew backward, pulling the mirror from the satchel and trailing the golden thread over the remaining two hooks. When he finished, the mirror hung securely in the empty air. Watchful Tower turned again. Avner flew around behind the mirror, then reached into his satchel and withdrew a small square of enchanted glass. He pressed this to the mirror's back, so he could see what occurred on the other side. Next, he removed a magic parchment and rolled it into a cone, then began gently flapping his wings to hover in place. He willed his breathing to slow and begged his heart to stop pounding so loudly and settled in to wait. Avner had no wish to give up being the Seraph of Death, but Avner's wishes did not matter. Kelimvor had changed. No longer did he care for the plight of any mortal spirit. If Avner did not win Mistress Freedom and redeem himself with Mask, Lord Death would damn him to the same cruel punishment as that of any faithless spirit. Watchful Tower turned again, and Helm swung around to face the perfect mirror. Halt! In his surprise, Helm did not realize he was staring at his own reflection. The weary figure before him was a balding, long-faced warrior with shoulders drooping beneath the sadness of more than one world. Who goes there? demanded Helm. The seraph held the cone of parchment to his lips and spoke. You know who. The words seemed to emerge from the mirror, for the lips in the glass moved with Avner's, and the voice sounded the same as Helm's. If you cannot recognize me, it has been too long since you have raised your visor. What? gasped the god. The vigilant one leaned across the railing and peered more closely at the figure. 
The armor matched his own, save that it was tarnished with age and battered with the dents of a thousand battles. The shield bore his sacred gauntlet and eye, and the sword hanging at the old man's side carried the same giant ruby in its pommel. Yet this knight did not hold himself square and proud, as did Helm. This knight let his shoulders sag and his back hunch, and he fixed his gaze on the ground at his feet, and he looked as lonely and dejected as any captive who had ever sat in watchful tower. The gears of Mechanus clunked, and the tower swung away, carrying Helm off to look in a new direction. The vigilant one manifested a second avatar on the balcony, then realized he was gazing at his own reflection. He saw the rail in his hand, and the iron floor beneath his feet, and the glass walls at his back, but one thing he did not see, since Kelimvor had made the mirror to show matters as they truly were, and Mistress Prison was made of nothing. This cannot be! The vigilant one whirled around, then staggered back when he saw the black box still sitting behind the glass. He stared at it for a long time, then turned and stared at the reflection in the mirror for many moments more. The box appeared to be missing. And during all these moments, Avner hovered behind the mirror, worrying. He knew a god could create many avatars, but he had assumed Helm would simply walk along the balcony to stay before the mirror. Instead, the god had manifested a new avatar when the tower turned, and now the seraph had to deal with not one god, but two. Everwatch Castle shuddered, and the gears clunked, and Watchful Tower turned again. Helm manifested a third avatar on the balcony. Avner stifled a groan. All he could do was wait. The Vigilant One looked back into the mirror. The reflection of Mistress Prison remained absent. "'What spell is this?' Helm demanded. "'No spell. Unless Mistra has escaped.' Again Avner spoke into the parchment cone, though now he found it difficult to feign a confident voice. Only Mistra's magic could deceive you. When Helm made no reply, Avner remained silent, allowing the vigilant one to ponder the unpleasant choices. Either Mistra had escaped and cast a spell to create the image in the mirror, or what Helm saw in the mirror was true. He of the unsleeping eyes spent many moments contemplating how his own reflection could look so different. He saw that it might be an image of his true nature, for mortals and gods alike still bristled at him for obeying Eo's command during the time of troubles and confining his fellows to Faerun. And yet the vigilant one could not believe that he was the sad figure in the mirror. Like the mortals who venerated him, he took it on faith that those who performed their duty would always be rewarded. If this was not so for himself, how could he ask his worshippers to accept it for themselves? On this account, Helm decided the image in the mirror was false. This comforted him. It meant he was still a proud guardian and Mistra still imprisoned in his tower— but then he remembered what such a deception implied. The goddess of magic could not be inside her prison, since only she could deceive him, and she was cut off from the weave by her prison's walls of nothingness. Yet how could she be anywhere else, since escape was impossible? The gears of Mechanus sent a shudder through the castle. Watchful Tower turned once again, carrying Helm away from the mirror— he manifested a fourth avatar on the balcony. Then, while this one continued to watch the mirror, the other three passed through the glass walls and went over to Mistra's prison. In a single voice they called, Lady Magic? Mistra made no answer. She had been listening to everything that had happened outside, and, believing Kelimvor had come to rescue her, had no wish to help her jailer. Avner reached into his satchel and withdrew a small shadow shaped like a bird, which was a memory he had asked of Kelimvor. He cupped it gently in his hands and puffed his breath upon it, 
causing the wings to rise and stretch. Mistra? Helm's voice grew more cautious. Being much practiced in the art of jailing, he knew that a captive's silence could mean many things, and the least of these was that she had escaped. Answer me, Lady Magic. Avner opened his hands. The little shadow flew away and cried out the words that Kelimbor had once heard the goddess exclaim after a pair of their heroes had destroyed a lich. Goodbye and good riddance! At once Helm manifested a fifth avatar in the empty air. He searched for the source of the goddess's voice, but the memory had vanished as soon as it fulfilled its purpose. The three avatars surrounding Mistress Prison drew their swords and prepared to look inside. Avner prayed they would wait a few moments longer. The fourth avatar was still watching the mirror, and he knew better than to think he was quicker than a god. The three avatars kneeled beside the box of black nothingness, each at a different side. The gears of Mechanus clunked again, and Watchful Tower turned, carrying the fourth avatar away. Avner looked at the three avatars surrounding Mistra's prison, and he saw them lean forward to push their heads through the walls. He flew from his hiding place and was behind one of them in the blink of an eye. He angled toward the glass wall and crashed through, moving as swiftly as a stone falls from the heavens. This way, Mistra! he shouted. Before Avner finished his sentence, Helm's fourth avatar rushed in from the balcony to intercept him. This did not matter. The seraph was still flying, and as the vigilant one stepped in front of him, he lowered his head and crashed into the god. Had Helm been standing with his sword firmly in hand and both feet braced on the floor, the seraph would certainly have bounced off his chest and perished beneath the god's gleaming blade. But the vigilant one was still drawing his weapon and just turning to position himself. Avner's desperate attack unbalanced him and sent him crashing into another avatar. The impact sent the unsuspecting avatar tumbling through the wall of nothingness, and Mistra saw at once what the mysterious voice outside had intended— she launched herself at the feet of the falling guardian, diving out of her prison through the same hole by which her captor was entering. The goddess saw Helm's fourth avatar looming above her, flying back at her from the force of the seraph's blow, and she thought she would be pushed back into the box of nothingness. Then the avatar vanished, and she found herself lying on the floor next to the battered seraph of death. Mistra saw at once that she had escaped— for the instant Helm's avatar had fallen completely into the prison, the vigilant one had lost all his godly powers, and his avatars had disappeared. She leapt to her feet, knowing it would not be long before Tyr saw what had occurred, and called upon Eo to free the vigilant one. Before Avner could so much as moan, she dispatched eight avatars to Faerun to answer the calls of her faithful and undo the damage Talus had done to her church. She sent another aspect to visit Kelimvor in the City of the Dead, and only then did she kneel beside her broken rescuer. "'You have my gratitude, Avner!' Mistress saw that when the seraph had struck Helm, he had snapped his neck and torn both of his wings, and shattered one of his shoulders. As she spoke, she began to straighten all the breaks. I shall tell your master of your bravery. Kelimvor will reward you well. Avner shook his head. No, Kelimvor is no longer my master. Mask sent me. Mask? The goddess straightened Avner's neck then enclosed it in her hands and allowed her healing magic to flow into him. That cannot be. Mask has more reason than anyone to keep me imprisoned. Perhaps. But he did not expect me to succeed. Now that his neck had been repaired, the seraph found it much easier to speak. As the goddess healed the rest of his injuries, he told her of how Kelimvor had decided to reassess all his judgments as god of death, and Avner also explained how Mask had given him a chance to become the Seraph of Thieves by assigning him the impossible task of freeing her. 
When he finished, Mistra had healed all his wounds. They stood, and the goddess said, Avner, you should not be seraph to a low godlike mask. I shall intercede with Kelimvor, and you will remain the seraph of death. Avner shook his head sadly. I do not think so, goddess. Lord Death has changed. The old Kelimvor is gone, and I fear even you cannot bring him back. Chapter 42 Brother Durin led us through the shattered remnants of the old harbor ward gate, then turned down a slippery river of mud that served as the main boulevard of the city rebuilt. Dusk had fallen and plunged the burrow into shadows as purple as the one's sacred vestments. The last of the masons and day laborers had vanished across the bridge, and now only the denizens remained peering down at us from the arrow loops and third-story drawbridges of their fortress homes. The street stank of seaweed and fish entrails and all the other things any one saw fit to dump into it, and so deep was this slime that Hala's hooves made sucking sounds as she carried Svanhild and me forward. About a third of the way through the city rebuilt, which is to say no more than a hundred paces down the boulevard, Someone hissed at Durin from the shadows. He turned down a narrow lane between two buildings and vanished into the darkness. As I guided Hala after him, I thought of the burly guards who had perished in the alley where we had hidden earlier, and a shudder ran down my spine. They had died within the civilized confines of the walled city. Here in the ruins— I doubted that even the one knew what might be lurking around any corner. In this alley the lurker happened to be Armid, a brother of the temple almost as gaunt and filth-covered as Durin. Armid led us through a maze of lanes so black I could scarcely see my hand before my face, and the whole time I kept thinking what a splendid place this was for an ambush— Yet nothing happened except that I felt many eyes watching us from above, and once a stray dog barked from a muddy alcove. Here Svanhild and I had to dismount and stand in the quagmire as Hala tried to make a snack of the dog, but her neck was not long enough to reach the back of his den, and after a few minutes we were allowed to remount. We emerged from this maze of alleys to find Sister Kelda waiting behind the jagged vestiges of the harbor ward wall. She took Armid's place as guide and led us forward, and the gloomy citadels of the city rebuilt were replaced by shadowy piles of rubble. The sound of Hala's hooves changed from a regular slurp to an unpredictable clatter, and the light of the full moon shone down to pave our way in glimmering silver. The stench of the harbor ward vanished, and Svanhild grew less tense behind me. She leaned forward and brought her lips close to my ear. "'Why did you come to Zentil Keep?' she whispered. "'You must know the Serenishad is gone. We spent an entire year sending letters to important true believers.' "'You didn't send one to me,' I retorted. "'But I do know of the letter you sent my caliph. So why are you here? I held my tongue, for I had no wish to blurt out the truth to this woman. Fazul might have stayed in his tower all day, watching and wondering when we would arrive, or someone might have told him we were coming at dusk, and that someone could be Svanhild as easily as any other of Zentil Keep's acolytes. Well? Svanhild pressed. I craned my neck over my shoulder. You ask too many questions, sister. Svanhild jerked back as though I had struck her, yet her arms stayed tight around my waist, the better to hold me when Fazul sprang his trap, I supposed. I furtively scanned the shadows, until it came to me I had little to fear from an ambush, with tears protection to keep me whole, and a mount such as Hala to ensure my escape— no assault would harm me or my quest. Thus assured, I did a foolish thing. I leaned down to pat my faithful horse on the neck. 
Hala swung her head around and bared her sharp teeth, and I barely had time to move my leg before her jaws snapped together. Svanhild leaned forward. What's wrong with her? She is angry because the dog escaped. Mistress Spell compelled me to add, Or maybe because I took her bone away. Who is the master? Svanhild snorted. You are Hala. Who do you think? As I said, Siric made her. Kelda turned down a broad, rocky furrow that had once been a street. About fifty paces ahead, the path ended beneath a high, unbroken wall. There we found the rest of the acolytes. They were waiting in the mouth of a steep-sided trench where someone, or perhaps something, had tunneled through the rubble to create a narrow passage. One of the brothers pointed down the channel. The annihilator went there. There is still— Hurry! Thur's voice sounded muffled and distant as it rolled out of the trench. He's trying to escape! Kelda and the others rushed into the trench at once, but I held Hala in check and let them clatter through the dark alone. Go! Svanhild commanded, kicking at Hala's flanks. A snarl like a lion's rumbled up from the mare's throat, and she took a tentative step forward. I jerked the reins to stop her, and she in turn kicked up her rear legs, nearly dislodging Sister Svanhild. Malik, what are you doing? Svanhild clutched my waist to keep from falling. I thought you wanted to catch Fazul. As I said, you ask too many questions. Mistress Spell compelled me to add, I did not get this far by being stupid. I see the ambush you are planning. Ambush? Truly she sounded surprised, and I realized how practiced she was at lying. A loud crack echoed out of the narrow trench. Then a silver flash bounced off its steep walls. Someone screamed in agony. See? I exclaimed. I am no fool. The acolytes cried out as one. A soft roar crackled out of the trench, then an orange glow lit the stones in its depths. Svanhild took one arm from my waist, and something sharp pricked my back. You wanted to find the Annihilator, and we have found him. Now ride! Stupid woman, do you think I fear your knife? Despite my words, I had nudged Hala into the trench, for I still meant to track Fazul to his home. You saw the quarrels bounce off my back when I entered Zentil Keep. I am protected by Tyr himself. Tyr? Svanhild shoved her dagger forward, but the blade tangled in my robe and scraped past my ribs and did not inflict even a scratch. She spat on my neck. Traitor! Tyr-loving spy! Me? I paid no attention to her attempt to kill me. You are the betrayer. As all this happened, we rode half the length of the trench. I could have leaned out and touched the stones to either side, and the walls loomed so high above us they blocked the moonlight. Hala raised a terrible clatter as she stumbled through the darkness, but this hardly mattered, for a mighty roaring and a horrid screaming suddenly arose from the far end of the channel. I looked up to see an imposing, long-haired figure twenty paces down the trench, trapped against a half-buried wall. A low curtain of fire burned between him and the handful of his attackers still standing. The rest of the one's acolytes lay rolling on the ground, screaming in agony and beating at the flames on their bodies. My throat grew dry at the prowess of my quarry, but I had no time for wonderment. Svanhild pushed herself from Hala's rump and dropped to the rubble behind us. She fell to her knees and raised her arms to the heavens. O oh, Siric, god of gods, one and all, hear this, the prayer of your servant, Svanhild of Zentil Keep. No! I jerked Hala's reins around, but the trench was too narrow and rocky for her to turn quickly. Mighty one! continued Svanhild. You have placed your trust. I pulled so hard on Hala's reins she reared and turned. 
her front hooves struck the trench wall and caused a clattering rubble slide. Svanhild shouted, In a traitor! Lying trollop! I drew my dagger and flung myself off Hala's back. Before my feet touched ground, a silver flash sizzled down from the channel rim and struck Svanhild full on the brow. Her head vanished in a spray of blinding fire and bone, and I came down upon the headless corpse and drove it down into the bottom of the trench. For a time, I lay on top of the gruesome thing, too stunned to move and trying to blink the sight back into my eyes, gagging on the harsh fumes that rose from the place where Svanhild's face should have been. I trust she is dead. The words were so deep and resonant I mistook them for the ones, until I realized the man was speaking in a single voice instead of a thousand. We cannot have her calling the mad god, can we? I rolled off Svanhild's body and looked up. The speaker stood at the crest of the trench wall, high overhead, silhouetted against the pale night sky, with long flowing hair and a high-collared cape stretched over a pair of broad shoulders, he looked eerily similar to the figure trapped at the end of the channel. The man stared into the trench and lifted his arms high. Rise up! I thought he was calling to me until he added, Awaken, my children! A tremendous clatter arose along the entire length of the passage. Hala let out a startled whinny and at last wrenched herself around to face me. Behind her the orange glow at the end of the trench had vanished, and now the rubble beside her began to churn. Hala bared her teeth and backed away. No, Hala, come this way! Hala continued to retreat, then heard the stones behind her also stirring and stopped in her tracks. I stepped forward to grab her reins, but a pair of long arms suddenly shot out of the rubble between us. In the darkness they looked like the branches of a gnarled myrrh tree, and I could see well enough to tell that one of these limbs ended in a deformed claw. Hala, come to me! The mayor raised her head at my tone, then growled. A head emerged from the rubble to join the arms that separated us. By the light of its burning red eyes, I perceived it to be the face of a corpse, long dead, with shriveled gray skin still clinging to its skull. The creature looked toward me and began to dig itself out of the rubble. Of course the thing was not alone. The clatter of shifting stones continued to build along the length of the trench, and I glanced around to see dozens of pairs of red eyes emerging from beneath the rubble. I uttered a curse on Svanhild's soul, then looked back toward my mare, my only means of escape. Hala, now! Hala fixed a dark eye on my face, then snarled and sprang forward. The corpse between us lashed out and caught her foreleg with its twisted claw. She bit the arm off in mid-stride and stopped beside me with the gruesome thing still clamped between her teeth. I thanked the one for her loyalty and started to step around to mount her. She reared up and planted her hoof in my chest and pushed me straight to the ground. Hala! I glanced along the trench and saw a dozen red-eyed silhouettes shambling toward us. Let me up! What are you doing? Hala growled and brought her face down close to mine. She rolled the corpse's filthy arm between her teeth and made a low, menacing nicker. Hala? The first corpse shambled closer, lacking the arm my horse had bitten off. It stooped down and grasped my ankle with its remaining hand. Hala allowed this, and I recalled the threat I had made before we crossed the bridge. Hala, I am sorry I interrupted your meal, but we had to leave the city. A second corpse came up, and she permitted this one to grasp my arm. And I would never ask the one to turn you back into a nag. You know this. Hala snorted in my face, just as she had done when I seized her bone, 
then took her foot off my chest and trotted on. Hala? I tried to rise, but the two corpses pushed me down. I grabbed a stone and smashed the skull of one, but this did not even loosen the thing's grasp. A third cadaver grabbed the rock and pinned my weapon hand to the ground. Hala! Her only reply was a mocking snort, now painfully distant. I kicked and rolled and tried to squirm free. Every time I moved a body part, another corpse arrived to pin it down. Within moments I lay buried beneath a pile of rotting and writhing flesh, and my own limbs became more twisted and bent than our Dark Lord's mind. I cursed the one a thousand different ways. I called him a buffoon and an oaf, a fraud and a cheat and a miser, a maker of empty promises and a squanderer of borrowed wealth, a murderer and a liar and a thief and a hundred names twice as scornful. Nor did I repent. I could think only of the great sacrifices I had made for the love of Cyric, and how it would all come to naught because he had given me a horse so fickle she would betray me over a bone. That the one did not strike me dead was but a testament to his limitless compassion, and perhaps to Tyr's protection. By the time I heard someone more graceful than a corpse skulking about near my head, my blasphemous fury had cooled. I fell silent, listening hopefully as this person stopped beside the pile and moved the limbs of a few cadavers away from my face, and then I saw my betrayer. Thur! She had changed the hemp robe of the one's temple for a silken cloak with a plunging bodice. Around her neck she wore a silver amulet shaped like a human hand, with a pair of emerald eyes staring out from the palm, the holy symbol of Yachtu Zim. Her face still bore the welts where I had slapped her. How nice to see you, Malik! It's a wonder the Bane Dead did not kill you. She smiled sweetly, then spit in my face. When I proved too helpless to wipe her spittle from my eyes, she turned away and added, He seems harmless enough now, Tyranar. A pair of heavy boots crunched across the rubble, and then the imposing figure I had seen silhouetted against the sky peered down at me. He had a princely face with a square jaw and a drooping red mustache, and his pale eyes were as cold and cruel as the heart slurping in my breast. I am Fazul Chembril. He took a cloth sack from his belt and kneeled down to pull it over my head. I hear you have been looking for me. Chapter 43 The City of the Dead was a jewel losing its glitter. Kalimvor stood in the highest pinnacle of the crystal spire and watched a grey tide washing across his realm. As the dreary wave spread, the glimmering window lamps winked out, the shining street lanterns went dull, the sparkling candles flickered and faded to black. Only an ashen gleam remained, cloaking the city like the pall of a coffin, illuminating every corner with a pale, shadowless glow. Lord Death was extinguishing the lights of his domain. From that moment forward, no flame would burn within its walls, no sun would shine upon its streets. In the city of the dead, there would never again be brilliant light or velvet black, only countless shades of grey. Kalimvor, I do not think much of these changes. As Mistress spoke these words, she appeared in the pinnacle beside Lord Death. I hope you will forgive me for saying so. There is nothing to forgive. Kalimvor turned to face Mistra, revealing that he had changed more than his city. I did not do it to please you. Mistra gasped. She had seen at once that Kalimvor had changed his customary leather armor for a pearly cloak and charcoal hood, but that had not prepared her for what lay within the clothes— her lover's rugged face had been replaced by the impassive visage of a silver death-mask. 
His eyes had changed from emerald gems to drab gray orbs that lacked both pupils and irises, and his mane of wild black hair had grown as white and silky as spiderwebs. Even his brawny chest, now hidden beneath a tattered breastplate of scale mail, seemed sunken and hollow. Kelimvor waved a hand over his new figure. This appearance is more in keeping with my true nature. Mistra raised her hand to her mouth and said nothing, as she could think of nothing gracious to say. Kelimvor shrugged. I see that Avner succeeded. Yes. Thank you for sending him. Mask sent him, not I. So Avner said. Mistra paused. I wanted to speak with you about that. Avner does not deserve— Avner is now the seraph of thieves. What's done is done, and you have no time to waste on things that cannot be changed. Kalimvor took Mistra's arm and guided the astounded goddess across the room. The instant Helm is free, he will look for you here. Perhaps you should see what you came to see, then leave. You have much to do before the trial. Though stunned by the curtness of Kelimvor's words, Mistra nodded at their truth. Yes, Talus has been making inroads. Forget Talus, Mistra. Answer the charges. They reached the other side of the pinnacle, and Lord Death's tone grew more calm. If you do not, we are both doomed. Tear has not separated our charges. Is that your only concern, Kelimvor? Mistra jerked her arm free. I had not thought you so selfish. Perhaps you should fetch a dawn, and then I will leave. I cannot bring him to you. Kelimvor pointed through the crystal wall, down to a huge crowd of souls awaiting judgment outside his palace. A dawn stands in line. Line? Mistra pressed her face to the crystal and peered into the shadowless gray light of the city of the dead. Even to a goddess— the throng was too distant to discern a single soul. You're making a dawn stand in line? Of course. He rejected you in life. That makes him one of the faithless. Moreover, he begged me to steal your worshippers from the fugue plain, and that makes him one of the false. But a dawn is insane! Mistra whirled on Kalimvor. You understand that better than anyone. I must hold even the insane responsible for their choices. Kelimvor stared down at the throng. His eyes could see individual souls no better than Mistra, but he knew which speck was Adon, the one at the end of the line. If I do not punish the insane when they turn from their gods, then half of Faerun will go mad. Too many mortals are too lazy to pay their gods the proper worship. Mistra spun Kelimvor around and stared into his empty gray eyes. Have you gone mad yourself? Who are you hiding behind that mask? Cyric? Tempest? Mask? She backed away, raising her hands to blast the impostor with raw magic. You cannot be Kelimvor. He would never say such things. This is the same Kelimvor to whom you, Mistress Ariel, paid a very special price on the way to Elminster's tower. Mistra did not lower her hands. Many people knew that Ariel had been her true name as a mortal, Cyric among them, and Cyric also knew that she had revealed it to Kelimvor during the time of troubles, as a sort of payment for accompanying her to Elminster's tower. But there was one thing Cyric did not know about the arrangement. What was the price, Kelimvor? He answered at once. Your love. It is you. Mistra lowered her hands, then waved an arm at the dreary city outside. But why, Kelimvor? Because I am the god of death. But where is your pity? To condemn Adon— Pity is for mortals, not the god of death. Adon will be judged according to his words. Mistra's jaw fell. She stared out over the drab city for a long time, and finally turned to Kelimvor. Then I want you to return him to life for me. Return a madman to life? Who would that serve but Cyric? 
Who is not your concern? Mistra replied. It is enough that I ask. No. That Adon will speak against you is your concern, but he has already dared denounce me for being your lover. I will not have him undermining the belief of my own worshippers. I am begging you, Kelimvor. Mistra stepped closer to Lord Death and took his hands. In the name of our love! Kelimvor shook his head. Not even for you. I must fulfill my duties as a god, and I warn you to do the same, or it will be the circle taking your powers, not Talus or Cyric. Mistra jerked her hands away. How dare you lecture me! I did not become a goddess to turn my back on those who— Jurgle's shadow-filled cloak appeared between Mistra and Kelimvor. Excuse me, Lord Death, but Helm demands an audience. Kelimvor, return Adon to life! Mistra's words echoed out of the empty air, for no sooner had the seneschal spoken Helm's name than the goddess had vanished. Return him to Faerun, or our love is done! Then it is done already. Kelimvor replied, though even he could not tell if Mistra heard him. What is done? Helm appeared behind Jurgle, in the very place Mistra had been standing the instant before. And I warn you, do not try to hide. Do not threaten me, cold heart. Kelimvor stepped straight through Jurgle's body, so that he stood nose to visor with Helm. I am not hiding the goddess Mistra. You may search my realm if you wish, but if you ever threaten me again, it will take Eo himself to save you. Helm stepped back and bowed his head. A search will not be necessary, Lord Death. Your word is sufficient. Then the guardian vanished as quickly as he had appeared, and not only to pursue his prisoner. Something in Kelimvor's tone had suggested that he was eager for blood, and Helm had no wish to test his prowess against that of a new Lord Death. Jurgle drifted to Kelimvor's side, and a white glove fluttered up to point at a line of shiny black beads rolling down the god's cheek. What are those? Nothing. Kelimvor's voice was strained. All that is left of my mortality, I suppose. Well, I hope you flush it out soon. The seneschal moved away, as though Kelimvor were diseased and about to cough on him. It is the oddest thing I have ever seen a god of death do. Then do not watch. It was Kelimvor himself who turned away, and neither he nor Jurgle noticed that each teardrop vanished as it hit the floor. Chapter 44 The great Fazul and his handmaiden Thur bound me in chains and dragged me stumbling and staggering through the ruins. The hood covering my head blinded me, and the short chain between my ankles hobbled me, but my captors pushed and pulled and grumbled as though they did not understand why I could not shamble more quickly. After hours of this abuse, we reached smoother ground, then we descended some stairs into a rocky passage, and the smell of damp stone and burning pitch filled my nostrils. Fazul tore the sack off my head, revealing a vast chamber cut entirely from rough-hewn rock. A few torches danced in the sconces upon the walls, filling the air with a smoke so black and bitter that it summoned a flood of tears to my eyes. The center of the room was empty, save for Iachtu Zim's symbol painted on the floor and a black altar at the far end. Along one wall sat all manner of strange furnishings, but in the dim light I could not discern what they were for. After making this quick inventory, I began in the nearest corner and carefully gazed around the room, searching for an iron box or polished chest or any other container that might hold the true life of Cyric. The gloom hung so thickly that I saw only strange outlines and vague shapes. Fazul started toward the center of the chamber. 
I shuffled along beside him, cursing the tiresome shackles upon my ankles and the manacles that held my wrists in front of my belly. The Temple of Iachtu Zim. Fazul waved his arm around the gloomy chamber. Not as grand as you're accustomed to in the Church of Syric, but then we in Zental Keep have had to make do since the Mad One smashed our homes to dust. The raising was your own fault. I was not afraid to say this, for I knew Tyr's protection would shield me from harm. If Zental Keep had remained faithful— Silence, swine! Thur pelted me between the shoulders. I have heard enough of Cyric's filth to last me a lifetime. No, my dear. Fazul reached behind my back and waved Thur off. Let Malik speak. After all you have told me, I wish to hear what he has to say. I have nothing more to say except that you are a gutter-snipe and a traitor for reading the true life of Cyric to your city. Here I watched Fazul for any clue to the book's location, or whether he still had it at all, but the only thing that flashed through his eyes was anger. I continued, You betrayed the people of Zental Keep, not the one. Fazul's hand tightened on my arm, but he showed no other sign of his ire. A pity you feel that way, Malik. I certainly bear you no ill will. Fazul stopped on the symbol painted on the floor, and I had the unpleasant feeling that the green eyes in the palm were staring up at me. In fact, I want to help you. Help me? Fazul nodded. I wish to teach you the truth about Cyric. Nothing could be more wonderful. I could not contain myself, for I believed he was threatening to read to me from the true life. I am ready. Fazul creased his brow, surprised by my enthusiasm, then shook his head. First, we must cleanse your mind. He glanced behind me to nod at Thur, then added to me, The truth will be better. Once your thoughts are pure. I felt a knife running down the length of my spine. The blade caused me no harm, of course, but it did terrible things to my clothes. A damp breeze brushed across a region of my body that rarely feels such things, then third jerked my tattered robe from my shoulders, leaving me as naked as the day I was born. I thought you were going to cleanse my mind. We will, Malik, Thur said this. We certainly will. She came around to stand in front of me, and I lowered my hands to cover the most private part of my nakedness. Thur slapped me in the face and grabbed my manacle chain and jerked my wrists back to my belly. You have nothing to hide from us. All you had to do was ask. And indeed this was true, for I have always had every reason to be proud in that regard. Thur raised her hand to strike me again, but Fazul caught it and shook his head. Don't be too hard on him. Malik has yet to understand. The high Tyranar draped a burly arm across my shoulders and guided me toward the wall. Thur tells me you never feel pain, Malik. Never. I was only hoping to avoid a senseless waste of time for us both, but Mistress Spell compelled me to add, not in the past few days, anyway. No. Fazul grabbed my manacles and jerked them back to my belly, as my modesty had allowed my hands to drift south. Well— there are many ways to cleanse a man's thoughts. Fazul stopped five paces from the wall. Before us, in the flickering light of a torch, sat a trio of large and elaborate devices. The great annihilator gestured at the first. Four copper balls were suspended above a table equipped with more straps than I could count. 
a narrow glass tube ran from the bottom of each ball, joining together at a little spigot that hung directly over a wooden neck pillow. The drip torment. Fazul waved Thur forward. Show him. Thur stepped into the circle of light and turned the spigot. A bead of water dribbled from the nozzle, landing just above the pillow. The next drop fell a moment or two later. This did not seem much of a torment to me. Compared to the wonderful machines in the Caliph's dungeon, it looked relaxing. Fazul guided me to the next device, which was a tilted chair with many straps. Before the chair sat a small round table holding a dozen ceramic pots, each topped by a hinged cap with a high barb at the center. Thur cranked something under the table. The surface rotated a twelfth of a turn, and one of the ceramic pots swung around before the tilted chair. A little bar sticking out from the chair caught the barb on the cap and tipped it open. At once, the room smelled as though a skunk had raised its tail. The torture of the smells. I could not help but smirk. During my time outside Candlekeep, I had eaten things that smelled worse. Fazul guided me to the next device, which was little more than a tarnished copper tub full of water. The eel bath. Here Thur lagged behind, and Fazul had to wave her toward the tub. Demonstrate? Thur's face grew pale, but she rolled up her sleeve and thrust her arm into the water. Something splashed. A soft sizzle reverberated through the tub wall, then Thur's eyes rolled back in their sockets. Her teeth clacked together, and her chin tipped up, and she began to tremble and fell over backward. When her arm came free of the tank, something black and flat untwined itself from her forearm, then slid back into the tub. Thur's eyes grew glassy and vacant. When she tried to roll to her knees, her quivering muscles would not support her, but she showed no sign of pain. In fact, she showed no sign that she felt anything at all. Fazul slapped me, then pointed at my hands, which I had allowed to drift south again. When I raised them, he nodded his approval. We would put you completely in the tub, of course. Of course! Though I tried to sound nonchalant, my words were but a squeak. The high Tyranar fell silent and gave a thin smile, so that I might contemplate what he had shown me. I perceived that he meant to do more than teach me the truth about Sirik. To destroy my belief in the One's power, he had only to bring out the true life of Sirik and read, and the power of Ogma's words would do the rest. But Fazul wanted more. He wanted me to beg for the truth as that would be a greater insult to the One and a boon to his own god, Iachtu Zim. And I was happy to do what he wished, as I knew the last laugh would be Syrix, and that nothing in the true light's pages could ever turn me away from our dark lord, not while the One's heart slurped in my chest and my own heart beat in his. "'You are wasting your time with this cleansing,' I said." I am ready for you to read me the truth now. Fazul shook his head. It is not enough that you hear the truth. You must embrace the truth. The one's heart nearly leapt into my throat, for Fazul had fallen prey to a simple merchant's trick. The high Tyranar had made no objection to the suggestion that he would read his truth, which was as good as telling me he still had the true life of Sirik. Now all I had to do was convince him to reveal its location, and I saw that sterner measures would be required. The truth is that Yachtu Zim is a petty little god unworthy of the one's notice. My plan was to make Fazul so angry that he would forget about my cleansing and pull out the true life just to silence me. When you die, Sirik will take your soul from your pitiful little god and torment it for a thousand years in the dungeons of the Shattered Keep. 
Fazul's face turned red with rage, and his hand flashed up from his side, cuffing my head so hard the blow knocked me off my feet. I crashed down on Thur, who had just started to gather herself up. Then I rolled over, laughing. Strike me again! I staggered to my feet and shuffled back to Fazul. No servant of piddling Zim can harm me. The high Tyranar raised his arm, then caught himself and brushed the dirt off my naked shoulders. Forgive my outburst. I am here to help you. He turned me toward the torture devices. Which shall it be, Malik? The drip? The smells? The eels? My mouth went dry. The choice was obvious, as the eels would take less time than any of the other tortures. Yet I could not take my eyes off Thur, who still seemed so dazed and confused that she could hardly struggle to her feet. I choose— I choked on the words, and my gaze swung toward the drip torment. After my long ride, it would be nice to spend a few hours lying on a table. I might close my eyes and sleep for days. And why shouldn't I, after all I had done on the one's behalf? For years I had lived like a beggar in the cold and the rain, and I had jumped into a boiling moat and fought guardians who returned from the dead and ridden day and night across the breadth of Faerun. And what had the one done for me, except give me a vile betrayer for a horse, and slay my wife, and threaten me with damnation if I failed him? But as I thought all these things, the awful despair I had felt outside Candlekeep returned. I recalled how I had awakened amidst the carnage of the ebon spur, and rejected Sirik in my misery— and how he had come to make me feel the terror of dying faithless and returned me to the way of belief, and how he had given me a chance to redeem my wretched soul and honored me by exchanging hearts, and I saw I really had no choice. Which shall it be, Malik? Fazul stepped toward the eel bath, a mocking smirk on his face. The eels? I nodded quickly before I had time to lose my courage. Fazul raised a brow. Truly? The eels? I shall think of Iyak, too. I tried to sound spiteful, but my voice cracked with fear. Even his name is as slimy as an eel. Fazul's mouth twitched, yet he answered in a calm voice. Strange, I had picked you for a drip man. He studied me and saw that I could not take my eyes off the eel tub. And yet you pick the most enfeebling of the tortures. Why? I made no answer, fearing Mistress Spell would compel me to admit the truth. Fazul remained silent a moment longer, then got a cunning look and shrugged as though resigned to my choice. Very well. The eel bath. Thur, still quivering from her own treatment, came over to help lift me into the tub. Fazul raised a hand to stop her. Not yet. I have given Malik what he wants. Now he must give me something. I shall give you the sweat beneath my arms, I spat. That is all any worshipper of Yachtu Zim deserves. Thur's knee shot toward my exposed groin, but she slipped in a puddle of water and crashed to the floor. Whether this was due to Tear's protection or her own quivering muscles, I did not know. Fazul scowled, but he continued to look at me. Come now, Malik. I am only asking you to tell me who sent you. The High Tyranar stepped closer and spoke in a reassuring voice. There is no harm in that. I know everything already. You do? Sirik's curdled heart oozed up into my throat. Then I realized that Fazul was either lying or mistaken. No one knew about my plans for the true life of Sirik. 
then why do I need to tell you? You must confess yourself. It is the way to love the truth. Tell me who sent you, and I will let you sit in the eel bath. Let me? This was less incentive than he thought. And I will let you lick clean the souls of true believers in the time beyond the year of carnage. I see. Fazul's face grew as ugly as an orc's. He grasped my arm. What is it you fear more than a vat of lightning eels? The high tyranar jerked me away from the tank and stopped before the torture of the smells. He flipped up three lids, filling the room with a melange of scents too vile to breathe. Decay? Death? Awful? He watched me for signs of fear, and when I showed none, he shook his head. I think not. Being a Syracist, you are accustomed to these things. Because we smell them so often on the bodies of Yachtu Zim's dead faithful. And Mistress Spell compelled me to add, I have never smelled this myself, but I have heard it is so. Fazul dragged me to the next device then grabbed me by the manacles and swung me up on the table and laid me down so that my neck rested over the wooden pillow. Water? By the way Fazul growled this, I saw that my plan was working. He twisted the spigot, and a single drop of icy water fell on my lip and ran into my nostril. When I made no complaint, he shook his head. Or is time your torment? You are a dog and the worshipper of a dog. Fazul smiled. Thur said you wouldn't spend the night at the temple. He leaned over me. Are you in a hurry, Malik? Did Sirik give you a deadline? Is he that eager to see me slain? I raised my head and spit in his face. Fazul slammed me back to the table and pinned me down with one hand, then motioned to Thur. Help me strap this weasel down. I must go before I kill him. You're leaving? I tried to roll off the table. Fazul grabbed my manacles and tugged me back into place, and I cried, You are a coward, as is your god. That is enough! He reached under the table and grabbed a crusty rag and stuffed it between my lips. Before I could spit it out, Thur laid a strap across my mouth and pulled it tight. Fazul sighed in relief. Silence has never been so golden. My next insult was a mere grunt, but it hardly mattered. The great annihilator was already as angry as a wounded lion. Chapter 45 At daybreak, when the dreary sun brightened the gray sky above the dilapidated towers of Zentel Keep, Ruha and her hippogriff stood waiting on the road outside. She knew better than to pound the gate, for every city in the heartlands kept its portals closed between sunset and sunrise— and no amount of knocking would convince a sentry that the sun rose any earlier than he said it did. The witch waited nearly an hour before a heavy thud sounded somewhere inside the gatehouse, and the portal swung open. Two bleary-eyed guards stepped out to greet her, each as large as a bear and reeking of ale. Over their chain-mail they wore black tabards emblazoned with the gauntlet and gem symbol of Zentil Keep, a sign the witch had learned to despise long before becoming a harper. Although she made no effort to move forward, they crossed their halberds before her veiled face. "'State your name and business in Zentil Keep,' commanded the oldest. From behind him came the acrid smell of peat burning in fireplaces, and the gentle clamor of an awakening city. And show your coin, so we'll know you can afford to pay your way. A few beggars drifted out of the alleys beyond the guards, but they looked too healthy to be paupers. 
Ruha reached into her robe and withdrew a small purse, then jingled the contents. I am searching for a thief, she said, extracting two silver coins. Perhaps you have seen him? Each guard snatched a coin, but they made no move to uncross their halberds. There are many thieves in Zentel Keep, said the oldest. This one is a pudgy little man with the eyes of a bug, and if you have seen his horse, you will never forget it. His mare eats flesh and breathes black steam. The guards looked at each other. Then the oldest one held out his hand. We might have seen him. What do you want him for? He stole something of mine. Being a foolish woman who believed that money had no value beyond what it could buy, Ruha placed two more silver coins in the man's hand. I would like to see that he is punished for it. The guard accepted the coins with a smile. If you want to punish him, you'll have to stand in line. He passed one coin to his companion, then raised his hand again. Could be I can put your worries to rest. Now, any astute person would have put her purse away and told the buffoon he had already been paid enough to buy every thought in his skull. But, as the witch was spending the harper's money and not her own, she withdrew two more silver coins. I do not need to put my worries to rest. The witch dangled the coins over the guard's palm. What I need is to find this thief. I believe he will be searching for Fazul Chembrel. The older guard scowled. What are you, another of Sirik's stinking assassins? Never. Ruha continued to hold out the coins. But I must catch this thief before he finds Fazul Chembrel. You're too late for that. The older guard snatched the coins from her hand, then added, But don't worry, your thief won't be going anywhere. Whoever stole of yours, he'll be punished for it more than enough. All the same, I would like to see this for myself. Ruha reached into her purse yet again, this time drawing out two gold coins. Can you arrange it? For that, I'll carry you there on my back. The guard raised his hand to accept the coins. But you'll have to wait until I'm off duty, and you'd better not be a Syric worshipper. Chapter 46 Another drop fell out of the darkness and splashed my lip. The drops came in four kinds. This one nettled. It rolled into my nose and made me want to sneeze. I snorted it out. I sneezed anyway. Eighty-six thousand four hundred and— Another drop fell from the darkness. I never knew when they would come. This one burned. It rolled into my nose and scalded my tender nostril. I snorted it out. The burning continued, and I wished I could sneeze. Eighty-six— no, eighty-four thousand six hundred and four, or was it five? I waited for another drop to fall. I never knew how quickly they would come. Sometimes they burned, sometimes they chilled, sometimes they never seemed to come. I had tried to time them by my heartbeats, but Sirik's heart did not really beat. It surged and oozed with no more rhythm than a dancing omnion. I wondered what my own heart would be like when I got it back. I wondered if I would still want— Another drop splashed my lip. It rolled into my nose and soothed the inflamed membranes. I snorted it out. A man could drown one drop at a time. Eighty-four thousand and sixty-four. Another drop splashed my lip. They did not come in any order. This one nettled. It rolled into my nose and made me want to sneeze. I snorted it out. I was counting drops to keep track of the time, to count the seconds, and the days, so I would know how much longer I had. Eight thousand sixty-four and... a hundred? 
I screamed. I nearly choked on the rag in my mouth. I understood why it was called a gag. I waited for another drop to splash my lip. I tried to remember whether the count was 8,164 or 8,604 or— Malik, are you still here? Fazul's voice rolled out of the darkness, and I was nearly blinded by the flickering glow of a torch. The high Tyranar laughed. Of course you're here. Where else would you be? Another drop splashed my lip. How much time had passed? This was a cold drop. It rolled into my nose and tickled my sinuses. I snorted it out. Had Cyric's trial started yet? One drop every two seconds would be thirty per minute, three hundred every ten minutes, nearly two thousand every hour. Eighty-six thousand four hundred and one, or was it two? I opened my eyes and saw two blurry silhouettes above me. One of them turned the spigot. The other loosened the strap that held my gag in place. One last drop splashed my lip. It rolled into my nose, and I snorted it out and spit the cloth from my mouth. A thousand blessings on your children! Fazul chuckled. Thur, didn't I tell you the drip torment would soften his tongue? The high Tyranar patted my face dry. He used a smooth cloth so that he would not crack my chapped skin and make it bleed. I dismissed any thought of trying to anger him again— both on account of his great kindness and out of fear that he would turn on the spigot. Fazul wiped the table around my head until it was as dry as my face, then wrung the cloth and spread it gently over my private parts. Though I had hardly recalled that I was naked until that moment, this seemed a great kindness. Thank you. Fazul smiled. You can thank me, Malik— by taking the first step. Tell me who sent you. I said nothing. If I spoke at all, I would blurt out the whole truth, and then I would never save the one. Come now, Malik. Fazul nodded to Thur, and she began to undo my straps. I must make certain you are ready before I reveal the truth to you. Truly? I gasped. You will read the truth to me? and all I need do is tell you who sent me? No more? Fazul's mustache straightened above a row of perfect white teeth, and the resulting expression looked less like a smile than a jackal's sneer. That is all. Thur finished removing the straps. I sat up, thankful for the luxury of the cloth that now covered my private parts. After Fazul revealed the true life's location— I had no idea how I would steal the book and escape, but this did not concern me as much as how I would trick the One into reading it. Still, if my long service to the One had taught me anything, it was the art of charging blindly ahead. I nodded to Fazul. Very well. I will tell you who sent me, and no more. I repeated this for my own benefit, as I hoped it might prevent Mistress Spell from causing me to reveal more than I intended. No one sent me. I came on my own. Liar! Thur slapped me across the face, then pulled the cloth away from my lap. You can't hide anything from us. I saw Cyric appear to you with my own eyes. I ignored her and faced Fazul. He told me to find the Serenishad. You do not have the Serenishad. I know this for a fact, so it makes no sense to try to find it here. I have told you the truth about who sent me, and now you must read the truth about the One. Malik, what are we going to do with you? Fazul grabbed my manacles and jerked me off the table— then dragged me toward the eel bath. Do you think you can lie to me? But I am not lying. I saw in my mind Thur's vacant eyes and trembling muscles after she had thrust but one arm into the tank, and I thought of the agony I had suffered beneath the drip torment, and I screamed, 
I can't lie. Not very well. Fazul pitched me into the tank, and I splashed into the warm water. Something large and slimy entwined my leg, and another eel slithered around my arm, then a very large one wrapped itself around my belly, and for an instant they reminded me of an experience I once had in the caliph's baths. Then I made an unpleasant discovery. One does not need to feel pain to know pain. Every muscle in my body tightened around my bones, which certainly would have snapped were it not for tears' protection. The rumble of my grinding teeth reverberated through my head, and I swear a thousand and one banshees were screaming in my ears. My mouth filled with the taste of almonds, and my nose with the smell of burnt onions, and my eyes rolled so far back in their sockets that I saw the inside of my own skull. Some uncertain time later I began to shiver, though I did not feel cold. Slowly I came to realize that I was sprawled on a stone floor, though I had no idea why. Then my sight cleared, and I recognized Fazul Chembrel looming before me in his full regalia of priestly robes. He was holding a wooden pole, and when I saw the metal hook at the end, still dripping slimy water, and noticed the tub beside me, I remembered all that had happened. The eels! You have no one to blame but yourself, Malik. Fazul squatted down to look me in the eye. How can I ask Iachtu Zim to accept you when you refuse to cleanse yourself? Accept me? You want me to— I could hardly believe what I was hearing, for Iachtu Zim hated Sirik as ice hates fire. I tried to shake my head clear— all that happened was that I sloshed the water in my ears. You want me to convert? It's your choice, of course. But the alternative— The high Tyranar shook his head. Let us just say it would be better for both of us if you converted. In my weakness, I forgot my sacred mission. I recalled the many hardships a man can suffer on behalf of the one— and saw how I might escape them in the service of Iachtu Zim, and I remarked to myself that Iachtu Zim had never thrust a slimy mass of curd into my breast, nor demanded that I do the impossible, nor threatened me with eternal damnation if I failed. All Iachtu Zim had ever done was offer me the hope of eternal salvation. I asked, what would be involved in this converting? Here, my chest grew cold and tight, but this only made me more determined. And how soon could it happen? As soon as you confess, Fazul smiled, the truth will be your salvation. The truth? I have already told you the truth. I would have been glad to tell him some lie that he liked better— but Mistress Spell prevented it. You threw me in the eel bath. Yes, and now you must tell me why Sirik sent you here. But he did not send me. The one has read his own book, and now he is as mad as a jackal with the staggers. He thinks he is as great as Ao, and he expects all the other gods to bow to his will, and he demands that I give him the Serenishad to make this so. A crushing weight settled on my chest. I gasped and clutched my breast, and a chill spread through my limbs, and in my folly I grew even more determined to convince Fizul of my honesty. I waved a hand over my soft body. Look at me. I am no hero. I found the Shirinasad once, and I could not even pick it up, and yet the one threatens to abandon me to Kalimvor's judgment if I fail. I had to pause and gasp for breath, as now my chest felt as though a camel were standing on it. Forgive me, O oh geyser of mer— uh, malice— uh, uh, uh. Mistress Spell would not permit me to speak the proper words of fawning. 
I grabbed the hem of Fazul's robe and kissed it frantically, but the high Tyranar's eyes were narrow and dark. The great man plucked me off the floor as though I were an empty sack and threw me back into the tank. The camel on my chest became as an elephant. The enormous eels entwined me, but I did not fall instantly unconscious as before. This time I felt them pull me under. I pushed my face back to the surface and gasped for breath before I sank down once more. I felt something sharp and hard against my wrists, then my eyes rolled back and I felt nothing more. When I awoke, only seconds had passed, or so I assumed, for the high Tyranar had just dumped my soggy body on the floor and was withdrawing the hook from the chain between my manacles. Siric's heart still felt like an elephant standing on my chest. My muscles trembled, and my ears rang, and my mouth tasted of almonds. Yet my vision was clearer than after the dunking before. Fazul prodded me with his hook. You owe me a confession. I confess that you are a bag of gleet squeezed from the purulent sphincter that is the mouth of Iachtu Zim. He would not listen to the truth. What choice did I have but to return to my earlier strategy? In the time beyond the year of carnage, your god shall empty the chamber pots at the Palace of Eternity, and you shall clean the guard robes. The crushing weight on my chest vanished at once, and I saw how blind I had been to seek salvation from any god but Siric. He was the god of my heart, and I had no fate but the fate he decreed. I could only thrive in the shadow of his radiance, or perish in the darkness of his decline. How stupid I had been to think I could escape my destiny! I fell into a fit of giggles, for I felt as idiotic as the caliph's own harlequin, and he had always made me laugh until it hurt. Fazul was not so amused. He reached down and grabbed me by the manacles and lifted me off the floor, and he glared into my eyes with a murderous look. Why are you trying to anger me? His breath was hot against my face. Has Siric warped your mind so much you enjoy this? And with that he hurled me back into the tank of eels. At once I ceased to laugh. The slimy things entwined me, and again their hideous magic burned my every sinew. My ears rang, and my muscles tightened around my bones, and the grating of my teeth echoed through my skull, but I never fell unconscious. This was less of a blessing than it seemed, for aside from the uncontrollable tremor, I could not move my own limbs. The eels drew me under. In wide-eyed horror I watched the bubbles trail up from my nose, and I lay submerged for minutes, craving air and paralyzed with shock. Yet every time my yearning for breath overwhelmed me and I opened my mouth to inhale, my head always bobbed to the surface, through the mercy of tear my lungs filled, and then I sank again into Fazul Chembrel's special hell. After the fourth or fifth time I surfaced, Fazul snagged my manacles with his wooden hook and fished me out again, ever careful to avoid the tank himself. I managed to stagger to my feet, and as I wobbled back and forth I discovered two new visitors to this chamber of horror. One was the old guard who had cheated me out of two silver coins at the city gate. The other was a slender woman dressed in a dark robe and veil. Well met, Malik she said. You are a hard man to catch. My hands, still trembling and manacled, strayed down to cover my private nakedness. Leave me alone. This is none of your affair, Harper. Harper! Fazul exclaimed. Thur gasped as well. Then the high Tyranar turned to the guard. You brought a Harper to my temple? She didn't say she was a harper. The guard grabbed Ruha's arms. The witch did not resist, but only studied me over her veil. Well, Malik, 
Did you find what you were looking for? Thur raised a hand to slap the witch silent, but Fazul caught her arm. Ruha continued to stare at me. Or were you too late? Too late, I gasped. The witch nodded. Sirik's trial ended yesterday. Ruha was deceiving me. But how was I to know? I had been strapped to a table for eighty-six thousand drops and thrown into the eel bath so many times my teeth buzzed, and I did not have even the beat of my own heart to mark the time. I slumped to the floor and beat my head against the tank. If the trial has ended, then I am lost. I did not even think to ask what the verdict had been. I thought only of my eighty-six thousand drops and my three eel baths and the folly of all my useless suffering, and I threw myself at the feet of Fazul Chembrel. I will tell you all, only torture me no more. The high Tyranar smirked, then turned to the guard. Perhaps you should leave now. I'll send Thur if I have further need of you, and you can leave the harper. The guard scowled at his dismissal, but passed Ruha over to Thur and left by the tunnel that served as the temple entrance. Only after his steps had echoed away did Fazul turn back to me. Your confession must be true and complete. A blessing on your name! I wanted to add that he was also the most merciful and wise of men, but I could not lie. What do you wish to know? The same thing I have always wanted to know. Who sent you, and why? I groaned. Who sent you, and why? The high Tyranar pulled me up by my manacles and brought his face close to mine. You must tell me the truth, or I cannot help you. I came on my own. My reply was weak, for I knew the high Tyranar would believe nothing except that Siric had dispatched me to kill him. No one sent me. Malik? Fazul shook me so hard I thought my chains would fall off. I am growing weary of your games. I came to steal the true life of Siric, I bleated. I needed it to cure the one's madness. Fazul's face turned as red as henna, then he snatched me up and raised me over the tank. Have it your way. Wait, Ruha cried. For once I did not object to the witch's meddling, as I knew from my experiences in Candlekeep that she had no stomach for torture. Tormenting Malik will change nothing. Fazul spun toward her, holding me by the manacles and shackles. What? If the high Tyranar's angry tone caused Ruha any fear, it remained hidden behind her veil. Malik is telling the truth. He wishes to use the true life to cure Sirik's madness. This was more than Fazul could stand. You too? Enough lies! In his fury, the high Tyranar hurled me clear over the tank. I crashed into the wall upside down and dropped from a height greater than my own body. My head struck the floor with a terrific crack, then I felt a terrible jolt in my neck and crumpled into a heap of chains and naked flesh. I had grown so accustomed to Tyr's protection that it hardly seemed remarkable to escape the fall without a broken neck or cracked skull. I merely rolled onto my hands and knees and turned to beg my tormentor's mercy, and that is when I realized that Ruha had deceived me. Sirik's trial could not have ended, or the God of Justice would no longer be shielding me from harm. I looked toward the witch and found my view blocked by the massive figure of the High Tyranar, who had turned his attention from me to Ruha. I rose and rattled forward to glare at the meddling harper. You lying sow spawn! 
If this realization seemed a long time in the coming, it was only because of all I had endured in Fizul's temple. Otherwise, I am always most astute. You black-eyed deceiver! No more of your insults! Fazul whirled on me and made a pinching gesture with his thumb and forefinger, at the same time uttering the name of Yachtu Zim. I have heard enough! The high Tyranar twisted his wrist as though ripping out my tongue, and when I tried to explain that my insults had been directed at Ruha and not at him, my voice did not work. Fazul ran his hands through his long hair, and looked from me to Ruha and back again, then shook his head in disgust. He took a chain of keys from around his neck and passed it to Thur. Go fetch the true life from my chamber. The high Tyranar took hold of Ruha's arm. The offering won't be as sweet as I promised, but perhaps the new darkness will forgive us if there is twice as much. Offering? Ruha tried to pull free, but Fazul's grasp was too tight. What do you mean, offering? Fazul snatched her up. What do you think I mean? I barely heard the exchange, for my ears were filled with the sloshing of the curdled mass in my chest, and my eyes were fixed on Thur. She was going after the book. Instead of leaving by the same tunnel as the guard, Thur took a torch from the wall and started across the chamber. I longed to follow, but even if Fazul did not stop me, my shackles made me anything but quick or stealthy. Still, the shadow of a hope began to flicker in my chest. Behind me, Ruha screamed as she splashed into the eel tank. I kept my gaze fixed on Thur. She stopped on the far side of the altar and placed her torch in an empty sconce, then took the keys and lifted them to the wall. A trapdoor swung down from the ceiling, and she reached up to withdraw a sliding ladder. You've seen enough, Malik. Fazul hooked my throat with his wooden pole and jerked me toward the copper tank. Or would you care to join the harper in a bath? I opened my mouth to assure him I did not, but no sound came out, for he had stolen my voice. I merely shook my head. Fazul laughed. He returned his attention to the eel tank's frothing water and used his wooden hook to fish out Ruha's head. Her veil had come off, but she did not look pretty. She had bitten her tongue, and her teeth were bloody and clenched, and her eyes had rolled up so that only the whites remained showing. And yet to me this was a beautiful sight, for the witch had fallen unconscious, just as I had the first time in the tank. My shadow of hope began to grow. Fazul pushed Ruha back into the tank and watched her thrash about. I waited. Sirik's heart sloshed madly, as if it sensed the clever treachery I had in mind. By the time Thur returned to her master's side bearing a large leather-bound book, Fazul was done with his fun. He hooked Ruha under the arm and backed away from the tank, dragging the unconscious witch half out of the water. I ducked under the pole and thrust my hands into the water. At once, two eels slithered around my wrists. A terrible jolt shot up my arms, and my fingers dug into the creature's slimy flesh. My elbows locked, and my teeth clacked together, and the taste of almonds filled my mouth. But I did not fall unconscious. Malik! Fazul yelled. What are you doing? I pulled my arms out of the tank, still clutching the eels in my hands. I swung first at Thur, and the slimy things caught her square in the face. The torch and the book slipped from her hands, along with Fazul's keys, and her mouth opened as if to scream, yet no sound came. Thur's knees buckled beneath her, and before she hit the floor I pivoted toward Fazul. The high Tyranar dropped his pole, leaving Ruha draped over the edge of the tub. My arms kept swinging, bringing the eels against his flank. 
he went rigid and crashed to the floor and smashed his nose, spraying blood across the stones. I shook my manacles over his body until the eels slipped free and entwined themselves around his limbs. Thur began to groan and struggle toward her knees. I thrust my hands back into the tank and caught another pair of eels, then shook them loose on her body. She fell silent at once. I had no idea how long the eels might live out of water, but I did know from my own experience that even a short jolt would leave Fazul and Thur too shocked to move for several minutes. I turned to find the witch still draped over the tub. By her quivering, I knew that at least one eel remained twined about her legs in the water. After all the trouble she had caused me, I should have pushed her back and left her to drown. But we have a saying in Kalimshan, The enemy of my enemy is my friend. I decided to leave Ruha in the tank, confident that when Fazul and Thur awoke and found me gone, they would torture the witch in ways even more horrid than those I had known. I snatched the book up from beside Thur's dancing limbs. It was a huge gathering of pages bound in black leather, with dozens of dark suns and grinning death's heads surrounding a sacred starburst and skull. The adornments seemed strange for a tome of Ogmas, but Rinda had written in her journal that the decorations had been necessary so Fazul could sneak the foul volume past Sirik's priests. Still, I had a knack for stealing the wrong book, and so I opened the cover to make certain this was the one. As I had hoped, the first pages were blank, being an unskilled storyteller who did not know how to stretch a simple sentence into three or four paragraphs, Ogma had written a version of the one's life as short as it was false. To make the true life look as similar to the Serenishad as possible, Rinda had filled the first part with blank pages. In my hands, I was holding the object of my sacred pilgrimage, the relic for which I had endured so much, the true life of Sirik. Chapter 47 I could have called Sirik down at once, right there before the altar and symbol of Yachtu Zim, and attempted to cure the one's madness on the spot, but such an insult to the temple's proprietor would not go unnoticed. The godson of Bane despised our dark lord, and while Zim's powers were paltry in comparison, a god is a god, and an angry god is worse. I did not need this complication, for even in the best of circumstances it would be a delicate matter to trick the one into reading Ogma's book. I snatched Fazul's keys off the floor and removed my manacles and shackles, but I did not steal any clothes to cover my nakedness, as I had no wish to tangle with the eels twined around my enemies. Leaving Ruha to splash in the copper tank, and Fazul and Thur to thrash about on the floor, I extinguished all the torches in the room, save one that I kept to light my own way, and turned toward the passage by which the witch's guard had left the temple. No sooner had I started down the tunnel than I heard a distant chanting and the sound of many footsteps coming my way. Now, while Zim's followers were all fools in their faith, most were cunning enough to stop a naked man carrying a book such as the True Life. I retreated at once to the ladder Thur had pulled from the ceiling, then climbed into the rocky tunnel that led to the high Tyranar's private room. This was no easy thing. I had to cradle the true life in the crooks of my elbows and hold the rungs with one hand and the torch with the other. More than once I slipped and had to hook my arm around the ladder, bringing the torch so close that its flame singed the hair off one side of my head. Only tears' protection spared my face a terrible scorching. I soon reached the top of the shaft and thrust my head up into a dark, musty-smelling room. 
My flickering torch revealed a chamber of stone walls and rough-hewn floor planks, with a bed and a desk and some other furnishings lurking in the shadows. The only sound was the sputtering of my torch, and the room had the leaden chill of a place that never sees light. I laid the true life aside and clambered onto the floor, then rose to seek a door. To my dismay I did not see one. While an old doorway lay just beyond the desk, the opening had been bricked over. I stared back down the ladder, thinking I might simply jump and take my chances in the other passage, but there was still the problem of the temple guards. Then Fazul began to groan softly in the chamber below. Whether the eels had slithered away or died for lack of water, it was too late to go back. I shut the trapdoor and secured it with a drawbar. Then, without a thought to my own nakedness, are we not all naked before the gods? I opened my mouth and exclaimed, Sirik, the one, the all! Not a sound greeted my ear. The next thing I mouthed was just as silent, though much more profane. I had forgotten the spell Fazul had cast to silence my tongue. The heart in my chest dropped. How could I call the one if I had no voice? I fell to my knees and clasped my hands before me. Surely Sirik would hear my silent prayer. He was, after all, a god. Sirik, prince of murder, lord of strife! Nothing happened, except that Fazul's groans grew louder. A tide of anger rose up inside my chest. By what right had the fates taken notice and turned their favor against me, a helpless mortal who was but a flea in the affairs of the gods? I began to clank around the room, searching for some means with which to signal the one. I discovered a chest of clothes, but I hardly bothered to rifle through them. Even if the garments had not been too large, I had no time for niceties. Fazul groaned again. Then the witch moaned, too. This gave me some hope. When Fazul came to his senses, she would occupy him for at least a moment or two. I shuffled toward the writing desk and found a quill and an inkwell beside a sheaf of parchment. Atop the parchment lay a dagger with an ebony hilt fashioned into Iachtu Zim's sacred palm-and-eyes symbol. I pushed the disgusting talisman aside and thrust my torch into a wall sconce, then dipped the quill in the inkwell and scrawled a note upon the clean parchment. Sirik, the one, the all! Fazul's voice rumbled up through the trapdoor, calling for Thur and vowing vengeance upon me. Ruha responded with something groggy, and Thur began to moan as well. I scanned the room's dark corners for the ghoulish figure of the one, and saw nothing but murk and gloom. I would have written his name in my own blood if that were possible, but thanks to Tear I no longer bled. I dipped the quill back into the ink and wrote, Sirik, highest of the high, another dip, Lord of Three Crowns. At the same time, I let these words echo through my head, shouting them the only way I could. The chamber remained as empty as before, and Sirik's heart filled my chest with cold burning. Fazul and Ruha began to yell. I could not comprehend what they were shouting, but several thuds and sharp slaps vibrated up through the trapdoor. I felt a terrible sinking. But I could not believe destiny would drive me this far only to abandon me now. I grabbed the torch and rounded the fringe of the room, searching for some small passage that I might have overlooked. If I could escape, I would seek shelter in the ruins until the high Tyranar's spell wore off, and then I would call upon the one until my voice grew hoarse from screaming. The only exit was the bricked-over door behind the desk. One glance at the ceiling dispelled any thought of leaving that way. The rafters were sagging beneath some great weight. My chest burned as though I had been drinking vinegar. Ruha cried out and abruptly fell silent. Then the high Tyranar began to chant in a mystic tongue. 
He had the witch under control, and now he was preparing to find me. I returned to the desk and snatched up the dagger to defend myself. The instant my hand gripped that vile hilt, I knew how to capture the one's attention. I thrust the torch back into its sconce, then pressed the dagger's ebony hilt directly over the one's heart. The curdled mass twisted into a knot of cold, searing anguish, as terrible as it was unworldly. A wave of bile bubbled up to scald my throat, as though the mere touch of Zim's holy symbol had burst the one's putrid heart. I thought my breast would explode. I collapsed backward onto the desk, and it was all I could do to keep the dagger hilt pressed to my chest. Malik! cried the one's thousand voices. What are you doing? Before I could lift my head, Sirik grabbed my neck and jerked me off the desk. He held me up before his skull's face and fixed those black burning suns on my naked chest, and only then did I realize I was still holding Iaktu Zim's holy symbol over his heart. I opened my hands and let the dagger drop to the floor, and the pain in my chest faded at once. Well, Malik, have you betrayed me? He stepped on the ebony hilt and ground it to dust beneath his bony heel, and this caused such a rumble that I heard Fazul cry out in astonishment. You have but to deny it. I know you cannot lie. No! I mouthed the word, but no sound came out. Then you cannot deny it? Sirik's grasp tightened, and only Tyr's protection kept my head joined to my shoulders. Even you, Malik. First Tempest betrays me, then Talus and Shar, and Tyr next, and now you, faithless cur! The one flung me at the bookshelf, which splintered beneath the impact of my pulpy body. I tumbled to the floor amidst a cascade of tomes, then looked up to see Sirik stomping across the room. With every step, the chamber trembled, and a stream of dust sifted down from the ceiling. You think the verdict will go against me? Sirik kicked Fazul's bed aside and gave me no chance to shake my head. You think Yachtu Zim will come for you on the fugue plain? How can you be such a fool, Malik? A beam cracked over his head, but Sirik did not appear to notice. When the harlot escaped Helm's prison, she sealed her own doom, and the usurpers, too. He raised his skeleton's claw and curled his bony fingers. Without Mistress lies ringing through the pavilion, I have the circle in my grasp. They will bow down before me. They will kiss my feet. They will beg my mercy. These words filled me with the same hollow sickness as the first time I heard Sirik speak them. His vision was born of his madness, for even I knew the gods would level Faerun before they bowed down before the One. I gathered myself up and crawled across the floor, trying to reach the true life, which I had left lying just beyond the trapdoor. Sirik snatched me up and shook me as a mongoose shakes a snake. You will rue the day you betrayed me, Malik. The one hurled me against the wall, and a mighty rumble shook the chamber, and another loud crack sounded from the ceiling planks, and a steady trickle of splinters and dust showered down on my head. Do you think I fear this trial? I welcome it. The day is at hand when I will stand at Ao's side, and all the others will look to us as brothers. I gathered myself up and lunged for the true life. Sirik caught my ankle and jerked me to a halt. My face slammed into the floor, but my devotion to the one was too great to let him stop me now. I thrust out my hands and caught the corner of the book and pulled it into my grasp. As the one and all dragged me back across the planks, I flipped the cover open and began to leaf through the blank pages. Rinda had written that once a person saw the first word, he could not stop reading until he had perused the entire chronicle. 
if I could but whirl around and thrust the first page into the one's face, Ogma's foul words would do the rest. As soon as Sirik saw the book, he stopped pulling. What have we here? The tome lay about a third open, and the parchment was still blank. The one snatched it from my hands and closed the cover, scrutinizing the black suns and the death's heads embossed around the sacred starburst and skull. He turned the book over to inspect the back, and his putrid heart filled my ears with such a nervous switching I hardly heard him ask, Malik, what is this? Of course I could not answer. Instead, I sat up and reached for the book, intending to open it to Ogma's history. Vile as it was, I had to make the one read the account before the trial. Sirik jerked the book away. Is this the book you came for? Fearing that Mistress Magic would dispel Fazul's and cause me to blurt out the entire truth, I did not even nod. You say nothing, said Sirik, just as when you left on your quest. The black orbs beneath the one's brows flared, and he stumbled back against the wall and sat down amidst the fragments of the shattered bookcase. Dust and pebbles rained down from the splintered ceiling, and the sagging joists complained with an ominous creaking, but he did not care. And why should he? Such things mattered less to him than to a mortal such as me. It bears no resemblance to the Serenishad, but how could it be otherwise? Ogma's magic would prevent— Sirik let the thought trail off, then looked at me. Malik, do you remain loyal to me? I nodded eagerly, for this was as true as ever. The one let his bony jaw sag in a gruesome farce of a smile, then opened the book to the first page. Blank! A great knot formed in my stomach, and I prayed to Timora he would flip to the pages in back. Instead, Sirik turned to the next sheet of parchment, and then the next, a single page at a time. All blank. But how else would it look to me? Ogma's magic still works. If I could read the book, I would know that I held it in my hand. He turned the tome on edge and shook out the grit that had fallen into it from the ceiling. You have assured my verdict, Malik? When you read this at the trial, even Ogma will bow to my brilliance? At the trial? I had to cure the one's madness before the trial, or he would only anger his fellow gods and ensure that the verdict went against him. I shook my head and shouted a silent, No! Sirik closed the tome with great tenderness. And we must do something about your voice. The trial begins in an hour. I pounded the floor and spread my hands as though they were an open book, then gazed at the one imploringly. We have no time for that now. Sirik rose and extended his skeletal hand. Come along, Malik. I will let you bask in my shadow. Chapter 48 Mistra appeared in the temple of Yachtu Zim, and found Ruha lying spread-eagled upon the blank altar, her limbs stretched over the edges by four taut ropes, over the which stood Fazul Chembril, wearing a twisted mask called the Cowl of Hatred, and waving a thin-bladed skinning knife. He was droning a deep-throated dirge, and his faithful were singing chorus and dancing slowly around the ebony hand on the floor. In the midst of their circle writhed a pillar of shadow with flashing green eyes and a halo of mordant black smoke. All this Mistress saw in the blink of an eye, and at once she stood at Fazul's side, towering high above his head. He cried out and whirled on her, his weapon raised to strike. Moving faster than any mortal eye could follow, Mistra caught the high Tyranar by the forearm and lifted him off the ground. Do not dare! Fazul's mouth gaped open. 
the chorus fell silent and left their pillar of shadow to writhe alone. Mistra plucked the knife from the high Tyranar's grasp, then closed it in her huge fist. The dagger melted and dribbled onto the floor. This would not be a good time to make me angry. I am in a hurry. The green-eyed shadow guttered like a flame, then hissed, As you should be, weave hag. Leave my temple now. Or what? Mistra turned her gaze on Zim. The pillar shrank, but the voice remained harsh. Or I'll fetch Helm. Soon enough, Iachtu. Without taking her eyes off Zim's nebulous avatar, Mistra flicked Fazul Chembril aside. Until then, be silent, or I will embarrass you in front of your worshippers. Iachtu's acolytes gasped at this sacrilege and backed away, for they feared that a battle between gods was about to erupt. But the new darkness knew better than to attack such a powerful goddess. He could do no more to show his outrage than fill the chamber with the stink of Gehenna. Mistra cleared the air with a wave of her hand, sending both Iachtu and his stench back to the place from whence they had come. Fazul's followers broke for the exits, and even the high Tyranar himself retreated to a dark corner. Mistra turned her attention to Ruha, whose skin was clammy and pale beneath the sacrificial tabard. The witch's shallow breathing betrayed the agony of having her limbs pulled back against their joints. Her muscles still twitched from her bath among the eels, and her purple swollen cheek and black eyes bore witness to the fight she had given Fazul before being captured. And despite all this, her expression remained as stoic as ever. Goddess, she gasped, at last, you came. Mistra made no move to free the witch. Do not thank me so soon, Ruha. I have yet to decide whether my purpose in coming to Zentil Keep includes saving you. I have not forgotten that volcano in the storm horns. I do not matter, the witch said. Malik escaped. Mistra scowled. You said the Serenishad was safe. The Serenishad is. He came here to steal the true life of Siric. Ruha strained against her bindings. That little scorpion is as mad as his god. He means to cure the Dark One's insanity. What? It may be too late already. Ruha pointed her chin at the ceiling, then gasped. Siric was up there. I heard Fazul say this to his god. Mistra glanced into the dark corner where the high Tyranar was hiding. Is this so? Fazul nodded slowly. I don't know what he wanted with it, but that foul-mouthed little shoat stole the true life and went upstairs into my private chamber. The high Tyranar spoke in a tone at once spiteful and frightened, carefully calculated to placate Zim's hateful nature and avoid offending Mistra. Then I heard Siric talking. He had a thousand voices, and they all sounded insane. This news dismayed Mistra so greatly that her avatar shrank to the size of a normal woman. This was as terrible as any setback she had suffered during the past few days. Adon's death, Talus's plot to subvert her worship, even Kelimvor's betrayal. A sane Siric might win a favorable verdict at the trial and start spreading his corruption over the world again. Moreover, with Lord Death too absorbed in his re-evaluation to help her win the support of the other gods, the circle seemed more likely than ever to find against her and Kelimvor, and insist that they both yield their divine powers. Mistra shook her head, much disgusted with both the trial and Kelimvor's strange willingness to believe the charges had merit. If she and he did not protect Faerun's mortals, who would? The goddess sent an avatar to watch the shattered keep, 
and saw that Cyric had sealed every entrance and posted avatars around the perimeter. Seeing no reason for him to take such precautions, unless he had already read the book and was preparing a special rebuttal for his trial, she gave up on the thought of stealing the true life before he could read it. All this took but an instant, and there was only a slight pause before Fazul dared to urge, Perhaps you should go, goddess. Iachtu Zim is searching for Helm, even as we speak. Mistra ignored the warning and continued her conversation with Luruha. I have only a short time, so I will ask you directly. How did Talus persuade you to betray me? Ruha lowered her eyes, much ashamed. I should have known better, but after the things Malik did in Candlekeep, it was easy to believe you wanted him caught at any cost. Me? Yes. When it became apparent I would never catch Malik, you, someone I took to be you, gave me the magic to keep up with him, and told me to use it no matter what destruction it caused. Then Talus deceived you. Mistra sounded more relieved than angry, for proof of Talus's actions would do much to justify her escape from Helm. He has been impersonating me, and using my own worshippers to subvert my control over the weave. Mistra began to free Ruha, snapping the taut ropes as though they were threads. Fazul started to protest the theft of his god's sacrifice, then thought better of it and remained silent, trusting that Helm would arrive soon to take the goddess away. Ruha sat up, her face reddening at the folly of falling victim to the destroyer's deception. I learned of my mistake when you cut me off from the weave— but I was not certain who had deceived me until Talus appeared in Vunlar and offered to restore my powers. And you refused him? Mistra snapped the last binding. You did not call on him even after Fazul captured you? His help carries a high price. The witch began to rub her wrists. I would rather die than call upon him. I am touched. Mistra laid her palm upon Ruha's cheek, and her magic healed the witch's bruised face. So many people have deserted me during these troubles, even Kelimvor. Yet you stand by me, faithful even after the injustice I did you. Ruha took Mistra's hand from her face. I pray you will not be angry with me but I must speak honestly before my goddess. The witch lowered her feet to the floor and stood on shaky legs, facing Mistra as best she could. I did not refuse Talus for you. I refused him because I had already seen the terrible destruction that comes with his aid. And you did no injustice in denying the weave to me. Whether it was you or Talus who gave me the magic to chase Malik, I was wrong to use it. The weave is there to use or abuse, and it is the choice we make that determines our fate. I chose poorly, and so I suffered. Mistra hardly heard this last sentence, for the witch's words had already sent the goddess's thoughts spinning. Ruha! The witch paled, mistaking the blast of Mistra's voice for a sign of anger. She dropped to her knees and clutched the hem of Lady Magic's robe. Forgive me, my goddess. I did not mean— No, Ruha. Mistra lifted the witch back to her feet. You have done nothing wrong. But I have. Yachtu Zim returned in a pillar of swirling black smoke. Begone, you self-righteous shrew! Helm is coming! The hateful god sent a wisp of sulfur-stinking fumes across the room to entwine Ruha. And leave my sacrifice here! Mistra severed the foul strand with a pass of her hand, then looked into Ruha's eyes. 
close your eyes and think of Silver Cloud. The witch obeyed. In the next instant she was sitting on the hippogriff, back in the same dark stable where she had left him in Zental Keep, safe from Yach to Zim, and free to return, happily ever after, to her life as a meddling harper. Thieving hag! Zim flicked his hand in Mistress' direction, and a cage of dark smoke rose up to enclose her, the bars turning instantly as solid as iron. When Helm arrives, you shall pay for that insult, too. I think not. Mistra walked out of Yachtu's prison, and did not seem to notice when the bars sliced her body into long strips. But if I am wrong, you may tell Helm that I will be waiting at my trial. Chapter 49 to make it known he had tolerated the last abuse of his justice, Tyr had cast the pavilion of Sinashore into the image he favored. Now every god would see it as he did, a round chamber of mahogany walls and marble floors covered by a luminous dome of milky alabaster. Around the perimeter stood five bailiffs, all avatars of Helm, they wore full suits of plate armor, and kept their visors down and cradled naked battle-axes in their arms, and on their belts they carried black manacles of nothingness. In the middle of the room the greater gods stood in their customary places, though they now waited behind a circular rail of burnished gold. Tyr, as usual, took the place next to the space left empty for Eo. The Just One carried his warhammer thrust into his belt for all to see, and in place of his customary leather armor he wore a flashing suit of silver plate. Cyric stood directly opposite the Just One. Our Dark Lord had also altered his appearance, assuming the form of a gaunt young man with white hair and flesh the color of chalk. The blood of countless murdered guests stained the sleeves of his ivory tunic, over which he wore a long hauberk sewn from the flayed skin of Tethyr's last king. Whenever another god dared meet his burning eyes, he glared at him until he averted his gaze. Kalimvor wore his new attire, the same silver death mask and pearly robe he had donned when he doused the lights of his city. Mistra stood beside the usurper, her ankles shackled together by one of Helm's black chains. She stared at the floor and never looked in Lord Death's direction. Whether this was out of anger or shame, only the harlot could say. And what of Malik, savior of his god and all Faerun? Now clothed in a crimson robe, I stood inside the golden ring with my eyes firmly shut, and even then I was nearly blinded by the naked brilliance of the gods. They were as large as giants, and their splendor shined through my eyelids as the hot sun shines through wax, and I saw everything in the chamber in a blinding kaleidoscope of light. Beside me stood two other witnesses. Adon the Fop now resembled the walking dead, which in fact he was. The god Mask was also present, shifting his murky form like a child who cannot stand still, and every shape he took lacked a limb. On a table before us sat the trial evidence, a gleaming chalice of gold, a shattered corner from Helm's prison, the black book I had risked all to recover, and a pulsing mass of yellow mold that had once been my heart. This was not as I had planned. The gods kept casting worried glances at the true life of Cyric, then glaring at me. They believed the book to be the Serenishad, and I knew many of them would see me dead before allowing me to open it. And even if Tyr forced them to let me read, Ogma's lies would humble our Dark Lord before his lessers, surely a fate worse than madness. Lathander the Morning Lord nodded to Tyr, and Tyr raised the stump of his wrist to signal for quiet. 
Dawn has reached the spires of Candlekeep. The Just One pointed across the circle to Siric. The Prince of Lies stands charged with innocence by way of insanity, by which he is accused of failing in his godly duty to spread the fruits of strife and discord beyond his own church. Tyr turned his eyeless gaze toward Mistra and Kelimbor. Lady Magic and Lord Death stand charged with incompetence by way of humanity, by which they are accused of ignoring their godly duties to show undue kindness to the mortals of Faerun. The Just One glanced around the circle, pausing a moment upon the face of each god, then said, Let the trial begin. I will speak first. My borrowed heart fell as Siric spoke these words. He was far too eager to have me read. I am first charged, and I shall be first absolved. The outcry of protest nearly deafened me, and the gods cast nervous glances in my direction, and I feared I would discover what they had in store before I could escape my dilemma. Ogma raised his voice above the others. It is because you are the first charged that you must be last judged, Siric. He was careful to avoid looking at the black tome on the table. This trial began with you, and so it must end with you. The binder's logic escaped me, but his fellows were equally reluctant to deal with the book, and so they chimed a chorus of agreement. To my relief, Tyr announced, it is decided. The dark suns beneath Siric's brow shone blacker than ever, but he sneered and shrugged off his anger. You must hear me sooner or later. And it will be later, retorted Tyr. He turned to Kelimvor. Lord Death will speak first. How plead you, Kelimvor? Guilty, replied the god in the silver mask. An astonished murmur rumbled through the room, nearly shaking me off my feet. Kelimbor stepped forward, passing through the golden rail as though he were a ghost. I stepped back, granting his looming figure as much birth as possible. The usurper's voice was as somber as a dirge. I have failed my duties in the past. I will not stand before you and say otherwise. He turned in a slow circle, facing each god in turn. I have rewarded the brave and kind, and punished the cowardly and cruel, and I am sorry for it. Here, Kelimbor turned the impassive visage of his death-mask toward Mistra, and at last the harlot raised her lashes to meet the gaze of her forsaken lover. Only her glistening eyes betrayed her sorrow, for they were damp with tears. Kelimbor continued his litany. I judged men as if I were yet a man. Good mortals have placed their faith in my fairness instead of in their gods, while the wicked have deserted their churches at the first sign of disfavor. My actions have undermined the worship of every god here, and I was wrong. At this, Mistra bit her lip. Kelimbor faced the battle-lord. My offense against you, Tempest, has been greatest of all. By favoring courage over cowardice, I have invited brave warriors to hurl their lives away, and given cowards good excuse to hide in their holes. I swear, that was never my intent. Tempest's face remained hidden behind his visor, but he lifted his bloody arms and opened his palms in a gesture of acceptance. When the battle-lord started to speak, Lord Death raised a hand to silence him, then turned toward Tyr. In the past, I have been guilty of all this, but as I have changed myself, so have I changed my realm. Kelimbor waved a hand over his new attire. I invite you all to send your avatars to see the new city of the dead. Judge me not on my past, but on what you find there now. As the usurper spoke, he opened the gates of his city. Many gods did as he asked, 
though Sunni turned around at the mirrored gates. The reflection of her slightest flaw was enough to convince her Lord Death had done all he claimed. The others continued on, swooping down ashen streets crowded with dull-eyed residents, passing whole burrows of drab buildings and dead trees, crossing graceless bridges that spanned still waters the color of steel. They saw no cruelty or malice, but neither did they see joy. Lord Death's realm had become a domain of shuffling spirits and passionless shades, a place of neither punishment nor reward. And in the heart of this dismal city loomed the crystal spire, a soaring minaret of smoky brown topaz encircled by a line of sorrowful spirits, the false and the faithless. In the pavilion of Sinashore, Mistra braced herself against the golden rail and let her shoulders sag. She stared at the floor in sadness, but it was Siric who spoke first. Very convincing, Kelimvor. The one rolled his blazing black eyes at the ceiling. A nice show that can be undone as easily as it was done. Do you really expect us to believe you've changed so suddenly? Kelimvor's response was eerily calm. I expect nothing of you, mad one. You are incapable of learning from your mistakes, and so you cannot understand how others might. You learned nothing. Siric pointed a finger as long as a sword toward Adon. Mistra's patriarch was cowering at my side, looking away from the goddess he feared. Even now you are protecting Adon the Fallen. I am protecting no one, answered Kelimvor. Adon will be judged when he stands before me in the judgment hall. He is mine. Siric passed through the rail and started across the floor. Tyr plucked his warhammer from his belt and pointed it at the one. Do not touch the witness. Siric continued forward, and all five of Helm's avatars stepped away from the wall in unison. For one terrible instant I thought our Dark Lord would ignore Tyr's command, but he stopped abruptly, standing nose to nose with Lord Death's silver mask. Kelimvor remained as calm as a corpse. I stole Adon's soul, Siric spat. You have no right to keep it from me. I told you before, came the steady reply. You stole nothing but his life. He did not pray to you, and so he remains both false and faithless. Now it was Mistra who could not bear the usurper's words. How dare you call my patriarch faithless or false? She passed through the rail, floating just above the floor to spare herself the shame of walking in shackles. Adon would never have turned from me had Siric not driven him mad. You know this. Adon trembled and hid behind me. All three gods were as tall as trees and brighter than suns, and they stood a dozen paces away. I covered my eyes, but still their image burned in my head. The fire faded from Siric's eyes, and he asked in a voice full of false forbearance, Lady Magic, how can Kelimvor know something that isn't true? I did not drive Adon mad. You did. He flashed to the harlot a smug smile, then continued. I let your patriarch see you through my eyes, and the sight of your true nature was more than any man could bear. Mistra whirled on the one, and so great was her hatred that even I saw the gore-eating harpy of Adon's nightmare. You profane canker of pustulation! I'll scrape you! Hold! Siric raised his hands, still smiling. You have no call to be angry with me, Lady Magic. Kelimvor knew what I had done. He could have saved Adon long before our old friend grew so troubled that he leapt to his death. Mistra's face betrayed her surprise. She looked into the bleak orbs of Kelimvor's eyes, then shook her head in dismay. It is true, is it not? 
You knew long ago, when you came to draw Zael's spirit out of the volcano, and you kept it from me. Kalimvor did not deny her claim. The secrets of the dead are their own. That much has not changed in my city. But you have. Tears of sparkling magic welled in Mistra's eyes. And I cannot love this new god as I once loved the man. At this, Kelimvor dipped his chin, though he kept his gray eyes upon her. No one should love death. As Mistra turned away, a single tear escaped her eye and rolled down her cheek. Cyric snatched the golden chalice off the table, then thrust it under the goddess's chin and caught the glittering drop. He all but squealed his delight, and I winced at his display. Mistra pushed him away. Stand aside, foul heart. She floated back toward her place behind the golden rail. You tempt me to forget where we are. As you wish. Cyric smiled compliantly, then returned the chalice to the table. I'm done, anyway. Kelimvor looked on but said nothing. The other gods shook their heads or rolled their eyes, and in my folly even I thought Cyric's behavior but another sign of his madness. Tyr raised his stump at the one. You may also return to your place, Cyric. We have heard enough about Adon the Fallen. And we have heard enough about the charges against Lord Death, added Ogma the Wise. I say we find in his favor. We have seen for ourselves what he sacrificed for duty. At this, the gods filled the pavilion with a general chorus of agreement. Only Cyric raised his voice against the verdict, and even he did not object too forcefully. This puzzled me greatly, until I noticed the cunning gleam in his ebony eye, and my puzzlement turned to concern, for there was clearly more to Cyric's plan than my reading of the Serenishad. I gazed at my heart and wondered if I might ever feel it beating in my chest again. Tyr raised his stump. The circle has made its will known in the matter of Lord Death, but the charges against him have not been separated. He and Mistra stand accused together. If we find for one, we must find for both. Then let us hear from her, said Ogma. Mistra addressed her fellow gods from her place behind the golden rail. I, too, have learned from my mistakes. Your actions suggest otherwise, came Tyr's stern reply. The just one pointed to the shattered corner of Helm's black prison. You have shown little respect for the circle's justice, and let us not forget why Helm took you into custody to begin with. You attacked a witness. Tyr gestured at Mask who stood on the other side of the table a dozen paces from Adon and me. As usual, the Shadow Lord was shifting from one murky form to another, none with all their limbs, and he still clutched Prince Tang's enchanted sword. Lady Magic replied, I have compensated Mask very well for his loss, unless he cares to return Prince Tang's Xi'an and ask some other boon of me. The god of thieves folded the sword into a crease of shadow and shook his head, for being free of the chaos hound was worth more to him than he had lost. Mistra continued, And he is more than a witness at this trial. It was his scheming that convinced Tempest to lodge his original charge, and the Shadow Lord told me outright that he had caused much of the trouble Kelimvor and I encountered in preparing our defenses. Tyr turned his empty gaze upon Mask. Is this so? The Shadow Lord shrugged, then changed into the shape of a one-winged Lamassu. Admitting a thing does not make it so. It does in this trial, Tyr replied. 
tampering with the accused's right to defend. Do not punish Mask on my account, Mistress said. I find myself indebted to him. Without his interference, I would not have seen the injustice I have been doing to the mortals of Faerun. Her use of the word injustice was calculated to kindle Tyr's curiosity, and so it did. What injustice would that be? A despotism more terrible than any Cyric would inflict. As if you could. The one raised his eyes to the ceiling. Tyranny of the flesh is nothing compared to tyranny of the spirit. Mistra turned her gaze toward Lathander and Sylvanus and Chontia, who all bore a greater love for freedom than it was worth. In trying to deny the weave to the destructive and the wicked, I have been attempting to choose Faerun's destiny. This is not my place, and it is not the place of any god here. A choice has no meaning unless it is freely made, agreed Ogma the Wise. It is for the mortals of Faerun to make what they wish of their world. If we relieve them of this trust, the destiny of Faerun will have no value to them. To them, scoffed the one, I did not make myself a god to let mortals ruin Faerun. No, you became a god to ruin it for them. Suni flashed a dazzling smile at the one, then added in a voice of honey, We all know what an ugly mess you would make of things. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Sirik's face had grown as red as Suni's hair. He could see that Lady Magic was winning too many gods to her side, and his plans for the new order had no room for Mistra and Kelimvor. He turned to the harlot and asked, What are you saying? that you will let me have free access to the weave? Mistra met his gaze evenly. Yes, and Talus and Tempus, and Shar as well. At this the destroyer snorted and looked up from the profanity he had been scratching in Tyr's gold rail. In return for what? Supporting a verdict in your favor? Not at all, Talus, the harlot replied. I have already reopened the weave to you and your storm lords, and to Tempus and his war wizards, and to Shar and all her dark followers, and even to Cyric and his madmen. The weave will remain open regardless of the circle's verdict. Assuming that it remains in your power, Tyr reminded her. Mistra nodded. Assuming it does. It was only three years ago that the Circle censured her for denying the weave to me. It was a sign of the one's madness that he did not even wince after he said this, for everyone in the room recalled that Mistra had cut him off in an attempt to prevent him from making the very book they now feared so terribly. I think we have heard this before. The voice of Shar drifted down to my ears like a blanket of whispers. It would have been better if we had let Mistra do as she wished. The Nightbringer glanced at the dark book on the evidence table, then added, I, for one, will accept Lady Magic at her word, if she will join me and some others in demanding that Tyr disallow any reading of the Serenishad. That cannot be, the Just One stormed. The accused has a right to make his own defense. And we have a right to defend ourselves against his lies, countered the battle lord Tempus. As all this occurred, a sliver of shadow appeared beside the true life. I glanced into the vaulted dome above our heads, expecting to see some source of light shining behind the translucent alabaster. But of course the pavilion of Sinashore is beyond such mundane things as suns and moons. I lowered my gaze and happened to glance toward Mask, who stood only about half as tall as the enormous figures of the great gods. 
He was shifting from the form of a burly one-armed Fierbulg into that of a lanky one-armed Verbeeg, and this arm was the only part of his body that was not rippling with change. The god of thieves was reaching for the true life of Siric. If any of the other gods also perceived this, they pretended to be too engrossed in the trial to notice. As for me, I kept quiet and debated the wisdom of letting the Shadow Lord succeed, reasoning that I could always steal it back later, when I would not have to read it before so many of the one's inferiors. While I watched the shadow creep up the edge of the book, the Battle Lord addressed Mistra. Lady Magic, I once offered to withdraw my charges if you would consider the possibility that war benefits Faerun. I cannot repeat that offer because of my earlier promise to mask, but I do stand ready to assure a verdict in your favor, if you will guarantee to never again place such restrictions on the use of the weave, and promise to stand with us against the reading of the Serenishad. Mistra removed the sacred starburst from around her neck, then tossed it across the chamber to Tempus. Here is my guarantee. The weave will not be restricted, but I cannot stand against the reading, even if it means my freedom. She turned to face Tyr. I have already taken too many liberties with the circle's justice. I must abide by Tyr's guidance. Mask's shadow began to creep farther across the true life's cover. Still, I could not bring myself to act. The goddess of beauty stepped to Mistress' side, bathing the harlot in the blush of her flattering radiance. I say we find in favor of Lady Magic. It would hardly be appealing to judge her by the past when we have already made allowances for Kelimvor. Ogma nodded. It is not the circle's place to punish any god for past mistakes. Our only concern is the safety of the balance, and we may feel more assured than ever that Mistra will serve it well. Again a chorus of voices filled the pavilion, but this time Siric was not alone in condemning the harlot. Despite her pledge to keep the weave accessible, Talus, Shar, and Tempus were making good on their unspoken threat. Mistra had refused to join them in opposing the reading of the Serenishad, so now they stood against her. Tyr spoke against Mistra as well. He had not forgiven the goddess for fleeing his sacred justice. The circle's vote was tied, and now only Kelimvor was left to break it. "'How say you, Lord Death?' asked Tyr. Will you favor Mistra and spare yourself as well, or find against her and suffer the same punishment? There was a time when the answer would have been as obvious as it was quick, but Kelimvor did not reply at once. Instead, he turned his gray orbs upon the goddess of magic and studied her a long time. She met his gaze and did not flinch, though the sorrow caused by his hesitation was plain upon her face. And then even this sorrow faded. Lord Death motioned Adon forward, then picked up the trembling patriarch, and let him stand in the palm of his hand. There is no need to fear. Look into my eyes, and tell me what you see. Adon did as he was commanded. A pearly haze spilled out of Lord Death's eyes to engulf him, and deep within the fog a silhouette appeared. She had long black hair as fine as silk, and a clear, radiant face with high cheekbones and full lips. Though her eyes were as dark and deep as the night, they sparkled with the warm light of a sacred starburst, and she was dressed in a flowing robe of twilight. Adon whirled around to face Mistra, then fell to his knees in Kelimvor's hand. Goddess, forgive me, I pray you. I never blamed you, Mistra replied, only Siric. Kelimvor passed the patriarch to his goddess. Adon is yours by rights, 
do with him what you will. I say you are as worthy a god as any who stands in this room. Lord Death's words bore no trace of fondness, as if he offered nothing but cold fact. Mistra held her fingers above Adon's head and let a shimmering rain of magic sprinkle down upon his shoulders. The patriarch faded from sight, gone to await his goddess in her palace Dwemer heart. Tyr declared, The charges against Kelimvor and Mistra are repudiated. Fraud! So loud was Sirik's shriek that even the gods cringed, and I clasped my ears. Although the shadow on the true life now covered nearly half the book, it quavered and looked as though it might retreat. Kelimvor has changed nothing but his face, Sirik stormed. He never meant to damn Adon. Kelimvor turned his mask toward the one. I meant to treat Adon as any other. But those intentions are no longer relevant. Like you, I only allowed the mortal to see Mistra through my eyes. If he prayed to her as his goddess, that was his doing, not mine. Siric looked to tear. Rescind the verdict. On what basis? They cheated. The eyeless one shook his head. The circle has spoken. And now the time has come to consider the charges against you. I stared at the true life. Now the shadow covered all but a quarter of the book. I caught Talus eyeing the book as he scraped at the rail with his sharp fingernails, and when he quickly glanced away, I realized that he also knew what was happening. Perhaps he and Mask had even planned it. After glaring at Tyr for a moment, Sirik shrugged. As you wish, then, consider the charges. He shot a smirk across the circle. In the end, we will do as I wish anyway. A disgruntled murmur rumbled through the pavilion, and I knew my time was running out. Sirik's own trial was at hand, and he had already begun to raise the ire of his enemies. I found my courage, and my arm shot up. Thief! I pointed at Mask. He is stealing the book! Mask's shadow left the true life before I had spoken my second word, but even he was not quick enough to escape the great guard. In a blink, a pair of matching helms had seized the shadow lord, one by his squirming arm and the other by a writhing leg. A third helm now stood at the evidence table prepared to strike down anyone who dared reach for the true life. Talus shot me a look that said I would do well to be wary of lightning for the rest of my life. Tear stepped over the golden railing. It would not have been right for him to ignore any aspect of his own courtroom, and strode forward to confront the god of thieves. Explain yourself! Mask assumed the shape of a hook-nosed troll and shrugged. I am the god of thieves. You cannot fault me if I steal. But I can banish you from this court. Tyr looked to the helm holding Mask's arm. Take this thief outside. I will summon you if he is called to witness. I am more than a witness in this trial, Mask objected. I have a stake in it, too. Tyr looked doubtful. And that would be? Intrigue. A shudder ran down Mask's troll form, and then he became a one-legged ogre pointing in the one's direction. When you strip Cyric of his godhood— I demand dominion over intrigue. I have earned it. Forgetting in his anger to make his body insubstantial, our dark lord stepped forward and crashed through the golden rail. After the circle confirms me as its leader, I will strip you of your very life. The one hurled a bolt of dark clotted energy at Mask's form, but Helm raised his axe and caught the attack on the flat of the blade. 
the weapon withered into a twisted twig, then dissolved into smoke. Tyr stepped between Mask and the One. We have not confirmed you yet, Mad One. Go back to your place, or I will find you incompetent to speak in your own defense. Siric's eyes flashed at the threat, but he knew no other god would ask me to read the Serenishad, and so he did as the Just One requested. Tempest the Battle Lord straightened his shoulders. We may dispose of Mask's request quickly enough. When he came to me with his scheme, he assured me that he had learned better than to let his plots spin out of hand. The Fohammer waved his gauntleted hand at Mistra and Kelimvor, then at the evidence table. If that were true, he would not have interfered with the defenses of Lady Magic and Lord Death, nor would we be faced with listening to Sirik's vile book of lies in the first place. No matter the trial's outcome, I say Mask has no claim on intrigue. Let him be happy with his stolen sword and being free of the Chaos Hound. When no one objected, Tyr nodded. So be it. Helm's avatar vanished with Mask in his grasp, and then Tyr turned to the One. Siric, you know the charge. Innocence by way of insanity. What have you to say for yourself? The One smirked at Tyr and his other accusers, then turned his burning gaze upon me. Read, Malik. Now, Mighty One? Siric glared at me, and a black pit of pain took root in my stomach. Cold beads of sweat rained down from my brow. My moment of truth was at hand, and my knees nearly buckled as I stepped to the evidence table and reached for the true life. As soon as my fingers grasped the cover, a white flash split the air, and a mighty crack filled the chamber, and a hot bolt struck my chest. I flew across the room and smashed through the golden rail, and I would certainly have crashed through the pavilion wall if I had not hit one of Helm's avatars first. I dropped at his feet, still clutching the true life. I looked up warily. Talus the lightning shooter was pointing his finger at my chest. Another half-dozen gods came striding toward me, Shar and Sunni and Lathander and more, their radiance merging like a raging fire. All had magic crackling in their fingers, and all were determined to keep me from reading the book. Sylvanus flipped the evidence table aside and sent my moldy heart rolling across the floor toward Kelimvor's feet. I raised my trembling hand to ward them off. No! Wait! Quiet child! It was Chantia who ordered this. No sooner had she spoken than my tongue swelled in my mouth, growing so thick I could hardly breathe, much less speak. Tyr and four of Helm's avatars stepped out to intercept my attackers, and then the night goddess Shar raised her hand. The room went as black as a grave, and I lost sight of my heart. Stand back, Tyr ordered. The witness is under my protection. We mean him no harm. As the morning lord spoke, a beam of golden radiance struck my eyes, so that I became at once the only visible thing in the room, and totally blind. It is the book we want. From somewhere off to my side, Sunni's dulcet voice called, Shove it over to me, Malik, and you shall have the love of all the women you desire. Now, I could name a dozen women whose affections were worth more than a good stallion, and the adoration of any one of them would have been worth more than the unfaithful love of my own wife, whom Siric had placed so far beyond my grasp. And yet I considered Sunni's offer for no more than a breath or two, as I was too loyal a servant to betray the god of my heart. 
I heard heavy feet closing in around me, and I prayed that none would trample the pulsing mass Sylvanus had so callously pitched from the table. Tyr said, Let Malik read the book, or face Eo's wrath. From somewhere beyond my attackers, Siric added, You have nothing to fear from the truth. Talus snapped, You would not know the truth if you spoke it, Wormbrain. And we fear Eo's wrath less than we fear joining Siric in his madness, said Chontia. We cannot see how that would serve the balance. Does a thing exist only because you see it? countered Ogma. It is abiding by a just code that serves the balance. What you are doing serves only yourself. We have no interest in your sophistry, Binder. We have all agreed. As Tempest said this, he sounded closer than I would have liked. Before we let the mortal read the Mad One's book, we will start a new time of troubles. That would be a terrible waste, said Mistra. A shimmering sphere of magic appeared around me and lifted me into the domed vault, and I found myself looking down upon a room full of darkness. At once my swollen tongue shrank to its normal size— I opened the true life to the back and began to flip through its pages, searching for the start of Ogma's lying narrative. Let him read. As Mistress spoke, the darkness vanished from the pavilion below, and I found myself looking down upon the heads of the gods. This was less exhilarating than it sounds, for they were all staring up at me, more than a few with murder in their eyes. I spied my heart lying intact beside the golden rail, near Kelimbor's feet, and the harlot continued. No harm will come to us or the balance. You cannot guarantee that. Kelimbor raised his hand and drew a silver scimitar from the empty air. You promised Tyr you would not interfere with Sirik's defense. Mistra stepped to his side and took him by the arm. I have not broken my promise, but you must trust me. Not any more. Kelimbor shook her off, then raised his scimitar and grew tall enough to reach my magic bubble. At once, Tyr and all of Helm's avatars swelled to an equal size and moved to stop him, and I lost sight of my heart beneath their many feet— Tempest the Battle Lord drew his great sword, and Talus filled his hands with lightning bolts, and Lathander's fingers began to glow with golden fire, and they all moved to stand with Kelimbor. The one filled his hands with black, venom-dripping daggers, and began to circle around toward their backs, and I found the page at last. My hands began to shake so badly that I could hardly make out the letters on the page, and my ears filled with such a terrible sluicing I would not be able to hear the words when I read them. Ogma rushed in between the battle lines. Wait! We cannot do this! The binder raised his hands, as if he really believed such a pair of bony arms could stop the coming carnage. A war between us will destroy Faerun. Out of the way, old fool, Tempest commanded. When Ogma did not obey, Tempest smashed the hilt of his sword into the binder's head and sent him sprawling to the floor. Siric raised his hand to throw his first dagger, and I saw that in the coming tumult my words would never reach the ears of the one. I could not allow all my efforts to be for naught. Wait, you witless jackals! I yelled this at the top of my voice, and my audacity so shocked the gods that I could raise the true life and yell, This is not the Serenishad! A stunned silence fell over the pavilion, and the gods stayed their hands for an instant, and it was only Cyric's astonished shriek that extended this instant into a moment. What? The one snapped his hand forward, and in the next instant his black dagger sliced through Mistra's magic bubble. 
I am sure that it was Tyr's protection and not my own reflexes that raised the true life in front of my face. The venom-dripping blade sliced through the leather cover and halted just a hair's breadth from my cheek. Then my stomach rose into my throat and I plummeted toward the floor. I did not even notice when I hit. I only shifted my gaze away from the knife and began to read. Though men may try to wrest the reins of their destiny from the gods, they are all born at the mercy of nature, bound in a hundred ways to those around them. This is how the gods ensure mortals are tied to their world of toil and sorrow. Siric of Zental Keep was no exception. In the hottest flame rule to ever grip the keep, Siric was born to a destitute bard so lacking in skill she could not earn a single copper. Siric grasped his ears. No! The force of the cry hurled me against the wall and made my ears ring with the shriek of a thousand banshees. Yet I continued to read. Indeed, I could not have stopped if I wished— Mistress Spell compelled me onward just as mercilessly as it had when I stood in the same chamber and recited from Rinda's journal. I continued to read, describing how Siric was sold as an infant to a Sembian merchant and raised in a life of luxury, and how our dark lord repaid the man's kind upbringing with betrayal and murder. When I came to the part about returning to Zental Keep in the chains of a slave, the one let out a blood-curdling shriek, then raised his hand and filled it with black darts. Liar! As he cried this, he brought his arm forward and hurled the darts. Betrayer! One of Helm's avatars lowered his battle-axe before my face, catching the darts on the flat of his blade— then two more aspects of the great guardian seized Siric's arms and held him motionless. I finished the tale, describing the Dark Sun's escape from slavery to a thieves' guild, his many adventures with Kelimvor Lionsbane, and finally his quest to recover the Tablets of Fate during the Time of Troubles. Of course, every word I read was a sacrilege and a vile lie— but this endless string of blasphemies seemed to calm the one. By the time I reached the part telling how he stole the tablets from his old companions and used them to win Eo's favor, our dark lord stood motionless in Helm's grasp. He glared at me with an expression more lucid than I had ever seen on his face and said nothing, and when I finished the loathsome account and looked up, he only shook his head. I closed the cover and flung the foul book away, then hurled myself on the floor at his feet. Mighty one, do not punish me. I only did this horrid thing on your account, so that you might recover your wits and defend yourself at this farce of a trial. I embraced his huge foot and showered the boot with kisses. I swear it gave me no pleasure, and you know I cannot lie. Talus sent a gusty snicker across the chamber, but Tempest the battle lord was quick to cuff the destroyer's shoulder. This is no time for mirth, not when we have been standing at the very brink of the year of carnage. Talus returned to his place in the circle, and Tempest followed. As the other gods also returned to their places, the one shook me off his foot. I will deal with you later, Malik. He pointed at the wall, where I was much relieved to see my moldy heart still pulsing upon the floor. Now fetch me your heart. I sprinted twenty paces across the pavilion and knelt down to cradle the precious mass. It smelled like rotten fruit— and on one side there was a brown bruise where some god had caught it with his boot, but this hardly mattered to me. I scooped it up with both hands and held it as close to my breast as a child. The mold was soft and velvety, and the heart itself seemed almost liquid inside its skin, and still I counted myself lucky. If anyone had stepped on it in this condition, 
it would have squirted over the floor like a crushed plum. Malik, I am waiting for my evidence. In truth, I was a little reluctant to give up the evidence, but as I could not reach into my own chest and return the heart to its proper place, I knew I would have to surrender it sooner or later, and better sooner than later. I jumped to my feet and did as the one commanded. As soon as Sirik took my heart from my hands, it grew as large as an enormous melon, so that it looked like a pulsing yellow peach in his gigantic hand. This heart helped me see the truth of my condition. Sirik raised the moldy thing so that all could see, then lowered it to his mouth and took a great bite from the side. A flood of watery yellow juice ran down his chin, and I cried out, but no one paid me any heed. The truth is that I am still a more worthy god than any of you. The one spoke with a full mouth, and he smacked his lips between words, and that is why you are all jealous. Thinking my plan had failed, I cried out in despair and flung myself to the floor. But Sirik continued, I must admit, however, that I am no more powerful than any of you. The one turned my heart over as though he would take another bite, then seemed to think better of it, and thrust the juicy thing somewhere inside his hauberk. That was a delusion of the Serenishad. A happy delusion. Here the one glared down at me. But a delusion nonetheless. We can all agree that I am better now. This is your defense? scoffed Lathander. That you are better now? The one whirled on the morning lord as though to attack, then suddenly straightened and shook his head. Of course not. It is a statement of fact. Sirik crossed the floor and retrieved the golden chalice, which lay on the ground. My defense is this. Even when I was mad, I was worthy of my duties. How so? Tears scowled as he asked this. Before Sirik replied, he looked into the chalice and smiled, for the cups of the gods never spill. He carried it over to Tyr and swirled it under the just one's chin. Look inside. Tyr saw two tears rolling around in the chalice, one gleaming black and the other sparkling silver. This is all that remains of the love between Mistra and Kelimvor, and it belongs to me now. Sirik began to round the circle, swirling the cup beneath each god's chin. It was my doing that turned Adon against Mistra, and it was Adon's faithlessness that pitted Mistra and Kelimvor against each other, and it was that which destroyed their love. Not much remains, but here it is. I own it. The one continued his circuit. When Mistra and Kelimvor looked into the cup, they betrayed no emotion, nor did they glance at each other or give any other hint of the feelings they had once shared for each other. Sirik smiled a little as he left them, then finished his round and stopped before Tyr. He raised the cup high, then turned to face the rest of the circle. If I can destroy the love of gods— then I can certainly fill the lives of Faerun's mortals with strife and discord. The one raised the chalice to his lips and tipped back his head, for the tears of broken-hearted lovers have always been his favorite libation. After the two drops rolled into his throat, he smacked his lips and smashed the chalice against the floor. Then he turned to face Ogma. How say you, Binder? Guilty and sane, or innocent and mad? We must judge you by the same standards as Mistra and Kelimvor, and though you have also made mistakes in recent years, we must all agree you have returned to us as wicked as before. Ogma looked past the one to address the other gods of the circle and we must all remember not to judge Sirik by his fiendish nature. 
That is the nature of strife, and he could not fulfill his duties if he were not evil. I say, we find for Syrac, guilty and sane. Never! Sunni shook her fiery head, flinging gouts of flame across the chamber. She was the goddess of love as well as beauty, and Syrac's actions had offended her deeply. Not after what he did to Mistra and Kelimvor. I do find in Syrac's favor, said Chontia, for better or worse, he has returned to us whole. Guilty and sane. Lathander did not explain himself, for no one expected him to disagree with Chontia. Sylvanus shook his antlered head. Not I. Sane or insane, he believes he is entitled to do as he pleases with Faerun, and that I cannot abide. I find against him. As do I, said Shar. He cannot be trusted to do as he must. I say we strip his powers and divide them among ourselves. Of course you do, said Tempest. You would bring all of creation under your black canopy if you could. But I say we could find none better to spread strife across the land. As long as he swears never to read the Serenishad again, nor ever to look for it. Siric raised his right hand. I swear. If you believe that, cracked Talus, you are crazier than Wormbrain ever was. I find against him because— The destroyer fell silent, then shrugged. Because I want to. That makes the count four to four, observed Tyr, and Siric cannot vote. The one's face turned from smugged to shocked. Why not? Because that is the code of the circle, Tyr replied, and I will speak against you now. You have never been a stable god, and I suspect you have been mad since long before you became one of us. You are insane, and therefore unreliable, and therefore a constant danger to the balance. What? Siric stumbled back against the rail and glanced at Mistra and Kelimvor, and I grew sick to my stomach and quivered with fear. In that moment I knew all my suffering had been for naught, and I was ready to fling myself on the floor and beg Tyr's mercy. But not the one. The shock in his face changed to anger, and he whirled on Tyr. You backbiting viper! You honey-tongued hypocrite! You— Syrac! Though Kelimvor barked the word, his voice contained no emotion, neither anger nor anxiety nor eagerness. The one raised his brow, then snarled at Lord Death. Gloat, if you like. I will be back to do the same over you. I know you will try, Kelimvor replied. But what about now? Will you abide by the circle's decision? The one looked around the pavilion, sneering at each god who had spoken against him. When his gaze returned to Kelimvor, he spat upon the floor and nodded. What choice do I have? None, Kelimvor replied. I only wanted to see if you realized it. You do, and so I must find you sane. Guilty? You find for me? The silver death mask nodded grimly. Still frightened of me, aren't you? Cyric's smirk returned, for he knew better than to think Lord Death had made his choice out of a sense of duty. I will not forget this. I am sure you will not, said Tyr, but we have not yet found you guilty. The deciding word belongs to Mistra. Cyric's face froze and I swear the blood in my veins stopped flowing. That Kelimvor had spoken in favor of the one was a thing destined to happen. I could see that now, for the usurper was a coward and a fool who trembled before the very thought of our dark lord's vengeance. But what of Lady Magic? 
she was almost as fearless as the one, and she never failed to press her advantage when she believed she had it. Cyric turned his glare upon the harlot and made no pretense of reconciliation, for he knew she would not believe it. Either she would be frightened of his wrath, like Kelimvor, or she would be a fool and attempt to be rid of him. Well, the one demanded. Cyric, after what you have done, how can you ask? My hatred for you is greater than ever. Ogma took her arm. Mistra, you are a goddess now. It is long past time to put away this mortal— Mistra whirled on him. I have had enough of your lessons, Ogma. Never again do you need remind me of my duty to the balance, nor tell me how to carry it out. The binder paled and released her arm, and I began to tremble as a child. The harlot was anything but frightened. I glanced at Kelimvor's silver mask and consoled myself, for after the many changes he had made in the City of the Dead, my torments were not likely to be much worse than what I had suffered already in the service of the One. Yet they call Mistra the Lady of Mysteries for a reason. She looked back to Cyric, and I saw him grin. Then I knew that in his infinite cunning the One had seen what I could not. When Mistra spoke, her wrath had softened. But my hatred is not the issue here, a fact that Lord Cyric knows as well as I. If I bore him no hatred, he would be unfit for his duties. As goddess of magic, I am allowed my feelings. Here Mistra gave Ogma the same look any person of sense reserves for meddlers. Then she continued, But as a guardian of the balance, I must act on my wisdom. Mistra, think carefully, urged Tyr. Once you speak, the verdict cannot be changed. You may come to rue the day you made this decision. I do already, Mistra replied. But when the circle found in my favor, I promised to behave as a god, not as a mortal. The harlot faced the one. I find for Cyric. Epilogue Mistra had hardly finished speaking before the circle of twelve dispersed, and I found myself alone with the one. At once the pavilion of Sinashore became an abhorrent den of iniquity, strewn with couches and pillows, and filled with such a fog of sweet-smelling perfumes and bitter smoke I could hardly breathe. Cyric shrank to a size more nearly my own and sank deep into a settee of plush cushions. I dared to approach and prostrate myself before him. He let out a great sigh and tipped his head back and stared at the naked fiends on the ceiling. I stayed on the floor for many minutes, until my knees grew numb and my joints began to ache with the cold, and even then I dared not rise. I had to be careful, for Tyr's protection had ended with the trial, and I was as likely to die as any man, perhaps even more so. Indeed, I thought it a small miracle the slimy mass in my chest had not killed me already and sent me on my way to find my wife in the City of the Dead. At last, the one deigned to notice me. Without taking his eyes off the ceiling, he asked, Malik. Do you want something? No, mighty one. And to my great horror, Mistra's accursed spell still compelled me to add, Only one or two things, and they should not be difficult to grant for a great god. I vowed vengeance on the harlot, for I knew then that I would always be compelled to tell the truth. Cyric tore his gaze from the ceiling and stared down upon me. One or two things? There is the matter of our hearts, I replied. I am sure you would like yours back, and while it was a great honor to lend you my own, I will certainly have need of it later. The one reached into his cloak, then pulled out my poor battered heart. 
hardly anything remained of it. Most of the fluid had drained out, and now it was as flat as a shoe. You want this back? It might not work. This thought had occurred to me as well, and yet I was loath to keep the one's heart for fear of what it might do to the rest of my body. Perhaps it could be fixed, Most High. I am certain you will want your own back. I think not, Malik. Sirik shook his head, then tossed my heart over his shoulder. I can always find another. But you had better keep mine. You will need it. This filled my stomach with a sick feeling. I will? The one nodded, then patted the couch beside him. I rose and sat on the edge of the cushion. I have something very special in mind for you, Malik. Sirik draped his arm around my shoulders. The orange blood of my heart still dripped from his fingernails. You are going to be my seraph of lies. Seraph of lies? I cried, but I cannot lie. The one smiled. That makes you perfect. I already have a task for you, but we will discuss that in a minute. You wanted two things. What is the second? I held up my hand and pinched my thumb and forefinger close together. A small matter, mighty one. I was wondering— my trepidation grew so great that not even Mistress Magic could keep me from hesitating. I was wondering what kind of reward— Reward? Sirik's hand pinched my shoulder, and it was a marvel that he crushed no bones. After what you did? What I did? I leapt to my feet. I could not help myself. I cured your insanity. I saved you from being found innocent. True, but I commanded you to get the Serenishad. Sirik pulled me back down and pushed me so deep into the cushions I feared I would smother. You failed me, Malik. For that, I should send you to join your wife in the city of the dead. I began to tremble, as I knew now what I had only feared before, that if I ever saw my wife again— it would not be in the one's palace. Sirik continued, But you also helped me see that I am not the prime mover of the multiverse, and so I forgive your failure. The one brought his face so close to mine that I did not dare exhale for fear that my breath would offend him. But that can be changed, Malik. I have a plan, and you will play a part in it. Me, mighty one? In truth, I had been hoping for a somewhat smaller reward. What kind of a part? When the time comes, Malik, when the time comes, I will reveal all. The one grinned, then spun away from me and rose. But first you must do your penance. Penance? I shouted, but I was also quick to add— Whatever you command, Most High. The one clasped his hands behind his back, then turned and strolled toward the wall of the pavilion. I want you to write an account, Malik, a chronicle of the search for the Holy Serenishad, so that my worshippers will understand the many trials their God endures on their behalf. Yes. I saw at once that I had been blessed— that the vision I had seen on the plain outside Candlekeep would come to pass, that I would stand beneath a stormy sky before a vast host of true believers and speak to them in the thunderous voice of the one true prophet and reunite the church of the faithful under my own banner. In my excitement I leapt up and followed the one toward the wall of the pavilion— it shall be a true and faithful chronicle of the trial of Sirik the Mad, and I shall report all the things that happened from the time I found the Serenishad until we saved Faerun from a second time of troubles. The one whirled with black fire in his eyes. We, Malik? And so it was that Sirik the All gave his blessing to this humble account, 
that he renewed my faithless heart and returned me to the way of belief and burned my eyes with the flames of glory and truth until I saw all that had occurred in the world and in the heavens since before the raising of Zentil Keep, so that I might set down in complete accuracy and perfect truth all the things done by men and by gods during the search for the holy Serenishad. Praise be to Sirik the One, most mighty, highest of the high, the dark sun, the black sun, the Lord of three crowns, and the Prince of Lies. All blessings and strength upon his church and his servants, who alone shall rule over the kingdom of mortals and dwell forever in the palace of eternity in the time beyond the year of carnage. This is the book of the seraph Malik el Sami in Nasser favored of the one and the true prophet of all believers, in which I give a complete account of my faithful service to Sirik the All in the boundless lands of Faerun and beyond, and of the great reward I received for my valiant labors during the trial of Sirik the Mad. Every part is true, and I swear that if one word is false, then they all are.